Section 11 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1 Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis Terman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 11 Tests of School Accomplishment and of General Information School Progress Estimates of the quality of schoolwork and data on educational history have been treated in the preceding chapter. The present chapter gives results of the more exact measurement of educational accomplishment secured by the use of the Stanford Achievement Tests and of a test of general information in 1. Elementary Science, Hygiene and Geography, 2. Language and Literature, 3. History and Civics, and 4. The Arts. Stanford Achievement Tests Immediately after the search for subjects was completed, May and June 1922, the children of the main experimental group were brought together in groups of 10 to 40 and given the Stanford Achievement Tests. The number tested each age was as follows. Reckoning age as of date, the tests were given. The table is displayed on the page, comparing ages, boys, girls in total. Instead of the two information tests of the Stanford Achievement Battery, a more extended information test of the same general type was given. The other achievement tests were those of the standard achievement battery unmodified. The derivation of these tests and the procedure in giving them are described in the Manual of Directions. The occasion for undertaking the preparation of Stanford achievement tests was a need for a more reliable measure of the educational abilities of the gifted children than could be secured by any of the tests already available. It seemed a matter of considerable importance to determine with a small probable error the educational accomplishments not only of the group as a whole, but of each individual child. Before intelligent provision can be made for the education of gifted children, it is necessary to know what their accomplishments are under the present system. Whether they are achieving the limit of their abilities, whether they are being unduly retarded, whether their accomplishment is better in some subject than in others, whether they show an excessive tendency to unevenness, etc., that the standard achievement tests are capable of answering these questions with a rather high degree of accuracy is evident from the reliability coefficients of the separate tests composing the battery. These have been computed for the separate age groups of 7 to 15 years. The average age reliabilities are as follows. Paragraph meaning, 0.91. Sentence meaning, 0.89. Word meaning, 0.95. Computation, 0.87. Arithmetical reasoning, 0.88. Language usage, 0.80. Spelling, 0.91. Educational age, 0.98. The average PE of an educational age based upon the standard battery, 1.77 months, is so low that the score earned by an individual child may be accepted with considerable confidence. The total working time for the separate tests is as follows. A table is displayed on the page. Comparing the tests to grades 2 and 3 and grades 4 to 8. The time allotments are liberal enough to make each test almost entirely a test of power rather than of speed. The tests measure the child's actual mastery of the various school subjects, not his mental ability or his previous acquaintance with pencil and paper tests. The control group in this case consisted of approximately 1,800 unselected children who were tested in the derivation of the norms published in the 1923 edition of the Manual of Directions. These were enrolled in the public schools of San Jose and several other representative small cities of California. The norms yielded by this group differed little from the revised norms of 1924 based upon the analysis of 10,000 tests from representative cities of the United States. Mean scores and mean subject quotients have been computed for each age and sex group tables 107, 108, and 109. The subject quotients are in each case the quotient of the child's age score divided by his chronological age. The age norms are those given in the 1923 Manual of Directions. The figure 10a is shown the subject quotient profiles of the gifted boys and girls who took the achievement and information tests. These are based on the main quotients for the ages combined. For purposes of comparison, the main IQs are the same children who Talk the achievement and information tests are also shown in figure 10a. 
Figure 10a in tables 107, 108, and 109 show a remarkable superiority of the gifted group over the unselected school children in educational achievement. The mean subject quotients for the different ages fall chiefly between 130 and 150. Table 109 gives the distributions and mean subject quotients for the ages combined, together with the distribution and mean for the corrected IQs of the same children who took the achievement tests. The means are as follows, in order of magnitude. Mean IQ, boys 151.6, girls 151.6. Laying a quotient, 146.2 for boys, 148.3 for girls. Read quotient, 145.3 for boys, 144.7 for girls. Arithmetic quotient, 138.5 for boys, 135.7 for girls. Spelling quotient, 140.2 for boys, 137.7 for girls. Roughly, the subject quotients are about four fifths as superior as the IQs. They would doubtless be higher, but for the fact that promotions earned have been denied. That the subject matter should have been mastered to a point more than 40% above chronological age, while the children have been held on the average to a greater location only 14% above the norm of their chronological ages, is a noteworthy achievement. Table 107 displayed on the previous page means the standard deviations of achievement test scores by age. Figure 10a is displayed on the following page, subject quotient profile of gifted children, based on a mean quotient for the ages combined. There are only small sex differences in the subject matter achievement of these gifted children, although the boys of 9 years and above are somewhat superior to the girls in arithmetic, while the girls of 10 and above are slightly superior to boys in language usage. In both sexes, the main subject quotients all increase for a year or two after age 7, and show a marked decline at 12 and 13. The relatively low quotients at 6 and 7 may be due to the fact that the children of this age have attended school for only a brief period. The decline at 12 and 13 may be due to two cases. One, the fact that the brightest children of these ages were missed because of promotion to high school, and two, the inadequacy of the projected age norms above 14 years. In general, the subject quotients of a given child tended to run fairly even. Occasionally, however, specialisation of considerable magnitude was found, and in a good many cases, the degree of specialisation appeared large enough to be probably significant. The data bearing on this question have been analysed elsewhere by more accurate methods than the use of subject quotients make possible. See Chapter 12. Table 108 is displayed on the page. Means and standard deviations of subject quotients by age. It must not be supposed, however, that all of our gifted children are satisfactory pupils. The large majority of them are, according to the statements of their teachers, but there are occasional exceptions. A few are rated low in quality of schoolwork because of flagrant neglect of their daily tasks. There is reason to believe that others suffer in their class marks because of traits of personality which irritate the teacher or lead to an unjust appraisal of subject matter accomplishment. Gifted children, like others, differ greatly in temperament, ambition, personal attractiveness, and ability to display their knowledge to advantage. Some lack interest because the work is too easy for them. Table 109 is displayed on the page, distribution of subject, quotients, Ages 6 to 13 combined. General Information Tests The General Information Test, used in part identical with the information tests of the Stanford Achievement Battery, but is more reliable and covers a wider range. Two comparable forms were developed, each containing 335 items, distributed as follows. Geography, Hygiene and Elementary Science, 110 items. Language and Literature, 90 items. History and Civics, 90 items. The Arts, 45 items. Total, 335 items. The 770 items included in the two forms were selected from approximately 2,500, which were prepared. The 2,500 items were based upon an analysis of 1. Textbooks used in grades 3 to 12. 2. Courses of study. 3. Published studies on curriculum content in elementary and high schools. And 4. Other information tests. Considerable non-scholastic material was also included. 
The intention was to secure a reliable measure of general information which would be applicable to children of, of grades 3 to 12. First, the number of items was reduced to 1,647 by the combined rating of five judges. The 1,647 retained were then broken up into three comparable forms, printed and given to children in grades 3 to 9, in San Jose, Redwood City, and San Mateo, California. Each item of the 1,647 was validated by computing the percent of successful responses in each grade. Individual curves were plotted in all items, not showing a significant and consistent increase in the percent of correct responses from grade to grade were eliminated. The curves were based upon 50 pupils of approximately average ability, selected as follows from the entire number tested. 1. Each teacher ranked all the pupils of her class, in order of general scholastic ability. The median pupil, plus the eight pupils just above the median and the seven just below, were taken as representing that grade in that city. 2. Three such groups, one from each of the cities in which the preliminary tests were given, were combined to represent the grade in question. Three cities were used in order to guard against the influence of local experience and local instruction. Using the percent data as a basis for the evaluation of the 1,647 items, two final forms were made up, each having 335 items. Each item is a statement containing three response words or phrases, the correct one to be designated by underlying. In assembling the two forms, care was taken to make them analogous in content and equally difficult at all points. The individual items were arranged in order of difficulty. Illustrations of items retained in Form B are as follows. 1. Geography, Hygiene, Elementary Science 2. The Earth is shaped most like a baseball, football, pear. 22. The anvil is used by blacksmiths, carpenters, painters. 41. The house fly spreads bubonic plague, typhoid, yellow fever. 60. The ligaments are attached to the bones, intestines, stomach. 80. Cumulus refers to clouds, electricity, erosion. 100. The cube of 2 is 4, 6, 8. 110. Water enters the roots of plants by capillary osmosis solution. 2. Language and literature. 2. The shepherd boy who became king was David Saul Solomon. 22. An example of a noun is a bird for C. 44. Barbara Fritri sympathised with the English South Union. 61. Styx was the name of a giant god river. 82. E.G. means, for example, see below, that is. 3. History and civics. 3. The United States is a king, president, emperor. 23. Roger Williams was colonizer, judge, merchant. 42. The power of declaring war is vested in Congress, President, Secretary of War. 60. The Invincible Armada belonged to France, Rome, Spain. 82. The Southern States succeeded in 1850, 1861, 1865. 90. The law of gravitation was first stated by Copernicus, Galileo, Newton. 4. The Arts. 4. Crayons are used in modelling, drawing, music. 8. A duet is sung by 246. 22. RSVP means collect on delivery, informal reply expected. 39. Handel is known as a musical composer, organist, violinist. 44. Rodin is famous as an architect, a painter, a sculptor. The items in each part of the test cover an extremely wide range. For example, in Form B, Test 1, calls for information concerning soap, ivory, plans, the burrow, Tadpoles, peat, clothes, the largest state in the Union, soda, 3.1416, dynamos, the tides, plant, breathing, insulating materials, pollination, etc. Test 2 concerning Black Beauty, Cinderella's Coach, Hiawatha, Huckleberry Finn's Chum, Adjectives, The Pearl of Was, So Landfall, Gnomes, Falcon, The Author of the Raven, The Prefix Inter, The Jungle Book, Milton, etc. Test 3 concerning Columbus, colonial settlers, Muhammad, the trial by jury, the Red Cross, the Pope, the Allies of Germany, the feudal system, feudal authority, the Soviet, Horace Mann, Pericles, etc. Test 4 concerning movie stars, musical notation, mixing paints, jazz, Beethoven, 
social form, stucco, sculpture, architecture, operas, etc. One form of the test requires approximately an hour for administration. It is given as a power test, enough time being allowed for all the pupils to finish. Score is the number of right responses minus half the number of wrong responses. Both forms of the test were given to 463 unselected pupils, 216 boys and 247 girls, fairly evenly distributed in grades 3 to 9 in the cities of San Jose, Sunnyvale and Mountain View, California, for purposes of standardization. These people served as a control group in the evaluation of the scores earned by the gifted children. Half of the control group took from A first, the other half from B first. Liabilities were computed by age and grade by correlating the scores of Form A against those of Form B. These are given in Table 110. Table 110 is split on the page, Reliability Coefficients of the Information Test. The average reliability for a single age group is 0.917. The reliability of two forms, computed by Brown's formula, is 0.96. Only one form was given to the gifted group. Age norms were derived from the total score and for each of the four tests by smoothing the age means. In each case, this gave approximately a straight line from age H to age 15. In order to make possible the calculation of information quotients for the brighter children, the line was extended beyond 15. The age norms above 15 are thus fictitious units, equal in size to the units in the lower range. This is not a refined statistical procedure, but it affords a convenient method of comparing high scores when minute exactness is not demanded. Means and SDs are the gifted and control group by age and sex are shown in Table 111. Table 112 gives the distribution of information quotients of the gifted group by age and sex separately, and for ages and sexes combined. The superiority of the gifted group in general information is seen to be very great indeed. This holds for both sexes, at all ages, and for each of the four types of information tested. In most of the comparisons, the gifted excel with the control by from two to four times the standard deviation of the latter, more commonly by three or four times. The mean information quotient is about as high as the mean intelligence quotient, and is somewhat higher for gifted boys than for gifted girls. This sex difference is not found with the control. At ages 8, 9 and 10, not a single child of the control group reached the mean score of the gifted of corresponding age. The mean of the gifted boys was reached by 3.6% of the control boys at age 12, and by 2.2% at age 13. The mean of the gifted girls was reached by 2.5% of the control girls at age 11, and by 7.7% at age 12. Only two of the 291 gifted boys and five of the 242 gifted girls earned information quotient below 120. Not a single gifted child fell as low as the average of the control. The difference between the two groups is somewhat less in history and civics than in the other types of information tested. Table 113 shows that the main quotients of the gifted children tend to run highest for language and literature, the lowest for history and civics, and the arts score to girls equal the boys. In science and history, the boys excel the girls by a considerable margin. Table 111 is displayed on the following page. Means and standard deviations of information scores, gifted and control groups. Table 111 is continued on the following page. Table 112 is displayed on the following page. Distribution of information quotients of gifted children. Table 113 is displayed on the following page. Mean quotients of gifted children on the separate parts of the information test. That the gifted make a showing in general information, even better than they make in such subjects as reading, arithmetic, and spelling, is probably due to the fact that a child's stock of information is more dependent upon intellectual initiative and less upon formal school instruction. It would seem, therefore, that general information tests might be more valid than achievement tests for use in selecting pupils for special instruction in gifted classes. They probably compare well with the best group intelligence tests for this purpose, and they have the advantage of being easier to administer. In giving an information test of the kind we have used, it is only necessary to place a blank before the child and let him work through it. No supervision is necessary except to see that aid is not secured from books or from other pupils. If the child cannot be brought for a test to an examiner who is familiar with test procedure, 
A blank may be sent for use by any teacher or parent with no risk that the score will be invalidated by incorrect procedure. The influence of attendance upon educational accomplishment. The outstanding fact is that these children have accomplished so much in the various school subjects with such a brief period of instruction. For example, a gifted child of eight who has attended school only two years has usually mastered the work of about five grades as well as it has been mastered by the average unselected child at the time he is considered ready for promotion to the sixth grade. A gifted child of seven who has attended school one year has usually mastered the work of three or four grades. Actual length of school attendance seems to play a little part in determining accomplishment in comparison with the part played by native endowment. It is possible to secure a measure of the influence of length of school attendance upon educational accomplishment. Possible determinants of accomplishment are age, intelligence, and length of school attendance. The influence of any two of these may be eliminated by means of the partial correlation method, or by treating the data of a group of subjects who have the same, or practically the same, chronological age. We have taken for treatment the 109 cases having a chronological age of 10 to 11 years at the time the achievement test was given. The IQs of these children ranged from 139 to 190, with standard deviation of 10.44. The length of school attendance ranged from 2 years to 6.5 years, with standard deviation of 0.858 of a year. The following correlations were found. A table is displayed on the page comparing school attendance first, spelling, information, reading, and arithmetic quotient, and again with IQ versus spelling, information, reading, and arithmetic quotient with raw score and standard deviation. It is evident that school attendance, although it has varied greatly, has been no appreciable effect on subject matter accomplishment. On the other hand, the IQ, although the range is relatively very small, has been an important factor in determining accomplishment. Summary The educational accomplishment of 543 children of the main experimental group was measured by the Stanford Achievement Tests in Reading, Arithmetic, Language Usage and Spelling and by a general information test of 335 items. The results of all of these tests have been compared with the test scores of unselected school children of corresponding age. The most important findings are as follows. 1. The superiority of the gifted children of a given age over unselected children of corresponding age is very great, amounting in most cases to from 3 to 4 times the standard deviation of the unselected age group. This superiority holds for all the fields of accomplishment tested, at all ages, and with both sexes. 2. The accomplishment quotient of the gifted in the various school subjects tends to run from 3 fourths to 4 fifths as far above the average as do the intelligence quotients. The information quotients, however, run about as high as the intelligence quotients. No child in the gifted group earned an information quotient as low as 110. 3. In general, the average gifted child has mastered the subject matter of instruction to a point 40% above his chronological age, although he has been held back to a grade location only 14% beyond the norm for his chronological age. 4. The superiority of the gifted is greatest in general information, language usage, and reading, and least in history and civics. The quotients of the gifted are higher in the age ranges 8 to 12 than for younger older children. 5. Gifted boys excel gifted girls in general information, arithmetic, and spelling. The girls of 10 and above are slightly superior to boys in language usage. When the scores of the sexes on the separate parts of the information tests are compared, the boys are found markedly superior to the girls in science and history, and somewhat superior in language and literature. On information relating to the arts, the girls do as well as the boys. 6. There are a few cases of extreme unevenness among the various quotients of gifted child, but degree of specialisation large enough to be of possible significance were fairly numerous. 7. The accomplishment quotients of a considerable number of gifted children are higher than the teacher's marks given on the basis of daily performance in the classroom would lead one to expect. Presumably, in such cases, the teacher has either underestimated the child's accomplishment or has given low marks as a penalty for lack of application to the set tasks of the school. 8. At a given age, there is practically no correlation between educational accomplishment and the number of terms the gifted child has attended school. The causes of school success and a school failure lie deeper. 9. The general information test described in this chapter is an excellent test for use in the identification of gifted children. End of section 11.
Section 12 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1 Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis Terman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 12, Part 1 Specialization of the Abilities of Gifted Children James C. DeVos The Problem both vocational and educational guidance must rest upon the counsellor's ability to estimate the equipment of the one being guided. This estimate must not be limited to the general bird's eye view of the abilities of the child, but must include such precise statements as, the boy is better in arithmetic to such and such a degree than he is in composition, or better in history to such and such a degree than he is in literature, since the gifted children represent high potentiality, our ability to make precise statements concerning their equipment is a matter of great consequence. It is to supply a basis for deriving such statements that this investigation was undertaken. In regard to the specialization of abilities, several important queries arise. Are gifted children more specialized than other children in their development? Are they one-sided in their development, or do their abilities lie in a uniformly high level? When one ability is highly developed, is this development at the expense of other abilities? The answers to these questions can be best read from precise descriptions of the services of the abilities of the gifted children. These descriptions necessitate the accurate measurement of the abilities to be described. The abilities under consideration are those which were measured by the Stanford Achievement Test, a group of four information tests and the Stanford Binet Scale. This measurement is but a small sampling of the abilities of a child but it includes those of considerable importance in school work. In the measurement of reading, there are tests of word meaning, sentence meaning, and paragraph meaning. For arithmetic, there are measures of computation and of reasoning or problem solving. Of the other school subjects, there are measures of language usage, of spelling from dictation, and of information in science, in literature, in history and civics, and in music and art. The use of these tests is best defended by the statistical treatment to which they have been subjected, as described elsewhere and here. Certainly the authors are justified in the statement that these tests have reliability coefficients, which are very much higher than we are accustomed to find in the experimental literature on educational tests. Method of Treatment of Data The data treated in the following pages were secured as described on page 310. The arrangement of the data for the study of the unevenness of the abilities measured demanded that the scores be expressed in units common to all of the tests. Several such units are available. Quotients, T-scores, grade percentile scores, and Z-scores, or standard scores, were considered, with the result that the last name were adopted. The standard score expresses the distance from the mean of an age group in terms of the standard deviation of that group. Thus, a standard score of 1.5 in arithmetic reasoning means that this score is 1.5 standard deviations above the mean for the age group in which the individual making the score was found. Use was made of these standard scores in connection with four types of study. 1. The application of Kelly's ratio. This ratio is applied to a gifted and to a control group, so that the unevenness of the two groups may be compared. 2. A general survey of the nature of the unevenness of the age groups of the gifted children, including some comparisons between the various achievement levels and the intelligence levels as established by the Stanford Binet Test. 3. Several studies of types of unevenness of both gifted and control groups. 4. Case studies with the assistance of profile charts or psychographs. For three of these methods, there is no significant historical account other than the reference cited. The fourth representing case studies and profile charts has a rich historical background. The development of the method of case studies rests directly on the development of the method of measurement of human traits. The history of such measurement is too long to be recounted here, and it has been often presented in textbooks on the subject. The advantages of the profile method were first set forth by Rosolimo, who employed tests of 10 different functions. Each test was scored by means of a scale of 10 steps, 0 representing just not any ability to do the test, and 10 representing perfect performance. Claparede 
has justly criticised Rossolimo's method of scoring because of its arbitrary character and has suggested a profile based upon percentile scores. Barch has extended the Rossolimo method by the addition of a number of tests, but the rossolimo barsch method still retains the weakness of the original method in its arbitrary graduation. In America, the profile method has been used by many investigators. Cordes employed it with the arithmetic tests, using scores for points on the profile and both grade norms and arbitrary stands for comparison. Kelly used percentile charts for 11 dimensions in his study of delinquent boys. Several types of profile charts are described and illustrated by Hollingworth. These she calls psychographs. The Stanford Achievement Test Manual gives instructions for constructing a profile based on subject ages. These are representative of the profile methods that have been used. None of the methods would be as suitable for the present purpose as the use of Stanford scores. A comparison of a gifted and a control group by the use of Kelly's ratio. The comparison of gifted with unselected children required a selection of two representative groups which should have similar opportunities for development of the abilities measured. As this study called for two hours of measurement of each child and the calculation of 40 or more coefficients of correlation for each group, it was fortunate that data were already available for a group of 96 unselected children from 8th grade. It remained to secure data from a suitable gifted group. The 643 gifted children show a very wide range of grade placement, of chronological age and of mental age. A group of gifted 8th grade children would not be satisfactory because their scores would too often be close to or actually at the maximum possible with the Stanford Achievement Tests. It therefore seemed best to select a group which would represent about the same level of achievement as that represented by the 8th grade group. After inspection of groups selected by the use of chronological age and grade placement as criteria, these criteria were abandoned and a group was selected on the basis of mental age. The range taken was from MA 14-0 to MA 15-5. This is roughly 8th grade ability. Inasmuch as the mental ability of a child largely determines school success and has considerable influence on school progress, this range of mental age assures a certain homogeneity. Table 113A is displayed on the page, data concerning the 100 gifted children selected for special study. Furthermore, the comparison contemplated in this study depends upon reliability coefficients and correlations and does not rest on a comparison of the scores made by individual pupils. Hence, the degree of homogeneity of opportunity represented by this selection of gifted children is the best obtainable. Table 113a gives the important facts concerning this group of gifted children. In Table 114 are shown the scores made by five of the gifted children. This table illustrates the difficulty of judging the significance of the differences in ability when they are expressed in terms of scores. The question, is EA better in arithmetic, computation or arithmetic reasoning, cannot be answered from this table. However, when the scores are given in terms of their distances above or below their respective age norms, such questions as the one asked may be answered. Table 115 gives the means, standard deviations, and reliability coefficients of the tests for the group of gifted children which were selected for this comparison. Table 114 is displayed on the page, sample scores on the tests used. Using the means and standard deviations of Table 115, the raw scores of Table 114 are changed so they state the distance with each score is above or below the mean in terms of the standard deviation of the distribution of such scores for this group. The standard scores for the five illustrated cases are given in Table 116. Thus, the score of 88 in arithmetic computation for subject EA is equivalent to the standard score 1.059. If Z is a standard score, Z equals score minus mean of standard deviation. Therefore, Z equals 88 minus 111.7 over 22.36 minus 1.059. Table 115 is displayed on the page, data concerning the special gifted group. These standard scores for the five subjects were given in Table 116. From this table, we can answer the question concerning the interrelationship of the abilities of EA. He is only a very little better in arithmetic computation than he is in arithmetic reasoning. The difference is 0.551 standard scores. 
Other differences in his abilities are also apparent. The difference between his scores in paragraph meaning and arithmetic reasoning is 1.51 standard scores. We shall call such differences as these D's. Then D equals Z1 minus Z2. When Z1 is a standard score in one subject, such as paragraph meaning, and Z2 is a standard score in another subject, such as arithmetic reasoning. Table 116 is displayed on the page. Scores of tables 114 expressed as standard scores. A striking difference is that for LB, her score in paragraph meaning is 2.57 standard deviations above her score in arithmetic computation. Is this D a true, valid difference, or is a spurious difference occurring because the tests used are not perfectly reliable? Certainly the test in paragraph meaning and the test in computation both lack reliability. The difference of 2.57 standard deviations may be spurious. Also the D of 0 0.03 between the Z score for word meaning and the Z score for sentence meaning for subject LB would seem to indicate that this pupil has practically the same amount of ability in these two fields. If the test for sentence meaning and word meaning were very unreliable, a real difference might be hidden. There is a test of the validity of these differences. Suppose that we had the true Z scores found from the average of the Z scores secured by taking the test an infinite number of times. Call this true Z score for paragraph meaning Z infinity and the true Z score for computation Z10. Then Z infinity minus Z10 equals the true D between computation and paragraph meaning for LB. What is the probable divergence of the obtained Ds from these true Ds? Kelly has supplied the standard error for such differences. The formula is sigma a point infinity 10 equals square root of 2 minus rn minus r 2n, in which sigma d infinity 10 is a standard deviation of the difference between the true d z infinity minus z 10 and the successfully obtained d's using different forms of the same period of tests in one individual. R11 is a reliability coefficient on one test, say computation, and R211 is a reliability coefficient of the other tests, such as paragraph meaning in the case discussed above. As Kelly has said, this formula fills a long-felt need since it makes possible the determination of the probable errors of our judgment of differences of abilities within the individual. The PE of individual Z1 minus Z2 equals 0.6745, the square root 2 minus R11 minus R211. Table 117 shows the PE is calculated by this formula for our group of 100 and for all of the possible differences in scores. Returning to the difference of 2.57 standard deviations and counted in the case of LB as the difference between her Z scores in paragraph meaning and computation, we can answer the question concerning the probable validity of this difference. From Table 117, we find the PE of this difference is 0.39 and the difference is 6.59 times as great as its PE, we may conclude that it is a true difference. We may thus use a PE as a test of the differences encountered in the scores of individual children. The method opens important possibilities for vocational and educational guidance. We have frequently assumed that differences such as these exist, and achievement educational quotients has seen to support the assumption. With this formula, we may give the assumption statistical precision. Again, referring to LB as an example, we may show some of the differences between her scores with probable errors. Thus, a table is split on the page comparing the differences in her series of subjects to the PE score. Here is a case of a girl 11 years of age in the 7th grade with an MA of 15 and an IQ of 142, who is definitely more proficient in reading, in literature, and in art than in arithmetic and science. This use of the probable errors may be extended indefinitely, inasmuch as there is no probable errors in this table larger than 0.54, and the average of all the probable errors shown is 0.276, and since differences of 1.00 and greater are not uncommon in Table 116, there are good prospects for the location of many significant differences. Before undertaking a detailed study of individuals, it will be of interest to discover the proportion of cases which present significant differences. The method is also one devised by Dr. T. L. Kelly, as pointed out by Kelly. The frequency with which differences of various sorts are revealed by these fallible tests will not exactly parallel the importance of the differences in the nature of the pupil studied, because the tests are not equally reliable. Thus, if given four traits, A, B, C, D, 
such that children intrinsically vary as much in the difference a minus b as in the difference c minus d and give a further measures of a and b which are more liable than those of c and d then we will be able to discover and determine the differences a minus b more often than differences c minus d we must therefore keep in mind that the ease with which differences are discovered by the aid of the Stanford achievement test depends upon first the extent to which the individual abilities differ and second the reliability of the tests table 117 is displayed on the page probable errors of the true differences p e delta infinity 10 of individual z infinity 1 z infinity 2 what proportion of their cases in our special group of 100 gifted children show differences of the type Z1 minus Z2, which are so great as to be significant? As we have seen, the standard deviation for differences such as Z1 minus Z2 for an individual is sigma d for infinity 10 equals the square root of 2 minus R11 minus R22. In the case of LB, we use this sigma d infinity 10 to test the probable verity of the difference between z1 for paragraph meaning and z2 for computation. We found sigma d infinity 10 equals 0.58. If the standard deviation for the 100 similar differences found in our group should be the same as this, it would be evident that the obtained differences are not greater than chance would indicate. The usual formula for the standard deviation of a difference is sigma d equals the square root of sigma z1 squared plus sigma z2 squared minus 2r12 sigma z1 sigma z2 equals the square root of 2 minus 2r12, in which sigma d is the standard deviation for the 100 differences and R12 is a correlation between the distributions of paragraph meaning and computation scores. The correlation between the paragraph meaning and the computation score is 0.25. Then, sigma d equals square root of 2 minus 2, with brackets 0.25, equals 1.24. Therefore, since sigma d infinity 10 is 0.58, and sigma d is 1.24, the obtained differences are greater than that are accounted for by chance alone. To determine the proportion of cases greater than those due to chance, we first define the ratio sigma d infinity 10 over sigma d equals 0.58 over 1.23 equals 0.47. And we then enter table 118 with this value to find that 35% of the 100 cases of differences between paragraph meaning and computation scores are greater than can be accounted for by chance. Table 118 is displayed on the page, proportion differences in excess of the chance proportions. This situation is represented in figure 11, in which the shaded area represents the proportion of differences which are in excess of chance differences. The dotted curve represents a distribution with sigma d infinity 20 as a standard deviation. The full line curve represents a distribution with sigma d as a standard deviation. Figure 11 is displayed on the page, showing distributions of found and true differences between scores. The full line curve represents a distribution of 100 differences of the type Z1 minus Z2, with a standard deviation of 1.24. The dotted line indicates a distribution with its standard deviation of 0.47, or sigma d infinity 10, for the differences between Z scores for an individual. Using the intercorrelations of Table 119, and the reliability coefficients of table 120. The ratio sigma d infinity 10 over sigma d is calculated for each pair of the seven achievement tests and for the four information tests. Certain ratios between some of the total scores are added for the purpose of comparing general reading and arithmetic ability with the other scores. In all cases, sigma d was larger than sigma d infinity 10. Hence, every comparison shows measurable disparity. That is, some differences greater than can be expected from chance variation. Table 120 presents the mean percentages of such differences. Arithmetic, reading, and information totals are separated from the other percentages as they obviously belong in another category. 
The most significant fact in this table is that the wonder gifted children show measurable disparity for every pair of tests. For the group music and art information and language usage show the least disparity. The mean of the percentages for the 55 comparisons involving the 11 tests is 29.3, including the comparisons with arithmetic total, reading total, and information total as 20 comparisons and changes the mean to 30.4. Hence, figure 11 with a shared area showing 35% involves only a little higher percentage than the type for this group. Table 119 is displayed on the page, intercorrelations of the standard achievement tests for the special group of 100 gifted children. The average percentage of differences, which are in excess of the percentage due to chance for each of the 10 pairs having one test constant, are shown in Table 121. From Table 121, it is evident that spelling ability as measured by the standard achievement test develops more independently of the other tests than any of the other abilities measured. Computation is a close second. The mean of all the percentages in Table 1 to 21 is 29. The five tests which are above the mean are measuring abilities which are largely independent of any measured by the other tests. Table 1 to 20 is displayed on the page. The percentages of differences in excess of the percentage due to chance factors. Viewing tables 1 to 20 and 1 to 21 as descriptive for the group of 100 gifted children, it is clear that they have furnished a substantial percentage of valid differences for every pair of tests. Furthermore, there is a higher degree of differences for the 11 tests. The greater average percent of differences occurs for the series of 10 pairs of tests which have spelling in common. The next slide is for the computation series, and the smallest percentage for the series which includes language users as one member of each of the 10 pairs. It is clear that in the group of 100 gifted children, there is significant inequality in the development of the abilities measured by the tests. Are these significant inequalities greater or less than those which would be encountered in unselected or at least a less rigorously selected group of children? Table 121 is split on the page. The mean percentage of measurable disparity for each test when it is compared with all the other tests. Kelly's investigation of 96 pupils from four Palo Alto 8th grades furnishes data for such a comparison. Although the 8th grade children have been in school longer than our gifted group and are older chronologically, they probably do not average quite so high in mental age. The range of mental ages for the 8th graders is doubtless much greater than the 18 months range of our gifted group. Just how these differences between the two groups would operate in their effect on the measurable disparity within individuals is difficult to say. Longer experience in school could be expected to bring up a child's ability in some of the subjects. For example, arithmetic reasoning, spelling and history and civics information should be brought up toward the general level of an individual's ability by the rather uniform school training. On the other hand, given definite interests or stimuli for acquiring musical or literary information, the older 8th grade children have had several years in which to raise these functions above their general level. Table 122 gives the data for 96 8th grade children, together with the comparable data for the gifted. The upper figure in each cell is the percentage of differences in the test scores of individuals, which is in excess of the chance differences for the gifted children, while the lower figure is the percentage for the 8th grade children. The main percentage of difference for the 8th grade children is 28.2, for the gifted children it is 30.7. These means indicate slightly more of an unevenness for the gifted children. Table 1 to 22 is displayed on the page. Comparison of 100 gifted and 96 controlled children in percentage of differences in the individual test scores in excess of the chance percentage. There are 35 pairs of traits compared in Table 1 to 22, of which 13 pairs show variation of 1% or less. If we do not count the 7 pairs which include the total scores, we find that gifted children show greater unevenness in 15 or 54% of the compared traits, and that the gifted and controlled groups have equal measurable disparity in 7 or 25% of the comparisons. The children of the 8th grade control group show greater measurable disparity in only 6 or 21.4% of the pairs. If these differences between test scores are definitely related to intrinsic differences in traits, there is evidence that the gifted children are slightly more specialised and even more truly real persons with specific and unique mental mechanisms than are unselected children. 
One reason for thinking the differences found may not be in perfect correlation with the true differences is the fact that these tests are not all equally reliable. We may estimate that the differences would be if all the tests were equally reliable. The mean reliability coefficient is 0.829. If all tests are weighed equally and the totals of arithmetic reading and information are omitted, the correlation between arithmetic reasoning and arithmetic computation is 0.551. But if the two tests were perfectly reliable, this correlation would be r infinity 10 equals r12 over the square root of r11 by the square root of r211 equals 0.551 over the square root of 0.898 by the square root of 0.864 equals 0.626. This r infinity 10 is a probable correlation between the true scores of the two traits. The formula is Spearman's formula for correlation of attenuation. But let us suppose that the two tests are equally reliable and that their reliability is 0.829, or the same as the mean reliability for all the tests. Then substituting their value for r11 and r211, and solving for R12, we have R12 equals 0.626 by the square root of 0.829 by the square root of 0.829 equals 0.626 multiplied by 0.829 equals 0.519. Next, we can find the ratio sigma d infinity 10 over sigma d for arithmetic computation and arithmetic reasoning under the assumed condition that their reliabilities are both 0.829. Sigma d infinity 10 over sigma d equals square root of 2 minus 0.829 minus 0.829 over the square root of 2 minus 2 multiplied by 0.519 equals 0.597. Using this ratio to enter table 1 to 19, we find 0.24, which is a measurable disparity between computation and arithmetic reasoning if both tests have reliability of 0.829. Table 1, 2, 3 is built up in this way. It shows the best estimate of what the relationships between the abilities of the children in this group would be if the reliabilities were all equal and all 0.829. Table 1, 23 is displayed on the page. Percentage of differences in individual test scores in excess of the chance percentage in case the reliability of each test is 0.829. Gifted children. The results of Kelly's application of this method to the 8th grade pupils, together with the comparable results from Table 1 to 23, are shown in Table 124. Table 1 to 24 supplies another comparison of the two groups of children. The mean of all the percents in Table 1 to 24 is 28.89 for the gifted group and 27.82 for the control group. In the 28 cells of this table, we find the gifted children showing a larger percentage 13 times, the 8th grade children 12 times, and the two, an equal percent, three times. Comparing these findings with those recorded in Table 1 to 22, it appears that under the condition of uniform reliability, the gifted and control groups show less difference in the amounts of unevenness than they show as tested by the tests used. In Table 1 to 22, 10 cells of 28 show a difference of one or less, while the Table 1 to 24, 8 cells show similar differences. Table 1 to 24 is displayed on the page, Percentages of differences in individual test scores in excess of the chance percentage in case the reliability is the mean for the group. Table 1 out of 25 shows a mean percentage of measurable disparity in each test when it is compared with all other tests. The data of Table 1 out of 25 shows many interesting facts concerning the parallelism of development of the traits measured. Those which are most nearly parallel in their development as revealed in the tests of the gifted children and the percentages of measurable disparity are as follows. Music and art versus science information, 16%. Word meaning versus sentence meaning, 17%. Language usage versus sentence meaning, 18%. Language usage versus word meaning, 19%. Music and art versus science information, 19%. Language usage versus science information, 20%. Table 1 of 25 is displayed on the page. The mean percentage of measurable disparity for each test when it is compared with all the other tests, showing most independence of development, or at least parallelism in its relation to all other traits measured, is spelling. In the case of word meaning and spelling, the disparity is 42.5, which raises the question whether the meaning of words and the spelling of words are not less intimately related than the majority of school subjects. 
When we find the mean of the percentages of measurable disparity between each test and all the others, spelling has the largest percentage and language usage the smallest. This may be seen in Table 1 to 25, where the facts are given in the third column under the caption from Table 1 to 21. From this table, it is evident that the condition of uniform reliability considerably alters the rank order of the tests in their measurable disparity. The condition of uniform reliability also affects the mean of the differences. Taking the reliabilities as found, the differences in Table 1 to 22 were greater for the gifted children in 54% of cases, greater for the control group in 21% of cases, and equal in 25%. Under the condition of uniform reliability, the paired comparisons of Table 1 to 25 show greater measurable disparity as follows. Gifted 46.4, control 42.8, equal disparity 10.7. Although these results so far indicate a slightly greater unevenness for the gifted children, they must not be allowed to obscure the more important fact that both groups of children are characterised by a considerable unevenness of their abilities as measured by these tests. A further comparison by means of type groups of gifted unselected children. The comparison just completed is based upon the reliability coefficients and the intercorrelations between the tests. A more direct a more nearly one-to-one -one comparison is desirable. Furthermore, the first comparison demanded that two groups be chosen, and it may be that other groups would show other results. The method used in the following study furnishes a check on the earlier method, and at the same time throws light on the popular view as to the supposed compensatory distribution of abilities. The problem of the specialization of abilities presents itself to the teacher and to the parent in a way which suggested by the descriptive terms good readers and poor readers, good spellers and poor spellers, good calculators. Let us assume that goodness and poorness in these terms are relative within one individual's equipment. Then a good reader would be a pupil who could read better than he could spell, write or calculate regardless of his general mental level. If we limit our discussion to children showing such specialization, we may then ask, are the good readers among the gifted children more or less specialized than the good readers among the other children? Popular opinion seems to hold that such specialization occurs more frequently among supernormal than subnormal children. To make this comparison, three groups of good readers were selected. First, for a control group, we have 307 representative 12-year-old children for whom we have scores from the Stanford Achievement Tests. The criterion of selection of good readers was a difference between the Stanford scores of the reading total and the arithmetic total. The difference between these scores was calculated for each of the 307 cases, and then the 20 showing the reading scores most in excess of their arithmetic scores were arbitrarily chosen as good readers. Perhaps these were as much poor calculators as good readers, but as the same method is used for selecting the good readers from the gifted children, it furnishes a valid basis for comparison. Table 126 shows the standard scores for the 20 good readers from the 307 representative 12-year-old children. The mean grade location for these 20 12-year-old children is 6.77 grades, which is the equivalent of about the 8th grade month in the 6th grade, or May in the school year, if there were no high and low divisions. Two groups of gifted children are compared with these 20 good readers, selected from typical 12-year-old children. One 20 12-year-old gifted good readers, whose standard scores are shown in Table 1 to 27, and two 26th grade good readers, whose standard scores are shown in Table 1 to 28. These gifted good readers were selected by the same method as that followed in the selection of the typical 12-year-old children. The 12-year-old gifted children were selected because they have in common with the typical 12-year-old children 12 years of experience. The gifted children have had a more extensive school training since their grade placement ranges from the 7th to the 9th, with the mean in the low 8th, while the typical 12-year-old good readers have a mean grade placement of high 6th and range from high 4th to high 8th. This additional schooling, which averages a little more than a grade to each child, would seem to give the gifted children an opportunity for more varied development and hence greater specialization. Table 126 is displayed on the page, standard scores of 20 typical 12-year-old good readers. Table 127 is displayed on the following page, standard scores of 20 gifted 6th grade good readers. Table 128 is displayed on the page, standard scores of 20 gifted 12-year-old good readers. This expectation is not fulfilled. 
as we shall see when we examine the data of Table 129. The sixth grade good readers, Table 128, were selected for comparison with the typical 12-year-old good readers because the latter have a mean grade placement of 6.77 or high sixth grade. Then sixth grade gifted good readers probably have a school experience and training quite similar to that of the typical 12-year-old good readers. From these three tables, 126, 127 and 128, we may secure the numerical equivalence of a composite photograph on the profile charts of each group of 20 good readers. This composite photograph for each group is described by the mean standard scores given at the bottom of its table. These mean scores assembled in one table, table 1 to 29, give an opportunity for a direct comparison of the three groups. Table 1 to 29 is displayed on the page, numerical profiles of three groups of good readers. From table 1 to 29 and figure 12, it is apparent that the gifted good readers are superior to the typical 12-year-old children in all the abilities measured. An inspection of the three composite profiles of figure 12 does not reveal any marked differences in unevenness, but there is a defect of such a graphical representation. Obviously, in this picture, the emphasis is on the difference between the standard scores for adjacent ordinates, such as language usage and spelling, while the differences between non-contiguous ordinates, such as language usage and science information, is almost lost to view. To bring out these concealed differences, tables 130 and 131 have been prepared. In these tables, the differences between the mean standard scores are expressed in terms of standard scores. They could be expressed in terms of the standard errors or the probable errors of such differences. Sigma D with infinity 10 or PED infinity 10, but such standard errors would be the same for all the scores of 12 year old children and but slightly different for 9, 10, and 11 year old children of the sixth grade group and hence would not materially change our comparisons. Figure 12 displayed on the previous page profiles of three groups of good readers. Table 130 is displayed on the page. Differences between mean standard scores of 20 typical 12-year-old good readers and 20 gifted 12-year-old good readers. The standard errors, sigma d, infinity 10, for 12-year-old children never rise above 60 and are usually below 50. Hence, we may think of the differences expressed in our present study as multiplied by 2 if we wish to think of their probable validity. In Table 130, the differences between the mean score in language usage and spelling are 0.42 standard deviation for the gifted and 0.26 for the control group. Hence, the difference between these two scores is greater in the case of the gifted group. There are 28 such comparisons in this table, exclusive of those involving the arithmetic total and reading total scores by which the groups were selected. Table 131 is displayed on the page. Differences between the mean standard score of 20 typical 12 year old good readers and 20 gifted 6th grade good readers. In these 28 comparisons, the differences are greater for the control group 16 times and greater for the gifted group 12 times. At the bottom of this table are displayed the means of the differences between each test and all the other tests. Thus, the mean of all the differences between language usage and the other test scores for the gifted group is 0.49 and for the control group is 0.38. Of such means, there are eight if we again exclude all differences which involve total scores, arithmetic and reading. Of these eight differences, five are greater for the control group and three are greater for the gifted group. If we add all the 28 differences for the control group, the total is 14.51, while for the gifted group it is 13.11. Therefore, by every comparison, the composite profiles of gifted 12-year-old good readers show slightly less of an evenness or specialisation then does the composite profile of typical 12-year-old good readers. A similar analysis of Table 131 indicates that the composite profile of the 20 gifted 6th grade good readers also shows slightly less of an evenness than does the composite profile of the 20 typical 12-year-old good readers. The comparisons used in Table 130 and 131 are summarised below. A small table displayed on the page comparing gifted 12-year-olds to typical 12-year-olds and give to 6th graders to typical 12-year-olds. Good readers, if they represent a type, must be one of many types. Since they were selected with reference to their total scores in arithmetic, it is interesting to examine their complementary type, which we shall call good calculators. Here again, our term may be a misnomer, for these may be poor readers as well as good calculators, 
for they are good in arithmetic when their arithmetic score is compared with their reading scores. Again, three groups were selected, typical 12-year-olds, gifted 12-year-olds, and gifted 6th graders. The composite profiles of these three kinds of good calculators are given in figure 13. As in the case of the good readers, the profiles of the gifted children, who are good calculators, show a tendency for arithmetic reasoning to be higher than computation. When typical 12-year-old good calculators are compared with the gifted 12-year-old good calculators, it develops that there is more of an evenness in the control group. Of the 28 paired comparisons, one pair shows the same difference for the two groups. Four show greater differences for the gifted, and 23 show greater differences for the typical 12-year-old children. The total of the 28 differences for the control group is 14.82, while the total for the gifted group is 6.99. All of the mean differences for one test compared with all others are greater for the control group. How do the gifted 6th grade good calculators compare with unselected 12-year-old good calculators in specialization of abilities? The comparison reverses the one just given. Here we find but 12 of the 28 pairs of differences to be greater for the control group and 16 greater for the gifted 6th graders. The total of the 28 differences for the gifted 6th graders is 17.63 as compared with the total for the control group of 14.82. The means of each test against all others are greater for the gifted in 7 cases and greater for the control group in 1. All of the evidence here is indicative of greater unevenness of gifted 6th grade good calculators than for unselected 12-year-old good calculators. Figure 13 is displayed on the previous page. Profiles of three groups of good calculators. The selection of good readers and good calculators is based upon total scores in reading and arithmetic, respectively. In each selection, the differences considered are consequently differences between total scores, which in their turn are based upon tests having considerable independence. Because of this use of total scores, it seems advisable to use another selection based upon a comparison with the spelling scores. Three groups were chosen because in their respective larger groups, they showed the greater differences between the score in spelling and that in reading total. We have called these groups good spellers. The group from which these good spellers were taken are the same that were used before. Typical 12-year-old children, gifted 12-year-old children, and gifted 6th grade children. The composite profiles of these three selections of scores are found in figure 14. The three profiles are nearly parallel. A summary of the differences adds to this graphic testimony that the three groups have similar unevenness. Comparing the typical group with the gifted 12-year-old children reveals 15 of the 20 differences to be greater for the gifted and 13 greater for the typical children. While the main differences when one test is compared with all others, five are greater for the control group and three for the gifted. If there is any difference between these groups, it is in favour of slightly greater unevenness for the control group, but the difference is negligible. The gifted sixth grade good spellers are more uneven than the typical 12 year old good spellers. This result is more definite than that of the preceding comparison. In the 28 pairs, the gifted show greater differences 17 times, and of the eight, means when one test is compared with all others, seven are larger for the gifted group. Figure 14 is displayed on the page. Profiles of three groups of good spellers. End of section 12. Section 13 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1. Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis M. Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Section 13. Chapter 12. Part 2. Conclusion from the two methods of comparison. We can now bring together the results of the comparison by means of Kelly's ratio and the comparison of the groups of 20 each by means of composite profiles. The first method shows a gifted to be slightly more uneven, although the difference in unevenness is not so significant as the resemblance. In other words, the fact that both the 8th graders and the gifted children show significant unevenness is the most important conclusion. In comparing the first method with the second, the threefold selection, it must be recalled 
that the latter method deals with the comparison of the differences between obtained standard scores. It is probable that the first method is to be relied upon as giving the more trustworthy estimate, since it deals with the best estimates of the true scores. The study of the composite profiles attempts to select types and compares gifted and controlled children of approximately the same type. It is conceivable that the slightly greater unevenness of the group of gifted children with MA 14-15.4 as compared with the 8th grade children is due to the criterion of selection. On the other hand, the threefold comparisons show greater unevenness for the gifted children in two out of the six comparisons made. It is possible that a selection of other types on the same principle would show an equal amount of unevenness for the gifted control groups, and it is even possible that gifted groups might show greater unevenness in a majority of the types selected. The lack of conspicuous differences between gifted and unselected children in the specialization of the abilities is the outstanding fact. Gifted children are unique individuals, but unselected children are no less so. Gifted children may be more successful specialists and thus attract more attention, but it should be observed that they are superior in all abilities. On the other hand, children of ordinary or mediocre general intelligence often possess specialized abilities and are overlooked because they are not so conspicuous when they appear in the gifted specialist. Children all levels of mental ability must be recognized as unique individuals with unique educational and vocational needs. Nature of the unevenness and the abilities of gifted children The conclusion that neither superior nor ordinary intelligence is predictive of types of unevenness leaves us the tasks of the description of the unevenness of individual children. When this is accomplished for our gifted group, there are numerous possibilities of studying these descriptions in various combinations. It will be recalled that the 643 gifted children were tested by means of 12 tests. The seven tests of the Stanford Achievement Battery, four tests from an Information Battery, and the Stanford Binet. The scores from these tests are used in the following study. As age groups below 6 and above 13 were represented by a few cases only, the scores of children between and including these ages were used. A few incomplete scores made it necessary to reduce the group to about 550, the number varying slightly in various portions of the treatment. The composite profiles used in the preceding section represent the graphic method of description of the surface of abilities. A similar profile was prepared for each child studied. Figure 15 illustrates this type of profile chart. Figure 15 is a profile for AK. The heavy line at zero stand score represents the average scores made in the various tests by 10-year-old children. These average scores are given in Table 133, page 344. The lines running parallel to the line of the mental scores mark off stand scores above and below the means. Thus a stand score on the ordinate for mental age is a little less than 4, indicating that AK's mental age is nearly 4 standard deviations above the average MA for 10-year-old children. The scores from tests of paragraph meaning, word meaning and sentence meaning were added to make up the score of a reading total. The scores for computation and arithmetic reasoning were added to make up the arithmetic total. Similarly, the scores on the information tests were combined to make the information total. Hence the scores for reading total, arithmetic total, and information total are separated by its space to indicate that they are a different category from the other scores. The solar line which crosses the page in a very regular course connects the points which represent AK scores on the test indicated. This line is AK's profile of abilities in so far as we have measured them. It starts at the left from a point on the perpendicular which represents a Stanford Binet MA of 14 to 10, which is the equivalent of a standard score of 3.8. This line finds its lowest point at computation. On the other hand, AK's score in history and civics information is more than five standard deviations above the mean. All of his scores in the information tests are well above their means. Thus the distance on the perpendicular lines between the line of the means and the profile line are the measure of the differences between AK's accomplishment and the average accomplishment of 10-year-old children. Figure 15 is displayed on the previous page, Profiles of AK. Boy, age 10 to 3, mental age 14 to 10, IQ 144, grade I4. 
Some might wish to compare a pupil's accomplishment with the average accomplishment of children by the same intelligence level. This comparison has been attempted by means of the accomplishment quotient. Such a comparison is found in Figure 15. The dotted line on AK's profile crosses points, which are the age equivalents in scores on the several tests corresponding to MA1410. That is, these age equivalents are estimated to be the average scores of children 14 years, 10 months old. It must be remembered, however, that the units of comparison along the perpendicular lines are not the standard deviations for the distribution of scores made by 14-year-old children, but are still the standard deviations for 10-year-old children. We know that it is the tendency for standard deviations of the older age groups to grow to greater, hence a case profile plotted on a form prepared from data secured from 14-year-old children would show the profile line to be nearer the line of the means than it is to the broken line in figure 15. While the data for 14-year-old children are not available, the data for 13-year-old children make it possible to plot this profile on the chart for the latter. The result indicates that the profile is much more even than it is in figure 15. In the profile of figure 15, there are numerous conspicuous differences. It appears that the score in history and civics information is much higher, about five standard deviations, than the score in computation. On the other hand, the difference between the score in word meaning and that in sentence meaning is not large. How large must the difference be before we can pronounce it a true difference, independent of such factors as the unreliability of the tests? We must answer this by use of the standard deviation of such differences. Kelly's formula, sigma, d infinity 10 equals the square root of 2 minus r to 1 minus r to 11 supplies a standard error needed. These standard errors were calculated for all possible differences between test scores for the age groups 6 to 30 inclusive. Space does not permit the publication of these here. They are on file in the library at Standard University. The construction of the profiles also made necessary the calculation of means, standard deviations, and reliability coefficients for each test for each age group. In the case of the standard achievement tests, these calculations were made from the groups on which the tests were standardized. Other groups have used for calculating the reliability coefficients for the information tests and for the standard binet. These data are shown in tables 132, 133, and 134. Table 132 is displayed on the page. Standard deviations of age grade distribution of a test is indicated. With the standard errors, let us examine the differences found in figure 15, a case profile. Let us take the difference between any two scores, such as paragraph meaning 1.94 and arithmetic computation 0.38. Here the difference is 1.56 standard deviation. We find the standard error of such a difference to be 0.37, then the obtained difference of 1.56. Standard deviations of the distributions is actually 1.56 over 0.37, or 4.22 standard deviations of such a difference. Table 133 is displayed on the page, main scores for tests and age groups as indicated. Hence the probability of this difference being as small as 0 is 0 0.00003. This method of reasoning may be applied to any of the differences encountered in such a profile. If it were applied to all of the differences, in each of the 550 profiles. It would fill 550 tables, each having 105 entries. For this obviously too cumbersome procedure, we may substitute rough approximate mental calculations in our scrutiny of the profiles and more precise calculations when we wish to study one case intensively or many cases as a composite profile. An example of the quick examination is furnished by attempts to discover the valid differences in figure 15. AK appears to be more proficient in reading than he is in arithmetic. His score in reading total is about 1 and one third standard deviation above his score in arithmetic total. The standard error of this difference is 0.35. Hence the difference is 3 or 4 standard errors, which is enough to warrant its validity. With standard errors in the neighbourhood of 0.4 for differences between the three reading tests and differences in the profile of less than 0.3, said scores, we may conclude that AK's abilities are very even in word meaning, sentence meaning, and paragraph meaning. Table 134 is displayed on the page. Reliability coefficients for age groups and tests as indicated. 
achievement levels and intelligence levels. The main educational quotient for the main group of 643 gifted children was found to be about 140, and the mean IQ about 150. This difference between the achievement level and the intelligence level of gifted children is very significant if it be a true difference. The method described in the preceding section may be applied here to test this difference. The procedure is simple. The difference between the standard score for an achievement test and the standard score for the Stanford Binet test is expressed as positive when the Stanford Binet score is higher and negative when the Stanford Binet score is lower than the achievement score. These differences were calculated for all of the gifted subjects. Each difference was then divided by the standard error of that difference d over sigma d infinity 10 and the results tabulated by age groups. The means of these results are given in Table 135. Table 135 is displayed on the page Probability of Differences Between the Stanford Binet Scores and the Scores of the Several Achievement Tests Expressed. The data of Table 135 agree in general with the results of the use of the educational quotients in their indication that the intelligence level of the gifted children is higher than their achievement level. There are 77 differences in the table if we meet the differences involving total scores. Of these, 73 are negative and greater than one standard deviation of such a difference. We may make a more exact comparison. Since the educational quotient was found to be about 140 and the IQ about 150, it may be stated that the achievement level of the gifted children is 40% above that expected for their chronological ages and approximately 10% below that expected for their intelligence level. We find the mean of all the standard Binet's standard scores is 3.98, and the mean for the achievement test standard scores is 2.47. The score of 2.47 is 62% of the 3.98, which is a difference between the intelligence level of unselected children and the intelligence level of gifted children, as expressed in terms of standard scores. The difference between the mean EQ and the attained EQ is 40, which is 80% of the difference between the intelligence levels of unselected children and of gifted children expressed in terms of quotients. On the basis of EQ, the gifted children are achieving 80% of the excess achievement which their intelligence would warrant. On the basis of stand scores, 62%. While the gifted children have an achievement level well above that of other children, is nevertheless so much below their level of intelligence as to make the condition a definite challenge of both the parent and the teacher. By use of the standard error, we can give additional confirmation of the results just described. Again, weighting all the tests equally, we find the mean reliability coefficient to be 0.829. This reliability coefficient makes possible the calculation of the standard error of the difference sigma d infinity 10, which is 0.5848z. Hence, the probable verity of the difference 1.51z is 1.51 over 0.5848 or 3.18 sigma d infinity 10. And the chance of difference between the achievement level and the intelligence level being as small as 0 are not over 0 0.0007. It might be asserted that these gifted children represent a highly selected group whose standard binet scores are spuriously high. That is, by the method of selection, those who accidentally made low standard Binet scores were ejected, and those whose intelligence is actually lower than the standard Binet scores indicate secured higher scores because of the less than perfect reliability of the Stanford Binet test. The correlation which would apply to these scores would then be x infinity equals r11 x1 plus 1 minus r11. M, in which x infinity is a true score, r11 the reliability coefficient, x1 the obtained score, and m the mean of the obtained distribution. But when the reliability coefficient is 0 0.90 or more, the correction is negligible. Hence, if we assume that each gifted child is a part of a distribution of the age group, these corrections would all be too small to change our conclusions. As reliability coefficients for the standard Binet for age groups, are all in the neighbourhood of 90 or better. But it might be assumed that the gifted children are to be treated as separate distributions selected by means of the standard Binet test. 
In this case, the correction would be in the direction of the means of the age groups of the gifted children, and the reliability coefficients for such groups would be used. The mean mental age of the age groups of gifted children are age group 7, MA 11.10, age group 8, 13.02, 9, 14.36, 10, 15.57, 11, 16.92, 12, 17.62, 13, 18.58. We have no reliability coefficients for the MA distributions of children. It is very possible that a group whose MA scores were between 13, 0 and 1311 would yield a much lower reliability coefficient than the R equals 0.905, which is found for the chronological age distribution 13, 0 to 1311, with a normal distribution of IQs. If the reliability of MA groups were the same as the reliability of chronological age groups, then we know the correlations would be of no significance. But zero is a theoretical limit of a reliability coefficient. Assuming that the reliability coefficients of the MA groups were all as low as zero, the mental age scores would be, when corrected, as low as the means of their respective mental age groups. It would then be logical to compare the mean standard scores for the standard binet of each age group with the mean standard scores of the other tests. But it was by this comparison that we concluded that the intelligence level of the gifted children is 1.51 standard scores above the achievement level. Two facts stand out in this study. One, that any adequate conception of the surface of the abilities of these gifted children can be gained only by the most careful scrutiny of the profile charts of individual children. Two, that the gifted children have an intelligence level which is considerably above their achievement level. Case Studies The following case studies are not complete pictures of the characteristics of the children studied. They do not utilise all of the data available. They are presented merely to indicate the possibilities of this method and to show certain interesting and valuable facts. The nine cases presented here are totally inadequate to represent the great variety of profiles which were found in the whole survey. More than 500 of these profiles were drawn and studied. These are on file with the library and with the Department of Psychology at Stanford University. The cases given here represent a number of age groups and in part are examples of rather extreme specialization in some one ability. Wherever possible, data from parents and teachers were examined to corroborate or qualify the findings of the tests and the treatment of the scores. HMJ, figure 16, who was 6 years, 9 months old, when he scored MA13 on the Stanford Binet, thus making an IQ of 192, had the highest IQ in the 6-year group. This was just a little lower than the highest IQ found in the group of 643 children. Because of the small number of 6-year-old children who can make scores on the Stanford Achievement Tests, there are no valid means and standard deviations available. Hence, the seven-year profile chart is used. Although not seven years old, HMJ is in the high third grade. Her arithmetic reasoning standard score is the highest of her achievement scores, and that in music and art information standard score the lowest. The difference between her arithmetic reasoning score and her reading total score is 2.06 Z scores. The standard deviation of this difference, sigma d infinity 10 from table 132 is 0.46. Then the difference is 4.48 standard deviations. HMJ's abilities in arithmetic reasoning, in word meaning and in paragraph meaning are unusual. Her spelling and computation are on about the same level in the middle range of her abilities. History and civics and music and art information are low. For so young a child, with so brief a school experience, this amount of unevenness is significant and suggests real innate differences. Figure 16 is displayed on the page, Profile of HMJ. The evidence from the profile which points towards specialised abilities in arithmetic and reading are supported by the parents' account of the early childhood of HMJ. She learned to read when three years old. Before she was six years old, her father states that she carried the power of two mentally up to the 20th power. 1,048,576, as a Sunday afternoon pastime. He thinks she could have carried this farther, but he feared the practice would tire her. She would count to 100 when three years old. Figure 17 is displayed on the page, profile of NM. 
N.M., figure 17, was 7 years 11 months old when he scored an IQ of 173, which is the highest score in the 7-year-old group. Like the preceding case, N.M. is a reasoner. His score of arithmetic reasoning is phenomenally high. His teacher also reports that he is superior in arithmetic. She makes the same estimate of his reading ability, but his arithmetic total score is 3.11 standard scores, or 7.58 standard deviations above his reading total score. This difference is substantial. N.M.'s teacher ranks him only a little below average in composition. His profile indicates that his language usage score is very low as compared with the other scores. It is 1.89 standard errors below his reading total score, and 8.44 standard errors below his arithmetic total scores. Other low points in his profile are spelling, sentence meaning, and music and art information. The unevenness of the paragraph meaning, science information, and language and literature information is conspicuous. Spelling and computation differ 1 Z score or a little over 2 standard errors. This boy, not yet 8 years old, and in the 3rd grade, shows a degree of unevenness greater than we can account for by the training he has received in his brief school experience. The parents report no home tutoring other than the usual incidental instruction. The differences in ability in this boy's case seem to be, to a large extent, due to native endowment. SMF, figure 18, was 9 years and 6 months old when she met an IQ of 189, the highest for her age group. Her profile is characterised by more than usual evenness among the achievement scores, and a very unusual difference between the achievement and MA levels. The greatest difference in a profile, that between language and literature information and paragraph meaning, is so situated as to be rather noticeable. This difference is 2.33 standard scores, or 3.88 standard deviations of this difference. On the other hand, the language and literature information and the history and civics information are close together, the difference being but 0.36 standard scores. The standard deviation of this difference is but 0.4, that is, SMF, shows the greatest abilities in these two information tests. With an IQ of 189, her reading quotient is 163, and her arithmetic quotient is 151. In terms of standard scores, her achievement scores are all more than two standard deviations above her age expectancy. Hence, although her mental level is far above her achievement level, her achievement level is conspicuously above that of children of her age. The zigzag contour of this profile suggests that the abilities measured have not developed evenly. The following differences with the standard areas confirm this assumption. The table is displayed on the page, listing spelling, language usage, sentence meaning and literature information, language and literature information, language and literature information, sentence meaning. Figure 18 is displayed on the page, profile of SMF. These are but a small sampling of the measurable differences shown in figure 18. SD's quotient of 175, figure 19, is the highest IQ of the 10-year-old group of gifted children. Only in the case of the score in computation does her achievement score fall below the level of two standard scores above the mean for 10-year-old children. As might be expected from her high IQ, her intelligence level is markedly above her achievement level. Figure 19 is displayed on the page, profile of SD. Her scores are quite even in the reading tests. The arithmetic scores and the spelling score are not very uneven, nor do they differ very much from the reading scores. The largest difference in this group of scores is that between sentence meaning and computation, which is 1.24 standard scores, or 2 by 7 times the standard deviation of this difference. This is a real difference. The scores in language and literature, 4.41, in history and civics, 3.45, and in science information, 3.50, stand out decisively above the level of the other achievement group, arithmetic reading and spelling. The parents and teacher of this child reported to be very superior in music. The music and art information test does not reveal a superiority over the other abilities measured, although it does rate her 2.69 standard deviations above the mean for children of her age. In addition to earning the highest IQ made by the 11-year-old gifted children, AA, figure 20, made the highest possible score in the spelling dictation test. Her score in history and civics information is 86 out of a possible 90. 
In music and art information, it is 42 out of possible 45. In language usage, it is 54 out of possible 60. In these tests, it is probable that her ability has not been fully measured. AA's profile shows a real superiority in the ability measured by the music and art information test. This is shown by the differences found when the score on the test is compared with the reading total and arithmetic total. These differences are as follows. Music and art score is 1.74 Z scores or 2.95 standard deviations higher than the reading total and 2.27 Z scores or 3.66 standard deviations higher than the arithmetic total. Both the mother and her teacher report AA as superior in musical ability and the girl self-reports that she likes music very much. She plays the cello. AA's teacher also reports her mental abilities as very even, although we find substantial unevenness in her profile. For example, in addition to those just given, there is a difference between arithmetic reasoning and paragraph meaning of 1.98 set scores, or 4.3 standard deviations. The probability of this difference not existing may be expressed as 0. 0.00002. The differences between arithmetic reasoning and language usage and between word meaning and sentence meaning are also substantial. If the teacher were comparing AA with other children, the unevenness of her abilities might not be prominent, but in the abilities measured by these tests, her abilities are far from even. Evidence of unevenness not measured is found in her statements that she dislikes very much freehand drawing, painting, folk dancing, manual training, and mechanical drawing. Her teacher rates her as below average in penmanship and manual training. Figure 20 is displayed on the page. Profile of AA. AA says she rather dislikes spelling, but finds it the easiest subject. As she made the highest possible score in this test, it is probable that she has an ability in spelling not shown by the profile chart. GF, Figure 21, has the highest IQ found in the 12-year-old group. Her profile is more even than those for the younger age groups partially because the scores are nearing the upper limits of the test, and partially because the standard deviations are larger for these older children. On the other hand, the standard errors of the type sigma d infinity 10 are smaller for the 13-year-olds than for the younger age groups. Figure 21 is displayed on the page, Profile of GF. The difference between her arithmetic reasoning and science information scores is 1.5. 5.4 set scores and 3.42 standard deviation. The difference between language and literature information and science information is 1.3 set scores or 2.95 standard deviation. These differences are substantial and indicate a specialization in arithmetic reasoning and in language and literature information. Accompanying this superior ability in language and literature information, there is a very superior ability in reading for the paragraph meaning score is a maximum and the reading total score is very near the maximum for the tests. Her teacher rates her as superior, or very superior, in all of the school subjects. With this rating, with an achievement level so high, and with an MA score of 18.11, one cannot wonder why GF should be in the lower 8th grade. Figure 22 is displayed on the page, Profile of ZJ. ZJ's profile, Figure 22, shows unusual specialization in the information scores. His score in music and art information stands out above all the other scores. His father plays, sings, and draws. His home influence is doubtless reflected in the high score. ZJ finds drawing the easiest of all his studies. He thinks he will be an architect, but may decide to be an advertiser, decorator, cartoonist, magazine illustrator, artist, painter of pictures, landscape artist, civil engineer, chemist, zoologist, etc., all of which supports the events of this profile chart. Figure 23 is displayed on the page, Profile of DER. This little girl, Figure 23, shows prominent specialization in science information and in language and literature information. Her ability in reading is well above the main ability for her age and grade. Her reading scores are substantially higher than her scores in arithmetic computation, arithmetic reasoning and spelling. There is a marked superiority of her abilities in language usage and reading when they are compared with her abilities in arithmetic. The reports of her teacher and of her parents 
both indicate an ability in arithmetic much lower than the abilities in other school subjects. Figure 24 is displayed on the page, Profile of JD. Her superior score in science formation is doubtless due to her early and persistent interest in birds, animals, flowers, and the out of doors. Her interest in literature and her reading scores are due in part to her early training. She learned to read before going to school. Her parents report some early instruction in reading, and rather more than the usual amount of time spent in reading to her. J.D., this boy, like D.E.R., has a low level of performance arithmetic. The arithmetic total score is 1.98 standard deviations below his reading total score. The standard error for this difference is 0.35. Hence, the difference is equal to 5.54 standard deviations. The difference between the arithmetic total and the information total is even greater. If all of the 105 differences were calculated for this profile, they would furnish convincing evidence of the unevenness of the abilities as measured. This profile of JD reveals two levels of scores. Spelling, computation, and arithmetic reasoning are on one level, which is a lower level, ranging from 0.75 set scores to 1.5 set scores. The three reading scores and the language user scores are between two and three standard scores above the means, making a second level. Then ranging above these levels is a series of steps ascending from science information, 3.02, to language and literature information, 3.49, to Stanford Binet, 4.73, to history and civics information, 5.53, and to music and art information, 6.4. Summary and conclusions. The following statements are the outcome of the investigations described in the preceding pages. 1. The accumulation of improved instruments for the measurement of human traits and the refinement of statistical procedure make possible a new attack on the problem of the differences between traits resident in an individual. 2. Both the gifted children and the unselected children who were investigated show such real and varied differences between their abilities in school subjects as to warrant the statement that each child must be regarded as a unique individual with specific mental mechanisms. 3. When a gifted group is compared with various sample groups of normal children, no large differences in the inequalities of their levels of achievement are discoverable. The gifted children have unevenness of the surfaces of their abilities on a very much higher level than other children. The differences in unevenness from child to child are far more significant than the difference between the central tendencies of unevenness of any two groups. 4. The best conception of the unevenness of the abilities of a child is secured by the careful examination of the array of standard scores made by that child. This examination is made much more significant if the observer uses the standard deviations of the differences between stand scores, sigma d infinity 10. 5. The gifted children selected for case studies show several examples of definite specialization. They strongly suggest that the extension of this method by the use of other tests of other abilities will furnish invaluable assistance in vocational and educational guidance. 6. There is a significant lack of parallelism in the development of abilities to deal with school subjects. This unevenness of development in the cases of the younger children indicates differences which are too great to be accounted for by the differences in training. Though the development of some of the mental abilities must be greatly facilitated by innate factors. 7. The scores in arithmetic reasoning, arithmetic computation, and spelling dictation are conspicuous in their ability to preserve their independence from other test scores. 8. It is definitely established that the intelligence level of the gifted children is higher than the level of their achievement scores. The use of the quotients, the use of standard scores, and the use of the standard errors, sigma d infinity 10, all agree on this point. The quotient method and the method of standard scores are in fair agreement in gauging the relation between the intelligence and the achievement levels. If the altitude of the intelligence level above the age norm is the base, the altitude of the achievement level above its age norm is found to be 62% by use of the stand scores and 80% by use of the educational quotients. 9. The abilities in the school subjects measured 
are more responsive to the influence of a general ability as measured by the Stanford Bennett scale than they are responsive to any specialized ability measured at present. End of section 13. Section 14 of Genetic Studies of Genius. Volume 1. Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 3. Scholastic, Occupational and Other Interests. A four-page interest blank, eight and a half by eleven inches, was filled out by the children of all the gifted groups and by control group A. The first page called for readings on the different school subjects according to preference and ease. The second page contained a list of 125 occupations to be checked so as to indicate vocational preference. The third and fourth pages were devoted to data on reading interests, collections, interest in various kinds of activities, and records of accomplishments and of officers and honours held. This chapter will summarise for the main gifted group and for the control group the data on scholastic interests, occupational interests, collections, and interests in activities. Scholastic Interests Ratings of the various school subjects according to preference were obtained from the gifted and control groups according to the instructions printed here in reduced type. A small form is reproduced in the text. First, draw a line right through each subject you have never studied. 1. Next, draw a figure 1 on the dotted line before each subject that you like very much. 2. Put a 2 before each subject that you like fairly well. 3. Put a 3 before each subject that you neither like nor dislike. 4. Put a 4 before each subject that you rather dislike. 5. Put a 5 before each subject that you dislike very much. Now put one cross like this before each subject that is very easy for you. Put two crosses before one subject that is the easiest of all. The subjects are categorised on the page with art, foreign language, practical subjects, history, English, mathematics, physical education and science. As many of the subjects had not been studied by all the children, the number at a given age who read it as subject was often small. Ages 11, 12 and 13 had therefore been combined. Ages below 11 are omitted from the following tables because of the frequency with which the younger children of the control group were unable to understand and carry out the instructions. Table 136 gives the means and the distributions of ratings by subject for the gifted and control of ages 11, 12 and 13. The numbers were as follows. A small table is displayed on the page comparing boys and girls with gifted and control groups. Table 136 is displayed on the following pages, school subject interests of gifted and control groups. Table 137 gives the ranks of the school subjects for gifted and control groups. For each sex, the order shows the relative of the absolute degree of preference according to intelligence. The subjects at the top being relatively most liked by the gifted, those at the bottom by the control. An examination of this table will show how the subjects relatively more liked by the gifted are those demanding the largest amount of abstract thinking, and that those relatively more liked by the control are those demanding the least. However, certain subjects are found in an unexpected position. For example, arithmetic, general science, and spelling are relatively more liked by control than gifted girls. To a less extent, this also holds true for grammar. Cooking and games and sports are slightly more liked by gifted girls. Turning to the boys, geography, physiology and hygiene, and general science are relatively more liked by the control, and composition slightly more. Reading and arithmetic are only slightly better liked by the gifted, while grammar, games and sports, United States history and shop work do not differentiate between the groups. Table 137 is displayed on the following page. Rank of school subjects according to preference. Table 137 yields the following rank order correlations. As another small table split on the page comparing gifted boys and gifted girls versus the control group. That is, gifted boys and control boys show fairly close agreement, 0.717, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0.718, 0
while gifted girls show very little agreement with either sex of the control group. On the other hand, gifted girls show considerable agreement with gifted boys. 0.593. On page 261, we are given the rank orders of the school subjects based on teachers' ratings on quality of school work the children are doing. These rank orders for quality of work have been correlated with the rank orders for preference given in Table 137. The correlations are as follows. Small tables split on the page, displaying the correlations for gift boys and girls and the control boys and girls. Table 138 gives for each group the percent of those rating a subject who rated it above 3, indicated positive liking, and the percent who rated it below 3, indicating positive dislike. It will be seen that in the case of both gifted girls and control girls, every subject is more liked than disliked. Gifted boys, however, dislike penmanship and folk dancing more than they like them, and control boys have more dislike than liking full dramatics. This table is not as significant as it might be, for the reason that some groups tend, on the whole, to give higher ratings than other groups. In some respects, it is more important to know, for a given group, which subjects have higher percents of one or two ratings than the average subject for that group and which have higher percents of 5 and 6 ratings. This would tell us which subjects the group likes more than it likes the average school subject, and which it dislikes more than the average. Subjects more liked by a group than the average subject may be classed as positive, P for that group, the disliked more as negative, N. Those both liked an average amount and disliked an average amount, indifferent, I. Those both liked and disliked more than average. Bipolar, B. Table 139 gives this classification of the subjects based on the above figures. Table 138 is displayed on the page, percent of ratings indicating positive liking and positive dislike. Table 139 is displayed on the page, classification of the school subjects according to preference. It will be recalled that each child was asked to mark with a cross each subject that was very easy for him, and with two crosses the subject that was easiest of all. In summarising the responses, it has been necessary to disregard the distinction between single and double crosses, as the number of double crosses given any one subject by our 11, 12 and 13 year old groups was too small to justify separate treatment. Table 140 gives the percent of children of each sex and intelligence group who marked a subject with either one or two crosses. Table 140 is displayed on the page, presents marking each subject as easy. Table 141 gives, separately for sex and intelligence, the ranks of the school subjects according to the percent designating them as easy. The subjects at the top are those relatively easy for the gifted. Those at the bottom are relatively easiest for the control. In general, the abstract subjects are well toward the top, and the more practical subjects in the lower part of the lists. Surprisingly, however, short work is read relatively much easier by gifted than by control boys, and arithmetic somewhat easier by control than by gifted girls. Table 141 is displayed on the page, ranks of the school subjects according to ease. Table 141 yields the following rank order correlations with respect to ease. A small table is split on the page, comparing the gifted boys versus control boys, and the same for gifted girls and control girls. The statistical correlation. The closest agreement, 0.697, is between gifted boys and gifted girls. Between gifted and control boys, the correlation is only 0.371. Between gifted and control girls, it is too low to be significant, 0.09. The rank orders for the preferred and easy subjects. Tables 139 and 141 give the following correlations. A small table is played on the page comparing the gifted boys and gifted girls with the controls and the row correlation. Occupational interests. A statistical summary of the occupational interests expressed by a group of children still in the pre-high school grades can have, of course, only a suggestive value. Perhaps no other kind of interest is so likely to change. In voicing such preferences, the young child is doubly handicapped. 
He has little understanding of himself, and his knowledge about many occupations is exceedingly vague or inaccurate. Nevertheless, even though the preference expressed by our gifted children may express only ephemeral interests, they were deemed as necessary part of our records. They at least represent in each case a cross-section view of the child's interests, and their real value can only be appraised when the children have become men and women and have chosen their careers. The interest blank, page 374, called for information on occupational interests. The list of 125 occupations was increased to 164 by additions which the children themselves made. These have been classified under 12 heads, as indicated in Table 142, which gives the percent of boys and girls in each group, naming each occupation. The first four columns give the percents for occupations the children say they are most likely to follow, and the last four columns those they may possibly decide to follow. The interest blank is displayed on the page with a list of occupations. Front title, put one cross before each occupation you may possibly decide to follow. Put two crosses before the one occupation you are most likely to choose. If the occupation you would like best is not given above, write it here. If you are a girl, do you prefer the duties of housewife to any other occupation? Table 142 is displayed on the page. Percent of gifted and control groups choosing various types of occupations. The gifted show greater preference for the following occupations. Public service, professional, boys. Artistic, semi-professional. And agriculture, slightly. The control group expressed greater preference for the following. Mechanical, etc., transportation, athletic, and clerical. The group show little difference in preference for commercial occupations and social work. There are more first choices for domestic and personal service, including secretarial work by the gifted, but more second choices by the control group. Table 143 gives the main bar scale ratings of first choice and second choice occupations for each group by age and sex. See page 66 FF for description of the bar scale of rating occupations according to their estimated demands upon intelligence. As there were ordinarily several second choices for a gifted child, these were averaged to give a single bar rating for occupations considered as possibilities. Table 143 displayed on the page, main bar scale ratings of preferred occupations. Both groups display a good deal of ambition in their occupational preferences but the average bar rating of the occupations chosen by the gifted runs higher than that for the control by roughly 1.5, the standard deviation of the former. The average gifted boy is looking to an occupation which presents about the intellectual difficulties of high school teaching, preaching, or industrial chemistry. The average control boy to an occupation about as intellectual as the work of a nurse, chef, or landscape gardener. The occupations followed by the fathers of the gifted have an average bar rating of 12.77, as compared with 8.8 .8 for average adult males in these cities. In the gifted group, there is less distance between the occupational ambitions of child and occupational status of father than in the case of the control group. The occupational ambitions of the control group tend to be, intelligence considered, more extravagant than those of the gifted. The only significant sex difference is that the occupational choices of gifted boys rate somewhat higher than those of gifted girls. The total number of occupations marked by each child was tabulated by age, sex and intelligence. As will be seen from Table 144, no significant difference was found between the gifted and control groups. Boys of both groups mark about 25% more occupations than girls mark, and for both sexes and both intelligence groups, the number marked at age 13 is less than in earlier years. Table 144 is displayed on the page. Number of occupations preferred. Preference of various types of activity. One item in the interest blank was as follows. 5. Below are several different kinds of things to do. On the line before each thing, put a figure 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5 to show how well you like to do that kind of thing. Put a 1 if you like it very much, put a 2 if you like it fairly well, put a 3 if you neither like it nor dislike it, put a 4 if you rather dislike it, 
but of five you dislike it very much. Studying your lessons, general reading, books, magazines, newspapers, practicing music, drawing, dancing, etc. Playing games that require little physical exercise, playing games that require lots of exercise, playing with several other persons, playing with one other person, playing alone, going to parties, picnics, dances, club meetings, etc. Using tools of working with apparatus and machinery, sewing, cooking, knitting, housework, etc. Being leader in a team or club and managing other persons. The ratings were made by the child during school hours and with no suggestions from anyone. They may fairly safely be taken to represent, in each case, the child's attitude at the time the blank was filled out. The ratings were distributed separately by age for the boys and girls of both gifted and control groups. As the age difference proved to be relatively small, the ages are being combined for each group. Table 1 to 45 gives the mean ratings for each type of activity. The figures are for ages 8 to 13 only, as there were no controlled children younger than 8 or gifted children older than 13. Table 145 is displayed on the page. Mean preference ratings of various activities by gifted and controlled children. 1 is high and 5 is low. It will be seen that the gifted children rate most of these activities higher than do the control. They seem to have a little more enthusiasm about things in general. The control rate activity appreciably higher than the gifted rated, but the gifted rate reading and playing with one other person lower than do the control. The other activities are about equally liked by the two groups. The evidence of Table 145 suggests rather convincingly that the interests of gifted children are in these respects quite normal. The typical gifted child likes vigorous games, plays with tools and apparatus, likes the companionship of others, and shows no abnormal fondness for solitude or study. The rank orders of the activities for gifted and controlled boys give a correlation of 0.87, those for gifted and controlled girls 0.86. Comparing girls with boys, we find that girls' ratings tend to run a little higher than those of boys. They especially rate practicing music, drawing and dancing, going to parties and picnics, and sewing, cooking, etc. higher than do boys. Reading and playing with one other person are also liked somewhat better than girls. Only one activity is rated higher by boys, using tools, etc. Collections Statements of the Children In the interest blank, which was filled out by both gifted and control groups, the following question was asked. Name all the collections you have made. Tell how old you were when you made the collection and tell how large it was. Then followed space for recording eight collections. The main number of collections made is shown in Table 146 for age, sex and intelligence groups. Table 146 is displayed on the page. Number of collections made. Testimony of the children. This table is based upon total number of collections made regardless of their nature. Table 147 shows that gifted children tend to make more collections of scientific value or interest. Collections of the following kinds were included in this category. Birds, birds' eggs, nests, feathers, etc., coins and money, flowers, grasses, leaves, etc., foreign articles, Chinese bronzes, flags, ancient weapons, rocks, stones, minerals, pebbles, agates, sand, shells, starfish, crabs, snails, insects of various sorts, stamps, electrical instruments, different kinds of woods. Table 147 is displayed on the page, Number who have made collections of scientific interest or value. The above table show that 1.74 times as many gifted as controlled children have made collections of some kind, but that 2.07 times as many gifted as control have made collections of scientific nature. Statements of the parents. In the home blank, parents were asked to name the collections the child had made, to indicate from what age to what age it was in progress, and to state whether it was large, medium, or small. Data for gifted are only available from the home blank. Replies were received for 603 cases of the main group, 330 boys, and 273 girls. Failure to reply was counted as meaning that no collection has been made. The results are shown in Table 148. Table 148 is displayed on the page, collections named by parents, and age at which they were begun. 
Attention is called to the fact that the ages of the 603 subjects entering into Table 148 range from 3 to 13 years at the time the data were collected. Had all the subjects been 12 years old, say, the figures in the total columns would have been much higher, as it had been found that the collecting interest does not normally reach its maximum before 10 or 11. Even so, the boys have averaged more than one collection each. The sex differences are much as might be expected. Boys more often than girls collect stamps, coins, marbles, labels, coupons, shells, insects, etc. Girls more often than boys collect flowers, dolls, and samples. The following numbers of gifted children, according to the statements of parents, have made more than one collection. A table is displayed on the page, comparing the percentages of boys and girls, to total who have made collections, made two or more, three, four or five. In general, the statements of the parents agree fairly well with those of the children themselves. Boys, however, report a good many more collections than parents report for them. The parent is probably more likely to forget a given collection or to consider it too trivial to mention. Summary 1. With certain exceptions, gifted children are more interested than unselected children in school subjects which are abstract and less interested in the practical subjects. Their interest is relatively much stronger, for example, in such subjects as literature and dramatics, and much weaker in penmanship, manual training, sewing, etc. However, the gifted and controlled children express about the same degree of preference for games and sports, also for grammar. 2. The subject preferences of gifted boys resemble those of control boys far more than the preferences of gifted girls resemble those of control girls. The preferences of gifted boys and gifted girls are more alike than those of control boys and control girls. 3. The average correlation of the gifted children's preferences and the teacher's estimates of the quality of the children's work in the different samples is 0.41. 4. For each sex and intelligence group, each school subject has been compared with the average of all the subjects with respect to the number 1 or 2 and 3 or 4 ratings it secured. This made possible a classification of the school subjects for each sex and intelligence group as positive, negative, indifferent or bipolar. 5. Subjects that are positive both with gifted boys and with gifted girls are dramatics, literature, reading, history, games and sports, and physical training. Subjects that are negative for both gifted groups are painting, grammar, penmanship, and physiology and hygiene. Civics or citizenship is the only subject that is indifferent to both groups. Bipolarity is rare with both gifted and control groups. 6. The gifted, far oftener than the control, rate as very easy, such subjects as literature, grammar, debating, and ancient history. The control, far oftener than the gifted, such subjects as sewing, drawing, painting, general science, singing, folk dancing, penmanship, etc. However, shop work is ranked much higher for ease by gifted boys than by controlled boys, and arithmetic somewhat higher by controlled girls than by gifted girls. 7. Gifted girls show a considerable resemblance to gifted boys in respect of subjects found easy. 0.70 but no significant resemblance to control girls. Point zero 0.09 The sex differences are much greater in the control than in the gifted group. 8. The average correlation between preference and ease is 0.59. 9. The occupations preferred by the gifted rate higher on the bar scale than those preferred by the control by about 1.5 the standard deviation on the latter. However, there is less distance between the mean occupational rating of parents and children in the case of the gifted than the case of the control group. 10. Of a variegated list of 12 kinds of activities rated by gifted and control groups, nearly all were rated higher by the gifted. Gifted children have more enthusiasms than average children, and their interests appear to be in general no less wholesome. 11. One and three quarters times as many gifted as controlled children have made collections, 
more than twice as many have made collections of scientific nature. End of section 14. Section 15 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1, Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children, by Lewis Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 14. Play Interests, Knowledge and Practice. Our data on play fall into two groups. 1. Results of a questionnaire test of interests in and knowledge of plays, games and amusements. 2. Replies to certain questions in the supplementary home blank and school blank relating to play and to associations with other children. On most points, comparative data was secured for a control group, as it was one of the main purpose of this section of the study to determine to what extent and in what respects the play life of gifted children deviates from the normal. The belief is generally entertained that the deviation is considerable, although no statistical evidence bearing on the question has ever been presented. The importance of the problem was thought to justify a considerable expenditure of time and effort in connection with the present investigation. Nature of the Test on Plays, Games and Amusements the purpose of this test was to secure more accurate information about a child's play practice, play interest, and play knowledge than could be secured by ordinary questioning. Play knowledge, of course, readily lends itself to measurement by the usual type of information test, but reliable data on play practice and play interests are much more difficult to secure. There are several possible methods of approach and it is to be regretted that there was no time for a comparative tryout of a number of the most promising. Instead, it was necessary to arrange a method for immediate use with but little of the preliminary experimental work, which is so necessary for thoroughly satisfactory results in the field of test making. The test was prepared in August and September 1921 by the writer, assisted by Mr. Rook, Miss Marshall and Miss Goodnow. First, the most important statistical studies of children's play activities were reviewed in order to select those upon which to base questions. Children in the Palo Alto schools were questioned as to the games they played, and numerous adults prepared lists of well-remembered games, since it was not possible to use for this purpose more than a small fraction of the games which children play. The aim was to make a selection which would give a fair sampling of the most generally known games of all the leading types. Other considerations were, one, to avoid, so far as possible, games which are known by many different names, and two, to take account of sex and age differences in such a way that the test would be equally valid for boys and girls over a wide range of ages. Local and seasonal characters also had to be taken into account. Such studies are those of Croswell and McGee afforded valuable data on the familiarity of various games. Types of games to be considered included such categories as the quiet and the active, the social and the solitary, the competitive and the non-competitive, the intellectual and the non-intellectual, etc. Finally, a provisional list of about 150 games, plays and amusements was drawn up and arranged under the following three categories. 1. Games which are, in most cases, fairly active and usually or frequently performed alone. We may call this the active solitary case. Examples are spinning tops, riding a bicycle, rolling hoops, fishing and using tools. 2. Games which are social and usually but not always competitive. We may call this the social active class. Examples are playing tag, hide and seek, follow the leader, shinny, baseball, etc. 3. Games which are mildly social but relatively quiet, making less demand upon physical strength and skill than upon the powers of imagination or logical thought, such as playing school, dominoes, cards, charades, checkers, etc. The provisional list was submitted for criticism to a number of individuals, was then reduced to 120 and was then tried out on about a hundred children of grades 4, 6, and 8. 
On the basis of the data so collected, the list was reduced to 90. For use in the test, the players were listed in three columns corresponding to the types active solitary, active social, and social quiet. The words in each column are so arranged that there is an age progression from the top to the bottom, those near the top referring to activities which appeal to young children, and those near the bottom to the older. Although the older was based upon subjective judgments and is far from action, it was borne out in a general way by the data later collected from unselected children. The entire test is made up in an eight-page booklet, eight and a half by eleven, containing seven exercises. Three of these were devoted to the above-mentioned naughty games and amusements. The fourth called for testimony regarding experience and skills, and the last three constituted a test to play information. The material is reproduced in the following pages. A series of forms is displayed on the following pages with exercise one, exercise two, and exercise four. Most of the questions in exercise 4 relate to activities of the kind which normal, healthy-minded boys or girls are likely, under favourable circumstances, to have experience with whether they are very intelligent or not. If gifted children are typically bookish, non-active and non-social, they should be expected to make a low score on the test. The boy who scores high on it would be, presumably, the type one often hears described as real boy, healthy-minded, active and socially adaptable. It is, of course, not assumed that a test is an accurate measure of these traits, but is thought that it would at least give data of suggested value when a large gifted group was compared with a large control group. Exercises 5, 6 and 7 These are all of the ordinary type of information test with alternative response words, the correct words in each sentence to be underlined. The first series, 19 items, is designed to test chiefly knowledge regarding the solitary active plays listed under exercises 1, 2 and 3. The second series, 82 items, is a knowledge test regarding social active plays. The third series, 22 items, is a test of knowledge regarding the semi-social quiet plays. In all, there were 123 items. One purpose of exercise 5, 6 and 7 was to serve as a check upon the accuracy of responses in exercises 1, 2 and 3. Exercises 5, 6, and 7 are displayed in the following pages. The test was given to children in groups of 20 to 50. The rule for timing was to allow as nearly as possible all the children to complete each exercise, and in no case to proceed to another until at least 90% were through with the preceding one. Only a few children failed to complete all the tasks. As the test presupposed considerable literacy, it was not given to subjects below the third school grade. Even for the third and fourth grades, it is rather difficult reading. Groups tested. In all, about 1,200 gifted children were given the test. Of the 643 children of the main gifted group, 554 were tested. In addition, a control group was tested consisting of 474 unselected children of grades 3 to 9 in Sunnyvale, Mountain View, and San Jose, California. The first two cities have a population of less than 5,000, while San Jose has about 40,000. The schools chosen were known to be about average with respect to the intelligence and social status of the children. This group will be designated Control Group B. This chapter will be devoted entirely to the results for the main gifted group and for the control group. Table 149 gives the distribution of control and gifted groups by age and sex. It should be noted that the control group average is considerably older than the gifted group, a fact which needs to be taken into account in certain comparisons made further on. Table 149 is displayed on the page, Service Given Play Test. Derivation of the Preference Indices for the 90 Activities It will be recalled that exercises 1, 2 and 3 deal, respectively, with the knowledge of, interest in, and time devoted to the 90 different activities. The responses on these three exercises were tabulated and summarised by age and sex for the gifted and control groups. The original intention had been to work out age and sex tendencies for each of the three exercises, but this was not found to be feasible. 
After considerable experimentation, it was decided to combine the results of the three exercises for a single rating, as they are supplementary, rather than independent parts of the test. For example, with respect to play knowledge, one might have supposed that the extent of familiarity with the activities would be definitely affected by maturity, that the younger child would report but few plays as known, and that older children would add more and more. This was not the case. Instead of increasing with age, the plays marked as known tend to remain of about the same number, but they change their character almost entirely. Thus the younger children report knowledge of such activities as rolling hoops, playing London Bridge, playing with dolls, playing house and store, etc., while older children mark these plays very infrequently. Instead, they report activities common to older children, such as working with tools, playing baseball, tennis, authors, etc. This omission on the part of the older children robs exercise 1, report of play knowledge, of much of its significance. The children have tended to limit this part of their report to the same plays and activities that they mark under play interest and play practice, exercises 2 and 3. The result is that exercise 1 has little statistical value in its present form. It is probable, however, that it has a certain value as a practice exercise, introducing the subject to the method of rating, and equating him with the list of activities. Accordingly, exercise 1 was disregarded entirely in scoring, and the reports on exercises 2 and 3, play interest and play practice, were combined on the assumption that the composite score on the two exercises would give a better index of play preference than could be derived from either exercise taken by itself. Various methods of scoring exercises 2 and 3 were considered. The method finally adopted was as follows. A player marked with one cross was scored 1, one marked with two crosses 2, and, in exercise 3, one marked with three crosses 4. This weighting was based upon the relative frequency of responses by one cross, two crosses, and three crosses. The end to be attained was a preference rating for each of the 90 activities. First, the responses, single, double, and triple crosses, given by each subject in exercises 2 and 3, were transmuted into point scores by the weightings given above, and these were tabulated separately by activity for all the children of a given group, age and sex, e.g., 10-year-old gifted boys. Next, the total of the numerical scores received by a given activity from a given age and sex group was found and divided by the number of children in that group. To give a preference score of that activity for that group, the method may be illustrated by the use of the following hypothetical responses of five children, A, B, C, D, E, for five activities. A table is played on the page. Comparing activities of Snap the Whip, Tug of War, Roly Poly, Jump the Rope and Leapfrog with Exercise 2, Play Interest of a Child, Exercise 3, Play Interest Child, the total scores for the five subjects and total scores divided by five, equaling the preference index of activity. In this way, a preference index was computed for each of the 90 activities, separately for each age, each sex and each intelligence group, control and gifted. Also, a mean preference index for each activity was calculated for each sex of the control group as a whole, ages combined, and similarly for each sex of the gifted group, ages combined. Table 150 gives these preference indices for the 90 activities. It will be noted that each game has at each age a preference index for control boys, one for gifted boys, one for control girls, and one for gifted girls. The mean preference index for all the ages of a group are given in the last column. These are derived by averaging the age means of the older columns. The groups are designated as follows. CB equals control boys. GB equals gifted boys. CG equals control girls. GG equals gifted girls. Table 150 is displayed on the following page. Preference indices of 90 activities for gifted and controlled children. It was thought that a comparison of these preference indices for the gifted and control groups might show significant influence of the factor of intelligence in determining play interests. It is seen from Table 150, however, that these were determined chiefly by sex and age and only to a slight extent by intelligence. This is shown by the following correlations between the mean preference indices of the 90 games for the boys and girls of the two groups using the figures of the last column in Table 150. A small table is split on the page comparing the gifted boys and girls versus control boys and girls. 
and through the person R. That is, the correlation between two opposite sex groups is always low, even in the same intelligence class. That between two same-sex groups is always high, even if the intelligence class is different. These correlations offer no support to the popular belief that the gifted boy is effeminate in his play interests. In fact, the correlation between gifted boys and either gifted or control girls, 0 0.20 and 0.18, is lower than that between control boys and either of the feminine groups, 0.35 and 0.22. The preference indices of Table 150, although they make possible interesting sex comparisons, are not as they stand satisfactory preference indices of the various activities. To a degree, they are invalidated by the fact that the figures for the four groups, CB, GB, CG, and GG, are not directly comparable, since they are affected by the tendency of some of the groups to mark more or fewer activities than do other groups. This defect can be remedied by transmitting the raw preference indices of each group into X over sigma values. For example, the mean preference indices for the CB group last column in table 150 were distributed, the sigma was calculated, and each of the 90 indices was given its x over sigma value. This was done for each of the control groups, CB, GB, CG, and GG, giving four sets of x over sigma values as shown in table 151. Table 151 is displayed on the following pages. Preference indices of activities expressed in X over sigma values. The above figures are to be read as follows. First row of table. With the control boys, rolling hoop stands 0.28 of a sigma above the mean preference index of their 90 activities for that group. With the gifted boys, 0.29 sigma below the mean of the 90 activities for that group, etc. The figures of the four columns are now comparable and show such difference between gifted and control as the following. 1. As compared with the control boys, gifted boys show much greater preference for jack stores, coasting, hiking, dancing, swimming, rowing, croquet, wrestling, racing or jumping, handball, soccer, tennis, dominoes, crocodile, purchase, authors, guessing games, cards, checkers and chess, and much less preference for rolling hoops, walking on stilts, flying kites, riding bicycle, garden work, shooting, riding horseback, hunting, ring around the rosy, farmer in the dell, drop the handkerchief, catch a mouse, ante over, jump the rope, fox and geese, volleyball, basketball, and playing house. 2. As compared with the control girls, gifted girls show much greater preference for jackstones, skating, hiking, dancing, fishing, swimming, sewing, using tools, shinny, wrestling, dominoes, purchase, authors, guessing games, cards, puzzles and chess, and much less preference for walking on stilts, riding, bicycle, hunting, cooking, ring around the rosy, hopscotch, cat and mouse, ante over, dare base, fox and geese, baseball, racing with jumping, handball, volleyball, basketball and charades. The gifted and control girls differ from each other on much the same activities as do gifted and control boys, and the difference is usually in the same direction. Some of these differences may be due to the influence of the locality. It will be recorded that control group B is for the most part somewhat less urban than the gifted group. Again, some of the differences may be due to the influence of social status, the gifted on the whole coming from homes of superior education and culture. Other differences, however, are probably dependent upon intelligence. For example, the preference of the gifted for such games as cards, authors, puzzles, checkers, chess, etc. Masculinity indices of the 90 activities. By comparing the X over sigma preference indices of control boys with those of control girls in columns 1 and 3 of table 151, it is possible to compute a normal masculinity index for each activity. The first step in this was to find for each activity the algebraic difference between the values in column 1 and column 3, control group, for each of the 90 activities. Next, these differences were distributed, the sigma computed, and the x over sigma difference found for each of the 90 activities. These are the masculinity and disease sort. This method gave plus x over sigma values for the activities much preferred by the boys than by girls and minus values for activities more preferred by girls. 
To avoid the use of negative quantities, equivalent numerical indices were computed on a scale of 1 to 25, with 13 corresponding to zero figures of x over sigma, 1 being the lowest negative value of x over sigma, and 25 the highest positive value. This gave the masculine indices of table 152. From table 152, the order of the activities from most to least masculine is found to be as follows. A list is displayed on the page displaying activities. Table 152 is displayed on the following page. Masculinity indices of 90 activities based on sex differences found in the control group. Masculinity ratings of the children. The masculinity indices of the activities were not derived primarily for the purpose of comparing the activities themselves, but to serve as a basis of masculinity ratings of the individual children. It is obvious that when the activities have been rated for masculinity, it will be possible so to rate the child on the basis of the activity preferences which he expresses. The method of accomplishing this may be illustrated by the following actual response of a child. Tables displayed on the page listing activities compared to exercises and the total score point value or responsive exercises and the masculinity index of activity and the masculinity score of the responses for each activity. A masculinity rating was computed for each child of the gifted or control groups. The distribution of these ratings, with means and standard deviations, are given in tables 153 and 154. Table 153 is displayed on the following page, masculinity ratings of control and gifted boys by age. Table 153b is displayed on the following page, masculinity ratings of control and gifted girls by age. Table 154 is displayed on the following page, significance of the masculinity differences found in tables 152 and 153. It will be seen that the difference is as great as twice the sigma of the difference only at the following ages. For boys at 8 and 11, for girls at 11 and 12. Figure 25 gives the age curves for mean masculinity ratings of gifted and controlled groups by sex. It will be recalled that in the establishment of the masculinity index, 13 was a value arbitrarily assigned to the game of neutral masculinity, with a range of from 1 to 25. This fact must be kept in mind in the interpretation of tables 152 and 153 and figure 25. A comparison of the curve for gifted boys with that for control boys confirms the conclusions on page 404 regarding the normal masculinity of the bright boy. The main masculinity index of gifted boys is definitely higher than that of control boys at each age until 13, where it is practically the same as for the control boys. In the case of gifted girls, the curve is somewhat irregular, but its general tendency is to run as high as that for the control girls. One striking fact about the curves of mean masculinity ratings of the control curls is a noticeable falling off in masculinity which occurs after the age of 14. The gifted girls show a slight tendency in this direction after age 12. Table 155 gives a proportion of gifted at each age in various percentile ranges of the control group. Maturity indices or activities. From Table 150, showing the amount of preference expressed by the controlled children of each age for each activity. It is possible to compute for each activity a maturity index. First, for a given activity, curves were plotted for the control boys and control girls, showing for each sex the amount of increase or decrease of preference by age. Figure 25 is displayed on the page, mean masculinity ratings by age, gifted and control groups. By means of mechanical smoothings, the tendency of a curve was then expressed in a straight line. The significance factor is the size of the angle, positive or negative, included between this line and a horizontal line projected from its point of departure. An activity showing decreasing popularity with age would give an angle in the fourth quadrant, a negative angle, one showing increasing popularity with age, an angle in the first quadrant, or positive angle. Table 155 is displayed on the following page. Percent of masculinity ratings of gifted in various percentile ranges of control group. Since the size of the angle is affected by the scale on which the curve is plotted, the tangents of the angles have been compared instead of the angles themselves. 
Finally, all tangents were expressed as multiples of the tangent of an angle of 6 degrees, which is approximately an even decimal. Thus, the ratio of a given angle's tangent to the tangent of an angle of 6 degrees becomes the maturity index of that activity. These ratios ranged from plus 5.95 for bicycle riding control boys, showing a very rapid increase of interest with age, to minus 11.34 for doll play, gifted girls, showing a very rapid decrease of interest. Table 156 gives the maturity indices of all the activities by age, sex, and intelligence. Table 156 displayed on the page. Maturity indices are activities in terms of tangent over tangent less than 6 degrees. As for maturity ratings have been computed for each activity, CB, CG, CB, GG, it was possible to secure the following intercorrelations. A small table split on the page, maturity indices based on the control and gifted girls and boys, compared to Pearson R. These intercorrelations run much as one might expect, except for the lower correlation, 0.56, between the control and gifted boys, as compared with a high correlation, 0.91, between control and gifted girls. The norms of maturity indices must, of course, be based upon the control group. In order to have such norms in a form convenient for use, the maturity indices of table 156 were transmitted into equivalent numerical indices ranging from 1 to 125 by the use of x over sigma values, as was done in deriving the masculinity indices. Table 157 displayed on the previous page, maturity indices of activities control group. These are given in table 157. In this table, 13 means that the general trend of the curve is toward neither greater nor less preference with increasing age. Indices above 13 mean that the preference increases with age. Indices below 13 that it decreases with age. Maturity ratings of children. The main purpose of the maturity indices of the activities was to serve as a basis for deriving maturity ratings of the individual children with respect to their play interests. The method of securing these ratings was exactly the same as that used in securing masculinity ratings of the children. The distributions, means and standard deviations of the maturity ratings of the children are shown in tables 158 and 159. The extent to which the means in tables 158 and 159 show significant differences in the maturity ratings of the control and gifted groups may be seen in Table 160. The differences may be regarded as significant for the boys at all ages except 13 and for the girls at all ages except 8 and 9. Figure 26 shows the main maturity ratings of the gifted and control groups separately by sex. It will be noted that both gifted boys and gifted girls are considerably more mature in their play interests than are the control groups of corresponding age. Table 161 shows the percent of gifted children in various percentile ranges of the control group of corresponding sex. It will be noted that a much larger proportion of the gifted than of the controlled children make high maturity ratings, especially the gifted boys of 6 to 10 years. Sociability and activity ratings of the children it will be recalled that the activities of column 1 are in the main non-social, those of column 2 social and in most cases competitive, those of column 3 mildly social and quiet. It will be of interest, therefore, to note what proportion of a given child's expressed preferences are in column 2. A high proportion would seem to indicate greater sociability, a low proportion less sociability. Table 158 is displayed on the preceding page. Maturity ratings of control and gifted boys by age. Table 159 is displayed on the previous page. Maturity ratings of control and gifted girls by age. Table 160 is displayed on the preceding page. Significance of maturity differences in tables 158 and 159. Figure 26 is displayed on the page. Mean maturity ratings by age, gifted and control groups. Table 161 is displayed on the page. Percent maturity ratings of gifted children in various percentile ranges of control group. Accordingly, for each child, the three columns were scored separately 
using the method of weighting by one cross, two crosses, and three crosses described on pages 394 to 395. Then the ratio of score on column 2 to total score on the three columns was calculated and used as a sociability rating of the child. In the same way, the proportion of a child's expressed preferences in column 3, quiet plays, may be used as an activity rating. In this case, the greater the percent of score on column 3, the less the activity interest. In deriving both sociability and activity ratings, exercise 1 was ignored and the scores in exercise 2 and 3 were combined. Table 162 gives the classification of sociability ratings assigned to the gifted for each age and sex group. It will be noted that from a third to a half of the sociability ratings of the gifted fall below the lower quartile of the control. The difference is large enough to be significant. Table 163 gives the corresponding data for the activity ratings from the gifted. Here again, the gifted show a lower average rating than the control group, indicating that they are more interested in games of the quiet type. Testimony regarding experience and skills. Exercise 4. Exercise 4 requires a child to answer 45 questions regarding his experience and skills. These questions, if answered truthfully, would throw considerable light on the degree to which gifted children differ from average children with respect to their experience and interest in wholesome activities. In as much as gross overstatement is possible, and in a certain proportion of cases very probable, the scores on this exercise cannot be relied upon for a rating of individual children, provided the relative tendency of the various groups to overstate is known. This information is available from the overstatement test described in Chapter 17. It is there showing that gifted children of all ages are less inclined than the control group to overstate their knowledge. There is probably little risk in assuming that this tendency holds also for the test with which we are here concerned, and that in consequence any differences found between the gifted and control are more unfavorable to the gifted than they ought to be. Table 164 gives them means and standard deviations by age, sex and intelligence on the basis of one point for each question answered by underlining yes. Table 162 displayed on the previous page. Sociability ratings of the gifted percent of gifted by age and sex in indicated percentile ranges. Table 163 is displayed on the previous page. Activity ratings of the gifted percent of gifted by age and sex in each range. Table 164 is displayed on the page. Claims regarding experience and skills. From the above data, it would seem that gifted children have had, on the whole, about as rich experience along the lines to which these questions relate as the controlled children have had, possibly richer, if we allow for the greater tendency of controlled children to overstate in matters of this kind. However, interesting differences were found on individual items when the percents of affirmative replies were calculated for the control and gifted groups. The largest of these differences are as follows. A small table is split on the page for a series of questions compared to the percent of affirmative replies. Exercises 5, 6 and 7. Play information. Exercises 5, 6 and 7 see page 390 ff, are tests of play in information and relate chiefly, though not entirely, to the 90 activities of exercises 1, 2 and 3. The score in each exercise is the number of correct responses minus half the number of wrong responses, that is the score right minus half wrong. This formula allows for the factor of chance success from guessing in order to increase the reliability of results, the scores on the three exercises were combined into a total score. Means and standard deviations of the control and gifted groups by age and sex are given in Table 165. Table 165 is displayed on the page. Means and standard deviations for play information by age, sex and intelligence. The age mean for the control boys were smoothed and used as norms for calculating the information quotients of the individual gifted boys just as intelligence quotients are calculated. As the sex differences are very large, a separate norm was derived for the girls. Table 166 shows the distribution of play information quotients for the gifted children. 
The mean quotient of 136.8 shows that gifted children, age for age, possess enormously more information about plays, games and amusements than do unselected children. In fact, their superiority in play information is almost as marked as their superiority in the Stanford Achievement Tests. It is, of course, unsafe to draw any inferences regarding play habits from data on play knowledge, but it is interesting to know that whatever the play habits of the gifted may be, such children are at any rate not lacking play information. The results here lend greater credence to the data from exercises 1, 2, 3, and 4. Table 166 is displayed on the page, Play Information Quotients of Gifted Children. It was ordinarily intended that the play information scores should also be used as a check against the child's honesty of reporting exercises 1, 2, and 3. This task was abandoned, partially because it was too laborious, but chiefly for the reason that the relatively small number of activities marked by many children in exercises 1, 2, and 3 made the check very unreliable. Home and School Data on Play Life In addition to the data secured by the use of the questionnaire test, considerable supplementary information on play life was furnished by the home and school information blanks. In each, certain questions were asked regarding the amount of time spent in play, age and sex of companions preferred, attitude towards the popularity with other children, etc. In most cases, a graded rating was called for on the same general plan in both home and school reports. In the case of the gifted children, it is therefore usually possible to check one report against the other. Home and school blanks were not filled out for the control group, which was given the questionnaire test on plays, games and amusements. However, as stated on page 177, school information blanks were filled out by teachers for a control group of approximately 600 children in Los Angeles, San Francisco and Oakland. Control Group A it will be recalled that these children were selected to represent as nearly as possible the average school child in the cities, schools and neighbourhoods from which the gifted children came. Since this group of controlled children does not go below age 8, wherever age affects the results, the comparison is somewhat unfair to the gifted. The reports were all tabulated by age, but as there was little evidence of age influence on most of the questions reported upon, the ages have ordinarily been combined in the summaries given in the following pages. The proportion in each group for whom reports were received will be stated in each case. Unless otherwise stated, the tabulated results are in terms of percents for whom the given question was answered. Does child play with other children very much? Average amount? Little? Underline. School blank. 4. 10. Answer for 91% of the control. Boys. 93% of gifted boys, 92% of control girls, and 89% of gifted girls. A table displayed on the page comparing the control and gifted boys and girls, with percentiles answering very much, average amount, and little. The figures indicate that the gifted child plays alone somewhat more than do normal children similarly situated. The difference, however, is small. Average hours a week spent with other children during the last year. Out of school. Home blank 229. Answer for 86% of boys and 89% of girls. A table is played on the page. Average hours a week. Comparing the gifted boys and girls to percentiles answering. Comparable data are not available for the control group, but the average of about 2 and 3 quarter hours a day for gifted boys and 2 and a quarter hours a day for gifted girls spent in play with other children out of school would not seem to be a bad record. Prefers playmates who are much older. Older, same age, younger, much younger. School blank 4, 11. Home blank 2, 30. Home reports for 91% of gifted. School reports for 87% of gifted and 90% of control. As no significant sex differences were found, the sexes were combined. A small table is laid on the page comparing the school blank for control and gifted and the home blank for gifted with percentiles answering. The school reports a much larger percentage of gifted than controlled children who prefer older playmates, and the home reports of the gifted agree fairly well with those from the school. This is probably due in part to the fact that the gifted child is usually associated in school with children a year or two older than himself, 
and in part to a tendency for mental ages to seek their level. Prefers playmates of the same sex, opposite sex, or no preference. Underline. School blank 412. Home blank 232. Home reports for 98% of gifted. School reports for 89% of gifted and 91% of control. A small table is split on the page, comparing the control of the school report and gifted school report with gifted home report, comparing the percentage of buys. The significant difference here between the control and gifted is much less marked tendency of the gifted to make sex distinctions. This is especially noticeable in the case of the gifted girls. It is in harmony with the fact that the masculinity ratings based on play interests were higher for gifted than for control girls. Home and school agree on reporting the girls, both gifted and control, considerably more tardy than boys in developing a preference with regard to sex of playmates. This is shown in the following percents, reporters having no preference at various ages. A table is split on the page, no preference for sex of playmate. Comparing the school blank and home blank for gifted boys and girls. Comparing the percentiles for ages. Reading the above figures, from left to right, it is seen that for girls the absence of any sex preference is more common at 12 or 14 than at 8 to 10, and that the reverse holds for the boys. His child's companionship is specially sought, rather avoided, neither. Underline, school blank, 4, 13. Answers were received for 91% of both groups. Tables played on the page comparing the gifted and control to the percentiles answered. The figures for control and gifted agree fairly closely. More girls and boys in each group are said to be especially sought for companionship. This finding is supported to some extent by the trade ratings presented in Chapter 18. The following questions also throw some light on popularity and social adaptability. The following figures for three different age levels show that, while both gifted and control, the percent of children rather avoided decreases after 11 years. A table is split on the page comparing the gifted and control boys and girls to percentiles. When he can't have his own way, cries or gets angry, often, occasionally, rarely. Underline. School blank 4, 14. Answer for 81% of gifted and 82% of control. A table is split on the page comparing control and gifted to percentiles answered. The differences here are too small to have any significance. Is teased by others very frequently, frequently, occasionally, rarely, never, underline. School blank 4, 15. Home blank 2, 34. School reports for 88% of both groups. Home reports for 95% of gifted. A table split on page comparing the boys and girls in the school blank and home blank to percentiles answered. The above figures do not show any consistent trends, except that teachers more often than parents report children as never teased. There is no evidence from these reports that gifted children tend more often than others to be socially maladjusted. The proportion rarely or never teased remained in all groups practically constant for all ages. The gifted girls running higher than control girls and the gifted boys somewhat lower than control boys. Is child considered by others as queer or different? If so, in what way? Home blank 235, school blank 416. Home reports were received for 89% of gifted boys and for 92% of gifted girls. School reports for 84% of control boys and 87% of control girls. 89% of gifted boys and 83% of gifted girls. A table is played on page comparing the school blank for gifted and control to the percentiles answered. This would indicate that gifted children somewhat more often than controlled children are considered queer or different although the absolute number is not large. There is close agreement of the reports from home and school on the gifted group. The question, in what way, brought the following explanations of the adjustment difficulties found in the gifted group. And the table is played on page, comparing the cases reported to the boys and girls in home blank and school blank. One cannot assume that the reasons given are always the true ones although the agreement between the home and school reports suggests that general tendencies may be revealed. 
If so, it is probable that in a majority of cases the difficulty is not serious enough to endanger greatly the child's future. Less than half the explanations mention traits that are seriously unfavorable. Prefers to play indoors, outdoors, or no preference. Underline. Home Blake 233, answer for 97%. A small table displayed on the page comparing the gifted to percent answer replied. We have no controlled data on this question, but the results are about what one might expect from children in general. 5% of boys and 8% of girls prefer indoor play. No age differences were noted. A play interests normal, if not explained. School blank 417. Answer for 93% of gifted and 95% of the control. A table displayed on the page comparing the school blank for control and gifted to percentiles answered. Gifted boys are slightly more often abnormal in their play interests than control boys, according to these figures. Explanation of these abnormalities was given for the gifted children as follows. A table displayed on the page comparing the number of cases reported, comparing girls and boys. As child had imaginary playmates, imaginary countries. Home blank 231. Imaginary playmates were reported as follows. A table displayed on the page comparing a list of cases to girls and boys. A good many of these reports seem to be due to a misinterpretation of the question, but it's probable that a fairly large proportion of the gifted children have had imaginary playmates. The information on these is rather meagre, but includes such statements as the following. At the age of two, Don and Gore, very vivid. From the age of 20 months to three years, he played with imaginary animals. He loved them dearly and was never afraid. At the age of two and three, Dippy, who was blamed for his naughtiness. A weaker boy who could be ordered around. Oliver and Stuart, who played, ate and slept with him. Very real. Mr. and Mrs. Moon, Baby Moon and their cook. Mrs. Cardboard. She talks about them continually and likes to take Baby Moon along when we go out. A three-year-old girl. Between the ages of three and four, Evelyn, who did all the naughty things, but had to be petted. Between the ages of three and five, Tin Can family of relatives. They came to see us and she visited them. Several, each named and never confused. When three to five years old, she used to say, don't sit in that chair, Iris sits there. In the instances in which dates were given, the imaginary playmates seemed to have flourished when the children were from two to five years of age, many of them lasting through the whole period. There is some indication, too, that they occur more frequently in cases where the child has no real playmates. The list of imaginary countries is summarized as follows. The table is split on the page displaying the number of cases to girls and boys. Summary 1. Preference ratings were assigned to 90 plays, games and amusements based on the extent to which gifted and unselected children say they like and practice them. Four of such ratings, based respectively on control boys, control girls, gifted boys and gifted girls, were derived. The intercorrelations of the ratings for these four groups were computed and found very high in each intelligence group, above 0 0.80, for the like sex groups, and very low, 0 0.18 to 0 0.35, for unlike sex groups. 2. The gifted children show measurably greater interest than the control in activities that require thinking and that are mildly social and quiet. They show slightly less preference than do the control group for competitive games. 3. The sex differences in preference expressed by the control group were made the basis of masculinity indices of the activities. This made possible the calculation of a masculinity rating for each child based on the total masculinity values of the activities for which his preferences were expressed. 4. The mean masculinity ratings of the gifted boys were slightly higher than those of control boys at all ages except 13. The means of the gifted girls did not differ consistently with those of control girls. 5. Maturity indices of the 90 activities were computed, based on the angle of their respective age curves of preference ratings. Four such indices were derived for each activity, based respectively upon control boys, control girls, gifted boys and gifted girls. The intercorrelations of these maturity indices 
for the four groups range from 0.45 to 0.59, except for control girls first gifted girls, for which R equals 0.91. 6. Maturity ratings of the children were then derived, based on the maturity indices possessed by the activities for which they had expressed preference. These ratings are consistently higher for gifted than for controlled children. This means that, in general, gifted children tend to prefer activities which among controlled children show increasing rather than decreasing popularity for the ages 8 to 14. 7. A sociability rating was derived for each child based on the proportion of preferences which fell to social and competitive games. This tended to run somewhat lower for gifted than for controlled children. 8. In the same way, an activity rating was derived for each child based on the proportion of preferences which fell to the quiet activities. These ratings were lower for girls than for boys, and also lower for the gifted than for the control group. 9. Testimony regarding 45 items of experience shows little difference between gifted and control in a matter of such experience, but considerable difference in kind. The gifted have had much more experience along lines that involve intellectual activity. 10. A play information test of 143 items was given to gifted and control groups. Norms were established and play information quotients were computed for the sexes separately. The main play information quotient of the gifted was 136. Girls scored somewhat lower than boys on this test. 11. Additional data on play life was secured both from home and school for the gifted and from the school for a control group. 12. The gifted children play alone slightly more than do the control. However, the average gifted boy spends about two and three quarter hours a day with other children out of school and the gifted girl about two and a quarter hours. 13. Gifted children. Oftener than control, prefer playmates who are older than themselves. 14. The gifted show much less sex preferences than do control children in choice of playmates. The girls show far less sex preference than do boys. 15. The gifted child's companionship is sought in school to about the same extent as that of the control child, although the gifted child is usually considerably younger than his classmates. 16. There is little difference in the extent to which gifted and controlled children are teased by others or cry when they cannot have their way. However, somewhat more gifted than control are said to be regarded by other children as queer or different. 17. The play interest of gifted boys is somewhat more often said not to be normal than is the case with the control boys. The reverse, however, holds for the girls. 18. A good many gifted children have had imaginary playmates or imaginary countries, but comparative data on this point are not available for unselected children. End of section 15. Section 16 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1, Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children, by Lewis Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings from the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 15. Reading Interests. The data of this chapter are based upon 1. Answers given by parents, teachers and the children themselves to certain questions in the home blank, school blank and interest blank. And 2. Records kept by the children of the books which they read during a period of two months. Considerable information was obtained for unselected children, especially by means of reading records. The reading of any group of children is so widely scattered that several thousand cases are usually necessary to establish many reliable differences in reading preferences. As our groups are relatively small, it is possible in most cases only to indicate general trends. With regard to the amount and general type of reading, however, the results are fairly conclusive. An extended treatment of the data elsewhere makes it unnecessary to give here more than a brief summary. Amount of reading as estimated by parents. In the home blank, parents were asked to indicate the kind and amount of home reading at the following ages. Before 5, 5 and 6, 7 and 8, 9 and 10, 11 and 12, 13 or above. 
It was specified that the amount was to be given in terms of hours per week, and that reading on schoolwork should not be included. Probably because of the difficulty of answering the question, about 30% of parents failed to respond, and some who did respond gave data for only a part of the ages. Allowance must be made for a large amount of error in such reports. Children reporters having been accustomed to read 12 hours, 18 hours, or 25 hours a week at the age 6 years, may have read more or less than these amounts. But the fact that parents report many such histories is at least interesting evidence. The figures reported are summarized in Table 167. Table 167 is displayed on the page. Hours of reading per week at various ages. Parents estimates. According to parents' reports, a good many gifted children read as much as seven hours a week before the age of five years. By age seven, the average amount is six or seven hours a week, and by age 13, 12 hours. The amount reported for boys is slightly higher than for girls from seven to 12 years. The standard deviations are, however, extremely high. In cases where the amount of reading seemed impossibly high, all the available information regarding the child was sifted. For example, one boy was reported as reading 25 hours a week before the age of five. Other information in our files showed that this boy learned to read before the age of three years, and that before five he was reading almost anything he could lay hands on. In every case of this kind, the supplementary information lent credence to the parent's report. Amount of reading as estimated by teachers. In the school blank, teachers were asked to answer the following question. As compared with the average child of the same age, does the child read 1. very much, 2. more than average, 3. average amount, 4. less than average, 5. very little. In this case, comparative data are available for the control group A. See pages 177 to 178 for description of this control group. Table 168 summarized the responses to above question. Ages were first tabulated separately, but since the comparison took age to account, the figures remain almost constant from age to age, and it is necessary to give here only the results for the ages combined. As the control group did not go much below age 8 years, or the gifted group much above 13 years, the figures for each group are here presented only for children of ages 8 to 13. This gives a total of 429 gifted and 401 controlled children. Table 168 is displayed on the page, teachers estimates of amount of reading. The differences between the gifted and the control group are very striking. Of the 429 gifted, 88% are rated as reading more than the average, while the distribution of ratings for the control group is fairly symmetrical around average as the mode. The sex differences are too small to be significant. Records of two months reading. The most reliable data on amount of reading were furnished by the children themselves in the form of records which they were housed to keep of the books read over a period of two months. Similar records were kept by a control group, control group C. Each child was given a 32 page record booklet size three by five inches the first three pages were as follows. A form is displayed on the following pages. Reading record. Name of pupil, age, name of parent, address, date when record was begun, date when record was finished. As soon as record is finished, mail this book to Professor Lewis M. Terman, Stanford University, California. Read the instructions on the inside carefully. Why you are asked to keep this record? I wish to find out what books children of each age like best, and in order to get the facts, I am asking several hundred boys and girls to help me by keeping a record in this notebook of all the books they read during a period of two months. When the notebooks have been returned to me, I shall then be able to prepare and publish a list of best liked books, which will be of great help to parents and teachers in selecting the books children of each age really enjoy most. By keeping the record, you will therefore be doing something that will help to make the lives of thousands of children happier. Lewis M. Terman How to keep the record 1. For two months, make a record of all the books you read, but do not include your regular school textbooks or books that someone else read to you. 2. 
while keeping the record, you should read just your usual amount. Do not make a special effort to turn in a long list. For the present purpose, it does not matter whether you read many or few. 3. Make a record for each book on the day you finish reading it. Do not wait till the end of the week or the end of the month, for you might not then be able to remember all. 4. Make your records neat and answer all the questions about each book. 5. When you have recorded your reading for two months, mail this notebook to Professor Lewis M. Terman, Stanford University, California. The following 29 pages, each as follows. One title of book, name of author, date when you finished it, if you did finish it, month, day. If you did not finish it, tell why. Below, make a cross before the statement that tells how well you liked it. Give your real opinion, no difference to what others think about the book. One of the best I ever read, liked it very well, better than most books, liked it very well, did not care much for it, did not like it at all. Have you ever read this book before? How many times before this time? Do you think you will want to read it again? The books were distributed to the gifted group in May 1922. In most cases, the first month of the record came within the school session, the second month within the summer vacation. Many parents, when returning the booklets, wrote that the amount read was less than usual during the vacation. But it is possible that with others the reverse was the case. It was not ordinarily planned to secure reading records for a control group and when this was later decided upon it was not possible to begin the records until after the opening of the following school year. Booklets were distributed to control group C about October the 1st, and the records cover, in most cases, the months of October and November. We do not know to what extent this discrepancy in time affected the results, or in what direction. One might suppose, however, that it would favour the control group, as the gifted children receive their booklets at a time when the pressure of schoolwork is likely to be greatest. Control Group C, for which reading records were obtained, was a special group not used in any other connection. It consisted of about 1,000 children from grades 2 to 8, inclusive in Palo Alto, Redwood City, and Menlo Park, California. In the case of the control group, the books were distributed and collected through the teachers. Each teacher assured her pupils that she would not examine their records and urged them to record all the books they read, with the exception of school texts. It is not likely, of course, that the children recorded their clandestine reading. If there was any difference between the gifted and control group in this respect, it is probable that the reports of the gifted were less complete, and no effort was made to prevent parents of the gifted from inspecting the records of their children. Of approximately 600 children in the main experimental group who were asked to cooperate, 511 returned the record booklets in time for tabulational results. The control group of approximately 1,000 children supplied 808 records. Table 169 gives the average number of books read by both groups at ages 6 and 7 combined, 8 and 9, 10 and 11, etc. Table 169 is displayed on the page. Average number of books read in two months, gifted and control groups. Table 169 shows a large difference between the two groups. A gifted child of seven years reads on the average more books than the unselected child reads at any age up to 15. One cannot say how many more pages they read, for the books they read are probably shorter than those read by older children. Gifted children of 8 and 9 read nearly three times as many books as unselected children of the same age, and above 10 approximately twice as many. By the age of 8 to 9 years, the gifted had almost attained their maximum. In both groups, there is a significant sex difference. Girls surpass boys by the following percents in the number of books read at the different ages. A table is on the page comparing the ages to gifted group and control group percentiles. It is a little surprising to find that in both groups, boys reach their maximum earlier than girls. This may be due to the fact that older boys are more likely to develop hobbies such as outdoor sports, collections, mechanical pursuits, etc. Girls lacking these diversions naturally turn to books. An interesting fact not shown in Table 169 is that so many of the control group read no books at all during the two-month period. 
Of those eight years old or older for whom booklets were returned, 13% reported that no books were read. The proportion would double as much higher among the 20% whose booklets were not returned. In the gifted group, not a single child of eight years or older who returned the booklet reported fewer than two books read. Influence of Intelligence on Type and Range of Reading General intelligence influences not only the amount of reading, but also its quality and range. Comparative study of the two-month reading records of our gifted and control groups shows that the gifted read over a considerably wider range and that they read far more non-fiction and informational material. On the whole, however, the most striking contrast is less in the type of books read than in the age which they were read. A book that is well liked by an average aged child of 11 or 12 is often read with enjoyment by the gifted child of 8 or 9. Table 170 shows for boys and girls of each group the percent of books read belonging to various types. It will be noted that Table 170 tells nothing about the relative amounts of reading done by the gifted as compared with unselected children. It tells merely what proportion of the reading actually done by each group belongs to each type of literature. For example, of the books read by the gifted boys, 8% belong to the class Fairy Stories, Folk Tales and Legends, 9% to Nature and Animal Stories, etc. Certain differences stand out very clearly. A large proportion of the books read by gifted boys than of those read by control boys fall in the field of science, history, biography, travel, folk tales, nature and animal stories, informational fiction, poetry, drama and encyclopedias. A smaller proportion of the fields of emotional fiction and stories of adventure and mystery. Almost exactly the same differences are found between gifted and control girls, except that here the two intelligence groups show about the same degree of preference for nature and animal stories. The differences indicate that the reading of the gifted is of a better average quality than that of the control group. Table 170 displayed on the page Classification of books read by gifted and control groups. Sex differences in reading interests. In the reading interests of very young children, sex differences are not noticeable. By the age of nine or ten, the boy begins to turn from fairy tales and fantastic stories to books of a more realistic nature, while the girl clings more to the imaginative story. By eleven or twelve, the divergence is very marked and the bridge continues to widen up to adult life, when a certain amount of reproachment takes place. Girls are more homogeneous with respect to reading tastes than are boys. Boys scatter their reading over a wider range. For example, Little Women is universally popular among girls, but we find no one book that has so wide a distribution among boys. This difference was also evident in the responses which a hundred graduate students, 50 men and 50 women, gave when asked to name the ten books read in childhood which most appealed to them. Of the women, 50% listed Little Women, 36% The Little Colonel Books, 30% Robertson Crusoe, and 25% Black Beauty. There were very few books not named by three or more women. The men's list showed variety. Robertson Crusoe, which appeared most frequently, was mentioned by only 13%. Treasure Island came next with 12%. The third, the last of the Mohicans with 8%. The narrow range of girls' interest is also indicated by their tendency to reread books. In the reading record booklet, the child was asked to state, regarding each book recorded, whether he had read it before. The gifted and controlled children combined reported more than 12,000 readings. Of the books recorded by girls, 30% represented re-readings. Of those recorded by boys, 18%. Classifying the gift under control by sex, we have the following classification of readings reported in the record booklets. Table 171 is displayed on the page. Classification of reading by sex. The above figures reveal three outstanding contrasts. As compared with boys, girls read, relatively to total amount read, one more than 12 times as many books of home and school life. Two, nearly five times as much emotional fiction and three, only a third as many stories of adventure and mystery. Girls care more than boys for fairy stories, and boys more than girls for books of science, history, biography, travel, and informational fiction. When romance enters into a boy's book, it must be so intermingled with action that the sentiment is not too obtrusive. These strong human interests in girls are shown by their intense liking for books of the little women type. 
To what extent the sex differences in reading interests reflect differences in native endowment, and to what extent the subtle effects of social ideas and training, is impossible to say. It is the tradition of our race that men should be interested in such things as industries, machinery, and the sciences, and that women's sphere is the home. The girl is exposed to this tradition from her earliest years, and it would be surprising if such long-continued and pervading suggestion did not leave its mark on her reading interests. It is worthy of note, however, that although boys show practically no interest in girls' books, girls show a most decided interest in boys' books. Girls read with interest Treasure Island, The Call of the Wild, and other popularly accepted boys' books. They read the Boy Scouts' books and other boy adventure series. Few boys, however, read Little Women or Rebecca of Sunny Book Farm, and they rarely open a girl's book on stories of school life. From the reading records of our children, it was found that 18% of the girls' reading was in the field of boys' books, but only 2% of the boys' reading was the human interest story of home or school life that girls so much enjoy. Preference Readings of Books Read It will be recalled that the record booklet questioned the child to read each book read by checking one of the following statements. One of the best I ever read. Liked it very well, better than most books. Liked it fairly well. Did not care much for it. Did not like it at all. This request was complied with in nearly all cases. It was hoped that the results would be worth summarising for the individual books recorded. But as it turned out, the reading covered such a wide range that the number of ratings for a given book was in most cases too small to warrant the computation of average ratings for individual books. However, ratings were distributed and averaged for the books of each general class. The averages are shown in Table 172 for the gifted and control groups. In computing averages, the five degrees of preference were assigned the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, in order from greatest to least liking. Table 172 is displayed on the page, Mean Preference Ratings of Books Read. Table 172 shows that in general the books which are most frequently read are the books which are best liked. This was to be expected, but the figures lend emphasis. The average of the ratings is decidedly higher for the gifted than for the control, and slightly higher for girls than for boys. This may be taken as additional evidence that reading is more enjoyed by gifted than by unselected children and more enjoyed by girls than by boys. Favourite Books In the interest blank, the children were asked to name four or five books they had most enjoyed reading in the last year. Responses were obtained for 602 of the main experimental group, and from 1,225 unselected school children. The books listed cover so wide a range that the number who name any one book is too small to give a reliable comparison of the preferences of the two intelligence groups. The sex differences, however, were more marked than the intelligence differences, and the two intelligence groups have therefore been combined to secure a list of the 20 books most liked by boys and the 20 most liked by girls. They are as follows, listed in rank order. 20 books most liked by boys. 1. Treasure Island, Stevenson. 2. Call of the Wild, Jack London. 3. Tom Sawyer, Mark Twain. 4. Robinson Crusoe, Defoe. 5. Three Musketeers, Dumas. 6. Ivanhoe, Scott. 7. Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain. Penrod, Tarkington. 9. Sherlock Holmes, Conan Doyle. 10. Kidnapped, Stevenson. 11. Black Beauty, Sewell. 12. Swiss Family Robinson, Weiss. 13. Connecticut Yankee, Twain. 14. Tale of Two Cities, Dickens. 15. Count of Monte Cristo, Dumas. 16. Penor and Sam, Tarkington. 17. White Fang, Jack London. 18. Last of the Mohicans, Cooper. 19. Jungle Books, Kipling. 20. Oliver Twist, Dickens The 20 books most liked by girls 1. Little Women, Alcott 2. Anne of Green Gables, Montgomery 3. Ivanhoe, Scott 4. Little Men, Alcott 5. Treasure Island, Stevenson 6. Laddie, 
Porter, G.S. 7. Three Musketeers, Dumas. 8. Alice in Wonderland, Carol. 9. Heidi, Spiri. 10. Pollyanna, Porter, E. 11. Secret Garden, Burnett. 12. Rebecca, Sunny Book Farm, Wigan. 13. David Copperfield, Dickens. 14. Little Lord Fauntleroy, Burnett. 15. Call of the Wild, London. 16. Eight Cousins, Alcott. 17. Freckles, Porter G. 18. Little Minister, Mary. 19. Tale of Two Cities, Dickens. 20. Uncle Tom's Cabin, Stone. Series books could not be included in the above lists, since they were usually mentioned as a series rather than as individual books. But when they were treated separately, it was found that for girls, the Oz books were the most popular series, with the Little Colonel books coming next. For boys, the Book of Knowledge showed a surprising lead, with the Oz books second. Some of the interesting facts brought out by the above table are the following. 1. With the exception of the Book of Knowledge, all the most liked books are fiction. This is partly explained by the fact that the non-fiction reading covered such a wide range that agreement of choice occurred but seldom. Nevertheless, even if liberal allowance is made for this factor, it appears that fiction still holds first place in the reading preference of both boys and girls. 2. In the type of fiction preferred, striking sex differences are seen. These are in agreement with the findings already set forth. The boys prefer stories of adventure and mystery, while the girls prefer stories of home and school life. 3. Only five titles, those stated, appear in both lists. In other words, the lists are mutually exclusive to the extent of 75%. That the lists overlap at all is due almost entirely to the fact that girls frequently read boys' books. Distinctly, girls' books are rarely read by boys. The five titles appearing in both lists are Treasure Island, Call of the Wild, Ivanhoe, Three Musketeers, and Tale of Two Cities. Summary 1. The main number of hours of reading per week by gifted children, parents' estimates, increases from about 6 at age 7 to 12 at age 13. At all ages below 13, the mean is slightly higher for gifted boys than for gifted girls. 2. According to teachers' estimates, 88% of the gifted and 34% of the control group read more than the average child. 0% of the gifted and 22% of the control group read less than the average child. 3. Children of the gifted groups and of a control group keep a record of the books read during two months. Analysis has been made of such records for 511 gifted and 808 controlled children. 4. The reading records show that the average gifted child of seven years reads more books in the two months than the average of the control group for any age up to 15. The average of gifted children at eight or nine years is three times that of the control group of the same age. By this time, the average gifted child has almost attained its maximum as to number of books read. 5. Of the control group who had attained the age of 8 years, 30% read no books at all during the 2 months. Of the gifted group who were 8 years old or older, none had so poor a record. 6. Classification of the books read by the two groups brought out the fact that the gifted children read over a considerably wider range than the controlled children, and that they read more science, history, biography, travel, folk tales, informational fiction, poetry and drama. On the other hand, in proportion to the total number of books read, the gifted read fewer books of adventure or mystery and far less emotional fiction. 7. In both gifted and control groups, the boys scatter their reading over a much wider range than do the girls. Girls are much more likely than boys to read a book two or more times. 8. Boys read about three times as many books of adventure or mystery as the girls read of this type, while the girls read nearly five times as much emotional fiction as boys read. 9. When the 20 most popular books were listed for each sex, only five books were found in both lists. 10. With the exception of the Book of Knowledge, all the 20 best-liked books both lists were fiction. End of section 16.
Section 17 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1 Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 16 Tests of Intellectual, Social, and Activity Interests. Jenny Benson Wyman. Introductory Statement Apart from the data of the two preceding chapters, more or less light has been thrown on the interests of gifted children in a number of divisions of this study. The educational history of the children, as given by parents and teachers, Chapter 10, the Tests of Information and Achievements, Chapter 11 and 12, the ratings given by parents and teachers on personality traits, Chapter 18, and the comparative study of the mental development of eminent individuals, Volume 2, have all suggested the importance of interest as a determinant of achievement and as a factor to be considered in individual diagnosis and educational treatment. In many cases, however, the evidence has been indirect and inferential. It is inadequate for its purpose in the same way that class marks and teachers' estimates of the quality of school work are inadequate to establish the exact status of a child with respect to his educational accomplishment. In both cases, the data supplied by parents, teachers and others are open to suspicion on the ground that the judgments rendered may have been influenced by suggestion, halo effects or other forms of bias. We do not know in what respects and to what extent the various kinds of testimony and ratings would have differed from those obtained if parents and teachers had been led to believe that the test showed the children to be average or inferior in intelligence instead of gifted. Even the testimony of the children themselves in regard to their interests cannot be accepted at its face value. In the first place, children have no standard by which to judge the absolute strength of their interests. In the second place, they are likely to be misled in regard to the relative amount of interest they have for the different studies and activities by the influence of associations, like or dislike for a teacher, etc. The need, of course, is for a measure of interest that would be as objective, as consistent, and as valid as the best measures of intelligence or educational achievement. It is a large undertaking, however, to set about the derivation of such a test. The quantitative study of interest is not only a relatively new field, but one which is also inherently difficult. Interest seems very intangible in comparison, for example, with intelligence. Intelligence is abiding, it does not ordinarily take wings or completely alter its form and substance. As interest is so likely to do the moment one approaches it with a test. Obviously, the measurement of interest is a problem which cannot be solved by any single attack however skillfully planned. The attempt, nevertheless, seemed worthwhile making, and the task of devising a valid method was entrusted to Mrs. Jenny Benson Wyman, a graduate student in education and psychology at Stanford University. Mrs. Wyman devoted to the problem the greater part of her time for more than two years, working chiefly under the direction of Dr. Kelly. It is possible to present here only a brief description of her methods, and a summary of the most important of her findings. Lewis M. Terman Method of Approach A canvas of the experimental studies of emotional and personality traits led to the belief that the free association method offered the most promising line of attack for the measurement of interest. The investigations of Jung, of Kent, and Rosanoff, and many other workers had shown clearly that an individual's characteristic tendencies of thought, emotion, and will may reveal themselves in the apparently trivial responses to stimulus words in such a test. If it is possible thus to uncover mental complexes which lead to abnormal behaviour, and this possibility has been sufficiently demonstrated, why should not important underlying interest trends also be brought to light by an association test specially planned for the purpose? It was necessary, of course, to limit the undertaking to the measurement of a few significant aspects of interest. An extended consideration of the types of interest which are probably most influential in moulding one's personality, determining one's attitudes, and shaping one's life habits led to the selection of the following three types for investigation. One 
intellectual interests, two, social interests, and three, activity interests. These seem to be the most promising from the point of view of experimental procedure, and at the same time, highly significant in connection with the study of gifted children. According to the traditional psychology of genius, the gifted individuals tend to develop his intellectual interests at the expense of his interest in social and activity fields. The social and activity interests, perhaps in the first place inherently weak, are supposed to undergo continuous atrophy until the individual withdraws from active participation in affairs and becomes socially disinterested and ineffective. The ill-balanced Hamlet is often pointed to as an example of what results from too much thinking combined with too little mixing and doing. At any rate, it would be extremely desirable to have for each of our gifted children a set of objectively derived scores which would measure both the relative and the absolute strength of the intellectual, social and activity interests. In order to test these three aspects of interest, the dictionary was scanned for words which, when used as stimulus words in a free association test, were equally adapted to provoke responses due to intellectual interests, social interests, or activity interests. That is, with respect to these interests, the stimulus words would be of the balanced type, so that a small preponderance of interest in any one of the three directions would reveal itself in the nature of the responses. First, a list of 800 words was drawn up. For a preliminary experiment, this was reduced to 80, composing four comparable lists of 20 words each. It was necessary that the words retained should satisfy the following conditions. 1. They should be in common use. All were excluded which were not found in first 2,000 of Thorndike's word list. 2. They should not be too readily definable. 3. They should not be too much tied with other words through continued association with them. 4. They should not be words which would yield a large percentage of opposites in the responses. 5. They should be words which would not believe too strong an impression on the mind to produce a carryover effect. 6. The list as a whole should give a cyclical character so that it could be broken up into four comparable brief lists. The 80 words thus selected were tried out on a number of subjects, individually and in small groups. In order to get an idea of the technique that should be used with respect to presentation of stimulus, method of response, timing, etc. Group administration was found to be feasible. The stimulus words were presented visually at the same time pronounced by the experimenter. Response was by writing. A rate of one stimulus word every eight seconds was found the most satisfactory for children of the upper elementary grades. Preliminary Experiment the provisional list of words was given to 175 pupils of the 6th and 7th grades, 40 words on one day, and the other 42 weeks later. The children were simply told to write down in one word what the word shown made them think of. No examples of how to respond were given. Responses were then analysed for their significance. It was necessary to score each response three times, first for its intellectual value, next for its social value, and finally for its active value. Rating was at first on a scale of 5 to 0 for each response and was based on the experimenter's subjective judgment as to the intellectual, social or activity value of the response. The following reliability coefficients and intercorrelations were found for two groups of 12-year-olds selected for the 175 children tested. A table is played on the page. Reliability coefficients, 80 word list. 18 of these children were given a rank order rating by one teacher on each of the three interest traits. This gave the following rank order correlations between test score and teacher's estimate. Intellectual interest, 0.67. Social interest, 0.49. Activity interest, 0.22. The above results were deemed promising but it was found necessary to make extensive revisions in the list of stimulus words and to derive a more objective method of scoring. Some of the words gave little variety of response. Some tended to provoke too many definitions, and some of the pairs that were believed to be comparable proved not to be. 
Of the original list of 80 words, 37 were eliminated, and enough new words were added to give two comparable lists of 80 each. The new lists were then given to the children who had taken the provisional list and to several other groups. As there were 47 words common to the provisional list and the revised list, it was possible to secure evidence as to the consistency of a test of this nature when it is repeated. In this case, 13 months had elapsed since the first test was given. In order to make a valid comparison of the results of the two tests, it was, of course, necessary to have a strictly objective method of scoring. For the immediate purpose of the comparison, the following classification of responses was used. 1. Identity, synonyms. 2. Contrast. 3. Casual dependence. 4. Co-adjunction. 5. Subordination. 6. Superordination. 7. Definitions or explanations. 8. Coordinations of undetermined quality. 9. Coexistence. 10. Judgment of value. Predicate. 11. Judgment of fact. Predicate. 12. Subject and object relation. Predicate. 13. Associations denoting time, place, means, and purpose. 14. Reaction omitted. 15. Egocentric reaction. 16. Word of phrase completion. Current phrases. 17. Repetition of stimulus words. 18. Meaningless reaction. 19. Non-specific reaction. 20. Claim reactions. There were 53 children who took both tests. The responses were in each case classified into the above 20 categories, and a table for calculating the mean square contingency was drawn up. Correction for two fine grouping necessitated grouping categories 2, 4, 6, and 8 together, and 17, 18, 19, and 20 together, which reduced the number of categories to 14. The coefficient for mean square contingency was calculated and found to be 0.856 with standard deviation 0 0.0056. There is accordingly a rather remarkable degree of consistency in the responses given by a child from year to year. It may be held, however, that this correlation is spuriously high for two reasons. One, because of the memory factor, and two, because certain responses are so tied with certain stimulus words that they appear almost inevitably in the responses of any group of subjects. To meet these objections, the responses were examined again, and all those which were given in the identical word in the two tests were eliminated. This necessitated the elimination of 22% of the responses. The responses remaining yielded a mean square contingency coefficient of 0 0.80. This showed that the functions measured by the test are not evanescent but to a surprising degree permanent. Further analysis of the responses of 31 seventh grade children to the revised lists of 160 words showed the necessity for further revision. A few of the words brought too many failures to respond, and a few tended to provoke perseveration. After necessary eliminations, enough words remained to yield two comparative lists of 60 each. These are as follows. The table is displayed on the page, with four columns listing two sets of 60 words. An attempt was made to improve the scoring of responses for intellectual interest on the basis of estimated values assigned by two judges to each of the 26 classificatory categories, such as identity, contrast, casual dependence, co-adjunction, subordination, superordination, definition, etc., the correlation between the values assigned by the two judges was 0.849. When this method of scoring was tried out, it was found to yield lower coefficients of reliability and validity than the more subjective method used earlier. However, as some kind of objective scoring method was deemed necessary, it was decided to work out empirically one based upon a comparative study of the responses of specially selected groups. Derivation of the Scoring Method The final list of 120 words was given to 689 gifted children, most of whom belonged to the main experimental group, and to a control group consisting of 609 unselected children of grades 4 to 8 in San Jose. In addition, it was given to two special groups, 
which may be designated as A and B. Special Group A consisted of 115 6th and 7th grade pupils and was to serve for the final tryout of the new scoring method and for the statistical analysis of the test itself. Special Group B consisted of 157 7th grade pupils. This group was given the test in two parts of 60 words each, with an interval of two weeks between the sittings. This group was reserved for the determination of the reliability of the test. The teachers of all the 7th grade classes tested in special groups A and B were requested to make out three separate rank orders of their pupils. One for intellectual interest, one for social interest, and one for activity interest. The meanings to be attached to these terms were explained to the teachers as follows. Intellectual interest a person with a high degree of intellectual interest is one interested in knowing. Interested in getting at the meaning of things. The person who elects to know rather than to do. Social interest. Interest in persons. Do not confuse social interest with social performance. The most popular person is not necessarily the one with the highest social interest. Activity interest. A person with a high degree of activity interest is one who is interested in doing things, the leader, the one quick to respond, but not necessarily the one fondest of outdoor games, a person who prefers to take part rather than to watch. These types of interests are not mutually exclusive. In the case of the seventh grade pupils of the control group, the teachers were not asked to prepare rank orders, but merely to designate ten pupils with much and ten with a little intellectual interest, 10 with much and 10 with little social interest, and 10 with little activity interest. In one school, there were 39 pupils for whom it was possible to secure rank order ratings from four teachers, A, B, C, and D. Intellectual interests were rated by A and B, social interests by A and C, and activity interests by A and D. The rank order correlations yielded the following reliability coefficients for the ratings. Rank AB equals 0.507 for intellectual interest. Rank AC equals 0.694 for social interest. Rank AD equals 0.273 for activity interest. Later, B, C, and D, A was no longer available, were asked to rate their pupils again, this time by stating merely whether a given pupil was intellectually interested or not, socially interested or not, interested in activity or not. This gave a second rating by B on intellectual interest, a second by C on social interest, and a second by D on activity interest. By serial R's were then calculated as follows. For B's two ratings of intellectual interest, 0.93, deviation 0 0.4. For C's two ratings on social interest, 0.77, deviation 0.07. For D's two ratings on activity interest, 0.65, deviation 0 0.8. On the basis of all the above ratings, six groups of children were made up, all in the seventh grade at the time the test was given, and all between the ages of 10 and a half and 14 years. These groups were as follows. 1. With intellectual interest, 69. 2. Without intellectual interest, 58. 3. With Social interest, 71. 4. Without social interest, 67. 5. With activity interest, 71. 6. Without activity interest, 56. These groups were to serve as a basis for deriving the scores to be assigned to response words. A particular response word given by a large percentage of the with group by a small percentage of the without group, or vice versa, has a high differentiating value and is diagnostic. For each response, therefore, the frequency was found separately for the with group and the without group in terms of the percent who gave it. The difference between these two percents was also found. Next, the standard deviation of each percent was computed and the standard deviation of the differences between the two percents. Comparing the difference between the percents with the standard deviation on the difference gave a measure of the amount of a particular kind of interest involved in a particular response word. 
Accordingly, the score assigned to a response word was the difference between the percents of with and without groups, giving it divided by the standard deviation of this difference. The ratio subs obtained were then transmitted to a 0 to 20 scale, 0 indicating no interest, and 20 maximum interest. It was necessary, of course, to carry through this procedure separately for the three kinds of interests. In all, there were 10,880 response words to evaluate, each three times. Upward of 13,000 additional responses were encountered in scoring the papers of other groups of children tested. A serious difficulty encountered in the evaluation of response words arose from the fact that sometimes a stimulus word brought two or more responses obviously differing little in significance, but appearing with very different frequency. Moreover, in scoring the papers of the various groups tested, many response words were encountered which were not given by any pupil in the six with and without groups used for the derivation of the scoring method. For both of these reasons, the grouping of response words became unnecessary. This involved a considerable amount of subjective judgment, the effect of which is to reduce to some extent the reliability and validity of the test. Each of the 10,880 response words encountered was thus allotted three scores, one for each of the three types of interest. The key for scoring the responses to a single stimulus word fills an entire page. Two sample pages for the scoring or responses to the stimulus words, GEM and GRAND follow. The three columns of scores are in order, those for intellectual interest, social interest and activity interest. A table is displayed on the following pages. Scores for responses to the stimulus word, GEM. A table is displayed on the following page. Scores for responses to the stimulus word, GRAND. An examination of the above scores will bring many surprises. For example, one could not have seen that in response to the stimulus word grand, fine, or wonderful would have a much higher intellectual value than opera, that horse would have a higher intellectual than activity value, that nice would have nearly twice as high a social value as good, etc. Nor could one have seen that in response to the stimulus word gem, diamond would have had an intellectual value of 20 as compared with nine for jewellery, or that treasures would have a higher social value than money. One is not surprised to find that in response to most stimulus words, school is social and book and study non-social, or that help is more social than pity, but one could not have predicted with certainty that girl would prove to be more social than boy, or swimming more active than dancing. Doubtless of the test were given to other criterion groups of children similarly chosen, and the resulting data were similarly treated. The values found for the various responses would differ more or less from those which would have been obtained. For differentiating between the criterion groups which were used, the values given are approximately correct. If one would learn the best method of scoring a mental test, it is necessary to disregard all a priori considerations and follow the empirical method. For example, it was demonstrated empirically that failure to respond should not be given a score of zero, but a fairly high positive score, differing, however, with the different stimulus words. Comparison of scores of unselected and gifted groups suggests that a test of this kind could be devised which would have considerable value as a measure of intelligence. Some of the words in the present list could be used for this purpose. In response to the stimulus word night, for example, 33% of the gifted and 7% of the controlled children gave darkness, while 33% of the gifted and 72% of the control gave dark in response to the stimulus word house. 40% of the gifted and 15% of the control give home, while 2% of the gifted and 20% of the normal give wood. Many other cases of this kind were found, but no attempt was made to derive a measure of intelligence from the list used. Reliability of the test Reliability coefficients, standard deviations, intercorrelations, and PEs of scores were computed for the final list of unselected 12-year-old children. These are given in Table 173. The reliability coefficients are surprisingly high, considering that the entire test of 120 words may be given in about 16 minutes. 
The probable errors of the scores are correspondingly small. By trial it was found that when the test was given in two sittings separated by ten days instead of in a single sitting, the reliability coefficient for intellectual interest was very much lowered, and that for activity interest considerably lowered. With social interest, the difference was not significant. Table 173 displayed on the page Reliability Coefficients and Intercorrelations for Final List. Validity of the Test The procedure adopted in determining the proper scoring responses guarantees to a degree the validity of the test. In order to determine the degree of validity, the test scores were correlated with the teacher's ratings of the following six groups. A table is displayed on the page comparing pupils of grades ranked by teachers. The validity of the test as a measure of the three aspects of interest is indicated by the last column of corrected coefficients given in Table 174. The corrected coefficients were obtained by dividing the square root of the raw correlation between test and criterion by a square root of the reliability coefficient of the criterion. Table 174 displayed on the page, coefficients showing reliability of criterion and validity of the interest test. The average corrected correlations with criterion for the six groups of children are as follows. For intellectual interest, 0.65. For social interest, 0.496. For activity interest, 0.31. The first two of these are nearly as high as similar correlations yielded by the intelligence tests available a few years ago. The third is lower. All are high enough to make possible a reliable valid comparison of two such large groups of children as are gifted and control groups. Case Comparisons Additional evidence as to validity was obtained by examining the supplementary information furnished by parents and teachers concerning 32 gifted children who had earned high scores on at least one of the three kinds of interest. The first 16 cases are selected for high scores in intellectual interest, 140 or above, as compared with norm of 118. Four of these also have high scores in social interest, 130 or more, as compared with norm of 117, and one has a high score in activity interest, above 130, as compared with norm of 122. High scores are indicated in italics. In each case, the first three figures give, in order, the scores of intellectual interest, social interest, and activity interest. The table is displayed on the page. Comparing the case to intelligence, social, activity, and case studies listed. Four of the above cases and 11 of the following have scores of 130 or higher in social interest. One of the following has a score of 130 in activity interest. Other tables displayed on the page comparing case to intelligence, social, and activity with description. Two from the above lists and the following five cases have scores 130 or higher in activity interest. A table is displayed on the page comparing case, intelligence, social, and activity with description. From an examination of these cases, it is apparent that there is considerable agreement between the test results and the information supplied by parents and others. In no instance is there any marked discrepancy between the two sources of information, but in cases 10, 20, 21, 25, there seems to be some contradiction. Number 10 is a child labelled sluggish and inert, with a score of 127 activity, but since the child is anxious to travel and explore, the test score may give a better indication of her activity interest than does her behaviour. Number 20 is only the average score for activity interest, but enjoys outdoor sports. Number 21 is an interesting case, in the first place, he reads enormously, but his intellectual interest score is lower than the average for gifted children. In the second place, he is generally regarded as non-social, whereas the test score ranks him exceptionally high in social interest. In the opinion of Dr. Turman's research assistant, who knows this boy well, he ranks very high in social interest. The test here may be bringing out what is not superficially apparent. Number 25 has a high score for social interest, though she is characterised as dreamy, indefinite, lacking in curiosity. The explanation may be here in the statement, the household revolves round her. The agreement between the test scores and the different reports on these 32 gifted children 
is then a further indication that the test is a valid one for determining the direction of a child's interests. The above brief case studies also throw light on the type of child who is intellectually interested, on the type who is socially interested, and on the type who is interested in activity, as we should expect the intellectually interested type has literary tastes, is fond of reading, enjoys history, geography, and mathematics. The social type may be popular, but is not necessarily so. This type is happy with others, has a sense of humour, and seems essentially to have aesthetic appreciation and the artistic temperament. The real activity type is not necessarily the one fond of outdoor games. Rather, it is the born leader, the one who can manage others, the one quick to respond, or briefly, and the one with what is commonly called PEP. Comparison of gifted and control groups. Table 175 gives, by age and sex, the means and standard deviations of the gifted and control group on the three kinds of interest. The numbers are as follows. A small table is split on the page comparing two sets of boys and girls with age, gifted and control. Table 175 is displayed on the following page, means and standard deviations of gifted and control groups on intellectual, social and activity interests. From the above figures it is apparent, 1. That there is considerable growth from year to year in intellectual interests, only a little in social interests and almost none in activity interests. 2. The sex differences are non-existent for intellectual interests but the girls rate slightly higher at nearly all ages in social interests, and boys slightly higher at most ages in activity interests. 3. That the means for the gifted are in most cases significantly higher than for the control. How significant the differences are between the gifted and control group may be seen from Table 176, which gives for the age 10 to 13 the ratios of the differences to the PEs for the differences. Wherever this ratio is greater than 3 PE, the difference may be considered significant. Table 176 is displayed on the page. Significance of the difference between gifted and control groups in interest scores. The differences in the case of intellectual and social interests are all highly significant, while those for activity interests are significant only at age 10 for girls and ages 10 and 11 for boys. The highest individual scores found were as follows. For intellectual interests, 145 12-year-old gifted girl. For social interests, 139 11-year-old gifted girl. For activity interests, 138 12-year-old control boy. For a total of the three interests, 406 11-year-old gifted girl. Figure 27, which gives the curves of mean score for the gifted and control groups by age and sex, makes clear the relative positions of the two groups in each of the three types of interest. Figure 27 is displayed on the page, mean scores and interest tests, gifted and control groups by age. In contrast with the girls, both gifted and control boys show a decrease in intellectual interest from 12 to 15 years. In activity interest, the gifted, both girls and boys, show a noticeable tendency to decrease of score with age. With control boys, the curve shows a small continuous rise, while with control girls, it is approximately a plateau. That intellectually gifted children should surpass the average in their intellectual interests was to be expected. For the first time, however, we are able to express this superiority in quantitative terms. It is approximately 1.4 times the standard deviation found for unselected children of corresponding age, or approximately half as great as their superiority in intellectual ability as measured by the Stanford Binet test. In intellectual interest, about 90% of the gifted equal or exceed the mean of unselected children. The quantitative scores for the social activity interests of gifted children are more to our previous knowledge than those for intellectual interests. Instead of lacking social interests, as many have believed, the typical gifted child stands in this respect about one standard deviation above the mean for unselected children of corresponding age. Roughly 85% of the former equal or exceed the mean of the latter on social interest. In activity interests, the gifted are neither more nor less than normal, 
even our tests of interest should prove to be much too unreliable for use as a measure of the individual child, these conclusions would still be justified in comparing a large group of gifted children with a large unselected group. And this is the point of chief interest. Evidence from other sources regarding the interest of our gifted subjects agree in general fairly well with the evidence of the interest tests. These children have more than average liking for their schoolwork. Chapter 10. And for intellectual plays and games. Chapter 14. They show somewhat less preference for active games than do average children. Chapter 14. Teachers and parents both rate them highest in such traits as originality, desire to know, and general intelligence. They rate them considerably lower on social traits like fondness for large groups, leadership, and popularity with other children. But on these traits also, they rate them above unselected children. Chapter 18. Interest in activity, unfortunately, was not included in the 25 traits on which ratings were secured from parents and teachers. The Influence of Interest Upon School Achievement The information on the relation between interest and achievement was obtained by giving to a group of 81 children of the highest 6th, low 7th and high 7th grades the Interest Test, the National Intelligence Test and the Stanford Achievement Test. For this group, the reliabilities of the tests, their raw intercorrelations and the intercorrelations corrected for attenuation were found. Partial correlations were then computed based on the corrected correlations to show the effect of eliminating successively intellectual interest, intelligence, social interest and activity interests. For this group reliability, coefficients were as follows. Intellectual interest, 0.935. Social interest, 0.832. Activity interest, 0.859. National intelligence test, 0.907. Stanford achievement total, 0.935. The intercorrelations corrected for attenuation were as follows. A table is split on the page comparing social interest, activity interest, national intelligence test, and achievement total, with intelligence intercorrelation, social intercorrelation, activity correlation, and national intelligence test. From the above figures, it is apparent, one, that each test measures something with a fairly high degree of reliability, and two, that it is something is far from identical in the various tests. With intellectual interest rendered constant, we have activity interest, social intercorrelation 0.102, national intelligence test, social intercorrelation 0.242, activity intercorrelation 0.272, and achievement total, social intercorrelation 0.011, activity intercorrelation 0.052, and national intelligence test intercorrelation 0.763. With intelligence NIT score, rendered constant. Another table is displayed on the page, comparing the same statistics with social interest constant and with activity interest constant. The correlation between intelligence and the achievement total when the effect of intellectual interest is eliminated is 0.763. The correlation between intellectual interest and the achievement total when the effect of intelligence is eliminated is 0.490. These correlations give a comparative measure of the effect of these two functions on success as measured by achievement in school subjects. Intellectual interest is a very potent factor in determining achievement. But the question arises, must a child be interested in what he is doing in order to achieve success in it, or is it the ability to succeed that gives the interest? In which direction does the casual relation lie? We find the most successful child is highly intelligent and highly interested. Some children who are not highly interested have succeeded, but they are highly intelligent. Again, some highly intelligent, but not highly interested, have not succeeded. And finally, some of lower intelligence and not a high degree of success are highly interested. The answer to the question, then, is that a child must be interested to achieve success. The greater the interest and the higher the intelligence, the greater the success, and not the ability to succeed produces the interest. With regard to social interest and activity interests, when the effect of intelligence is eliminated, social interest shows a very slight correlation with achievement, and activity interest has no influence at all. Analyzing the data further, in order to determine which school subjects are most influenced by intellectual interest, with the effect of intelligence removed, we find it has, probably, the greatest influence on arithmetical reasoning, 
though the influence is significant for all subjects except spelling. What a little correlation there is with spelling could easily be due to chance, so that intellectual interest has no influence on success in spelling. Social interest, judging the correlations in the light of their PEs, has very little effect on any of the school subjects, and activity interest has no influence at all. When, on the other hand, we examine the correlations between social interest and the school subjects when the effect of intellectual interest is eliminated, we find there is no correlation. And with arithmetical reasoning, there is probably a negative correlation. Between activity interest and success in the school subjects, there is no correlation at all. We are in a position, then, for judging the precise influence of the various interests on achievement in school subjects. Other significant facts are brought out by the partial correlations. There is the greater association between intellectual and social interest, between intellectual and activity interest, and between social and activity interest than between any one of these and intelligence. This throws light on the meaning of interest itself. Further light is thrown on it when we consider, on the one hand, the lack of correlation between social interest and history information, the low correlation between social interest and science information, and between social interest and all high school achievement, and on the other hand, the very high correlation between social interest and intellectual interest. This is a definite denial that interest is knowledge. Again, the low correlation between activity, interest and achievement, and the high correlation between intelligence and achievement, throw important light on the meaning of intelligence scores. They are void of meaning in terms of activity. This is also borne out by the lower scores of the gifted children in activity interest, compared with their scores in intellectual and in social interests. Summary 1. A free association test has been devised for the measurement of three types of interest, intellectual interest, social interest, and activity interest. The reliability coefficients of the test, 0.80 to 0.90, compare favorably with those of current intelligence tests. The validity coefficients are somewhat lower, but are high enough to permit valid comparisons between groups of subjects, if not between individuals. The average of the validity coefficients found is 0.65 for intellectual interest, 0.50 for social interest, and 0.31 for activity interest. Case studies furnish additional evidence of validity. 2. The new interest test was given to 689 gifted children and to 609 composing a control group. Control group D. 3. The scores indicate that there is considerable increase of intellectual interest with age, only a little increased in the case of social interest and none with activity interest. 4. There are no sex differences in intellectual interest, but girls surpass boys in nearly all ages in social interest, and boys surpass girls at most ages in activity interest. 5. In intellectual interest, the mean score of the gifted children at most ages exceeds the mean of unselected children of corresponding age by approximately 1.4 times the standard deviation of the latter. This is approximately half as great a degree of superiority as obtains in the case of intelligence. Stated another way, about 90% of the gifted children equal exceed the mean of unselected children in intellectual interest. 6. The superiority of the gifted in social interest is somewhat less, but is still very decisive. The mean of the gifted being about one standard deviation above that of the control group. Roughly 84% of gifted equal or exceed the mean of unselected children in social interest. 7. With respect to activity interest, gifted and control groups do not differ materially. 8. A special group that was given the interest test was also given the National Intelligence Test and the Stanford Achievement Tests. Intercorrelations of all these tests were computed and the method of partial correlation was applied. This treatment made it possible to secure a measure of the relative effect of intelligence and of intellectual interest upon achievement. The correlation between intelligence and achievement when intellectual interest is rendered constant is 0.76. The correlation between intellectual interest and achievement when intelligence is rendered constant is 0.49.
9. The influence of intellectual interest on achievement is significant for all the school subjects except spelling, but is greatest in the case of arithmetical reasoning. 10. Similar treatment shows that social interest and activity interest have, of themselves, practically no effect upon school achievement. End of section 17. Section 18 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1 Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 17 Tests of Character and Personality Traits. Tests of Character and Personality Traits are a relatively new development in psychology and is still on a much less satisfactory basis than tests of intelligence, information or school achievement. However, in view of the great desirability of obtaining character data which would be more objective than the trait ratings supplied by parents and teachers, and in view of the promising results which had been secured by Volker, Katie and other workers in this field, a comparison of gifted and unselected children on a battery of such tests seems worth undertaking. Methods of approach which were considered include the free association method of Kent and Rosanoff, the Presley method of testing emotionality, the downy will temperament test, the Woodworth Candy Questionnaire test of psychopathic tendencies, and the methods developed by Volker and Katie for testing honesty and incorrigibility. The kent rosnov tests would doubtless have yielded results of great interest, but it had to be ruled out because it is not adapted to group testing. The Pressy method was not very suitable for young children and had not been sufficiently validated. The downy will temperament test was dropped for consideration because of the extremely low reliability and validity coefficients which it had generally yielded. The volker Katy tests, on the other hand, were suitable for children and been subjected to rigid statistical procedures and had been demonstrated to have a fairly high degree of reliability and validity. Mr. A. S. Lubenheimer undertook the task of preparing a series of tests which would be diagnostic of much the same traits Volker and Katie had attempted to measure, at the same time free from certain objectionable features of their tests. But while describing his experiment, a brief account will be given of the work of Volker and Katie. Volker devised 10 tests of trustworthiness, the total score of which, applied to boys, correlated 0.75 with the total of another similar series, and, on an average, 0 0.60 with the judgment of teachers and scout leaders. The traits tested were as follows. 1. Willingness to accept undeserved credit, overstatement test. 2. Suggestibility, as indicated by the M and N test in the Downey Will Temperament series. 3. Willingness to accept help in solving puzzles after promising not to accept help. 4. Conscientiousness in returning borrowed property. 5. Dishonesty in accepting overchange. 6. Willingness to accept a tip for a trifling courtesy. 7. Trustworthiness in performing a routine task under temptation to neglect it, pushing a button every two minutes for ten minutes. 8. Similar to test 7, task is to cancel A's in a book containing extremely interesting pictures. 9. Willingness to peep when placed in one's honour to perform a task with the eyes closed. 10. Willingness to cheat in scoring one's own responses to a test. The Volker tests were all of the performance type. That is, the subject was confronted by a natural situation in which there was genuine temptation and his score depended on how he made the situation. There can be no doubt that there were several tests of actual trustworthiness. Some of his tests were unsuitable for our purpose because they could not be given to groups, others because they necessitate subjecting the child to so much temptation that their use was considered objectionable for the present purposes. Katie set himself the task of finding tests which would yield a measure of the moral traits involved in the adjustment of children to the social and mandatory requirements of the school, that is, measures of incorrigibility. Some of the tests 
which he tried out, among others, were the following. 1. A test of trustworthiness in following directions in a motor task, dotting circles or tracing mazes with the eyes shut, when there is considerable temptation and opportunity to cheat by peeping. Modification of Volga's test. 2. A test of honesty in scoring one's own intelligence test blank in the face of temptation, an opportunity to cheat by copying in the correct responses from the key while scoring. Vulgar. 3. A test of modesty and accuracy in statements about knowledge possessed. Modification of Vulgar's overstatement test. 4. A test of moral judgment, in which the subject indicates by the figures 1, 2, 3, or 4, degrees of blame attaching to each of a number of moral traits. Modification of Prezi's test. 5. A modification of the Woodworth Questionnaire Test of tendencies likely to be associated with psychopathy or emotional instability. These tests, which were all suitable for mass use, were given to unselected boys, delinquent boys, and boys specially selected on the basis of several teachers' ratings of boys representing the extremes of corrigibility found among 12 to 14 year olds in the public school of Fresno, California. The composite ratings secured for the last group had a reliability of 0.95 and furnished an exceptionally satisfactory criterion for judging the validity of the tests. Reliability and validity coefficients found for the tests, based upon data from 150 boys of 12 to 14 years, were as follows. 1. Trustworthiness in motor task. Reliability, 0.74. Validity, 0.40. 2. Honesty in scoring a test. Reliability, 0.58. Validity, 0.19. 3. Overstatement. Reliability, 0.58. Validity, 0.41. 4. Moral judgment. Reliability, 0.38. Validity, 0.20 to 0.31. 5. Woodworth questionnaire. Reliability, 0.75. Validity, 0.36 to 0.42. Total weighted score of above. Reliability, 0.75. Validity, 0.58. These correlations are lower than are yielded by the best intelligence tests with groups of equal heterogeneity, but they are as high as the correlations given by many achievement tests in common use. They demonstrate, rather conclusively, the value of the test method in the study of character traits. Rubenheimer arranged a new form of the overstatement test and devised a set of six new tests, all intended to throw light upon tendencies to moral stability. A brief description of each follows. 1. Overstatement. A. This test is a modification of one which has been used by Franigan. Fifty book titles were listed on the test blank, twenty of which were fictitious. The score is the number of fictitious titles marked. The instructions were as follows. We want to see who has read the most books. You were to mark a cross on the dotted line in front of every book you have ever read, no matter how long ago you read it. After you have finished marking the crosses, count up the number of crosses you have marked. This number will be your score. We want to see who will have the best score. Afterwards, we will have you stand up and tell your score. A perfect score is 50. Look at the sample. Sample 1. Cross. Anderson's Fairy Tales. Fifteen of the fifty items follow. Robinson Crusoe, Little Men, Uncle Remus Stories, The Underground Patrol, White Fang, Seaside Adventures, Hans Brinker, Scouting in Strange Lands, Five Little Peppers, By England's Aid, Call of the Wild, Campaign in Argentina, Tom Sawyer, Sunk Without a Trace, The Friday Murders. Now count up your score and put the number you have read in the space here. Remember, a perfect score is fifty. 2. Overstatement B. This test, which is a modification of a test used by Volker, consists of two parts. The first part calls for a statement of amount of knowledge the child has in regard to 80 items of information. The second part, given later without warning, tests the child's actual information on the same 80 items. The score is a percent of overstatement or understatement. Directions on the dotted line before each question put 2, 1 or 0 to tell how well you know the thing and ask about. Put down 2 if you know it very well, put down 1 if you know it fairly well, 
Put down zero if you know nothing about it. First sample. Can you ride a bicycle? Second sample. Can you skate on roller skates? Third sample. Can you drive a car? Sample items follow. Do you know who discovered America? Do you know who wrote Huckleberry Finn? Do you know who was the prophet who spent the night in the lion's den? Do you know how to find the square root of decimals? Do you know how many degrees there are on a centigrade thermometer? Do you know where Calcutta is? Do you know what causes an eclipse of the sun? Do you know what the receiving wires of a wireless are called? Do you know how water enters the roots of plants? Now add up your score. A perfect score is 160 points. In the second part, the subject was told to underline the correct word in such sentences as the following. America was discovered by Drake, Columbus, Balboa, Cook. Huckleberry Finn was written by Algo, Dickens, Henty, Mark Twain. The prophet who spent the night in line stand was Daniel, Joa, David, Joel. The square root of 0 0.0081 is 0 0.9, 0.09, 0.009, 9. The number of degrees on a centigrade thermometer is 32, 100, 180, 212. Calcutta is in India, Egypt, Siberia, Mexico. An eclipse of the sun is caused by the shadow of the Earth, Moon, Mars, Jupiter. The receiving wires of a wireless are called the amplifiers, detectors, reflectors, antennae. Water entered the roots of plants by capillarity, osmosis, evaporation, solution. 3. Questionable reading preferences. The child is asked to place a number from 1 to 10 before each of 10 book titles to indicate how well he would like to read the book. 1 meaning greatest preference, 10 least. The score is the sum of the squares or the deviations of the individual items from the correct order as determined by competent judges. Two lists were given separately. One of them is as follows. A Daring Rescue Roy Black, The Master Thief Captains of Great Teams Hobo Stories Running Away with the Circus The Adventures of Boys Who Became Great Men Summer Camp Adventures With the Gang in the Black Streets The Boy Inventor The Escape Through the Woods 4. Questionable Character Preferences this test consists of eight brief paragraphs, each characterizing the boy. The subject is asked to place before each characterization a number from one to eight to show how well he would like to have as a chum the boy described. The test is scored in the same manner as test three. Two such lists of eight items each are given separately. Four of the items in one list are as follows. Dick joined the Boy Scouts as soon as he was old enough. He did not like it at first. The drill and the rules were hard. Now he is a troop leader and is planning a camp in the mountains next summer. Ray Stevens is at school now, but he is anxious to get out. He wants to become a taxi driver. Ray says that taxi drivers have an easy time, but they need not work so hard, and they go about a great deal. Ted is a poor boy, and although he is at school, he must help provide for the family. Ted studies hard and also plays on the team. He wants to become a doctor. Bill Evans is 14, and he is a leader of his gang. He always manages to get his men home safely after they have had a good time around the pool room. Just last week, they saw Tom Mix at the movies without paying. 5. Social Attitudes 24 things or ideas were named, each followed by four statements expressing various kinds of reactions to the thing or idea presented. The subject is asked to check the one statement that most nearly tells how he feels about it. Score is the number of questionable items checked. Samples are as follows. Chums. It is hard to go without them. You cannot always trust them. They sometimes squeal on you. It is best to have them in your gang. Boy Scouts. They have too many rules. They have to drill too hard. It is no fun. They are regular fellows and have lots of fun. They are like sissies. Teachers. They work hard. They know they can punish you. They are not fair to you. They are kind of cranky. Playgrounds. There are always fellows watching you. They make you play games you don't like. There is no chance to do what you want to. 
You can have a good time there. Policeman. They have it in for the kids. They are glad to help you out. It is fun to fool them. They are just big bluffs. Having a paper out. It gives you a chance to get away from home. You can earn some money. You have a chance to get around town alone. You don't have to be so much with your lessons. 6. Activity Preferences Of three things to do, the subject was to check the one thing you liked best. The test contained 12 items of this nature, the score being the number of items in which some other than the best response was checked. This test was not used with the gift of children for fear of possible criticism. It is highly adapted for use with children of superior social and moral environment. Two of the items are as follows. A. Go camping with the Boy Scouts. Go around seeing the country, getting lifts as you go. Quit school and go with the circus. B. Match pennies and win. Have a paper route. Win money at the shooting gallery. 7. Rating the seriousness of offences. This is a carefully worked out version of a test which has long been in use. Ten offences were listed, covering a wide range in nature and seriousness. They had been selected from a much larger number of offences actually committed by delinquent boys, and they differed from one another in seriousness by equal steps. The subject was to number them from 1 to 10 according to seriousness. The score was a sum of the squares of the deviations from the correct order. This test was finally omitted from the series used with our gifted children. It correlated too highly with intelligence, and some of its items were deemed objectionable on moral grounds. Some of the items were as follows. B. Sam set fire to the public school which he attended. D. Bob ran away from home to get a job, getting his room and board from another family. F. Ted played hooky to go to a circus. J. Joe entered the house of the people next door and took $2.50. If the derivation of the above tests involve, in each case, a considerable amount of experimental work, which we cannot here enter into, the purpose of the tests was to find whether differences known to exist between two groups with respect to their social and moral adjustments can be detected in a test situation. After a preliminary experiment, each test was made up in two forms, and the entire battery was given to the following groups of subjects, or boys. 1a. 50 boys in a superior type of school, each selected by the teachers as belonging in the highest quartile of 13-year-old boys with respect to reliability, stability, and healthy mindedness. 1b. 37 boys. 13 years old in the same school, selected by the teachers as belonging in the lowest quartile with respect to the above traits. 2a. 42 boys, 11 years old, in the same school, corresponding to group A1. 2b. 36 boys, 11 years old, in the same school, corresponding to group A2. 3a. 43 boys, 13 years old, in the highest quartile, in a school of somewhat inferior social status. 3b. 40 boys, 13 years old, in the lowest quartile of the school. 4a. 41 boys, 11 years old, in the highest quartile. 5b, 36 boys, 11 years old, in the lowest quartile. 6, 42 boys, of 12 to 14 years, in a parental school in the same city, delinquents. 7, 36 boys, of 13 to 14 years, in the Whittier State School for delinquents. Both forms of the test were given to all groups, and in addition, form B of the National Intelligence Tests. The 13 years olds of group 1B and 3B combined were used for determining the reliabilities of the tests. In the case of each of the character tests, one form was correlated with the other, and the reliability of the two forms combined was then computed by the use of Brown's formula. The resulting coefficients were as follows. 1. Overstatement A. Books read. Reliability coefficients 74. 2. Overstatement B. Knowledge claimed. Reliability coefficients, 78. 3. Reading preferences. Reliability coefficients, 80. 4. Social preferences. Reliability coefficients, 79. 5. Social attitudes. Reliability coefficients, 77. 6. Activity preferences. Reliability coefficients, 74. 7. Offense ratings. 
Reliability coefficient 78. 8. National intelligence scores. Reliability coefficients 86. Table 177 gives the same 13 year olds the intercorrelations of the tests. The intercorrelations corrected for attenuation, labelled C, and, in parenthesis, the correlated intercorrelations found with intelligence is rendered constant by the method for partial correlation. Table 177 displayed on the page intercorrelations of the Rubenheimer tests. The above intercorrelations show that the tests do not duplicate one another greatly, and that they are measuring something which is not identical with the traits measured by the national intelligence tests. However, tests 2, 5, 6 and 7 correlate rather more highly with intelligence than would be desirable. It was later found possible to reduce the defect of test 2 by the use of a different method of scoring. By serial R coefficients were computed to show the efficiency of the several tests differentiated between the following groups. 1A and 1B, highest and lowest 13 year olds in the better school. 2A and 2B, highest and lowest 13 year olds in the good school. 3A and 3B, highest and lowest 13 year olds in the poorer school. 4A and 4B, highest and lowest 11 year olds in the poorer school. 1A and parental school group, 2A and parental school group. 3A and parental school group, 4A and parental school group. Nearly all of these coefficients were large enough to be significant, but were lower for the first four comparisons listed above than for the last four. It appears that the upper and lower quartiles of unselected children do not give very widely contrasting groups in the schools used. Teachers frequently complained that many of the pupils they had to offer for the low group were highly less reliable, stable, and healthy minded than their best pupils. On the other hand, each of the higher quartile groups yielded a striking contrast to the parental school group, which, judged by the scores earned, was a worse group tested. The Whittier group of committed delinquents held an intermediate position, possibly because of the exceptionally favourable influences to which they had been subjected in the school. The bias serial R's for the A groups and the parental school group were as follows. A table displayed on the page comparing the parental school versus the A groups. The correlation of total weighted score with the criterion ranges, therefore, from 0.47 to 0.74, with an average of 0.62 for the four comparisons. It is higher for the 13 year than for the 11 year groups, probably because there is an average difference of more than a year and a half in the mental ages of the 13 year and parental school pupils whereas the 11-year-olds are of about the same mental age as the parental school subjects. The means and the standard deviations of total scores for the different groups were as given below. Attention is called to the fact that because of the method of scoring, low scores are better than high scores. A table is played on the page comparing the mean to the standard deviation. Table 178 shows the difference between each A group and the parental school group expressed as a multiple of its standard deviation. It will be noted that the differences are significant in nearly all the comparisons, and that for the total score they are very large. Table 178 is displayed on the page. Differences between means of various groups in the Robinheimer tests expressed as multiples of the standard deviations of the differences. Selection of character tests for the gifted group In the selection of tests for the gifted group, from those which had been devised by Katie and Rubenheimer, other factors than reliability and validity had to be considered. Katie's test of honesty in recording scores, although an excellent test, was admitted on the ground that it might be deemed morally objectionable by parents or teachers. Rubenheimer's tests of activity preference and offence ratings were admitted for the same reason, and for the additional reason that they were thought to differentiate less effectively in the upper moral levels than in the lower. They also correlated rather too highly with intelligence. Katie's test of moral judgment was admitted because of its low reliability and low validity, and because it had been shown to correlate too highly with intelligence. The following battery of tests was finally selected. 1. Overstatement A. Knights Rubenheimer, 2. Overstatement, B. Part 1. Volko Katie Rubenheimer, 3. 
Reading preferences, Rubenheimer. 4. Character preferences, Rubenheimer. 5. Social attitudes, Rubenheimer. 6. Trustworthiness in following directions, Falco Katie. 7. Questioner test of emotional instability, Woodworth Katie. Description of test 6. Trustworthiness. This test was given with minor departures from the procedures laid down by Katie. The directions were as follows. Circles. Here is a test to see how well you can use your hands with your eyes shut. E points to a blank, see figure 28, which should be pinned up on a wall in plain view of all, and says, see these circles, pointing, numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You are to lay the paper flat on your desk and hold it here, with your fingers off the left hand, E points to place. Then take your pencil in the other hand, and put the point down at the cross where it says start here. Next look carefully at the circles numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and see where they are. Then when I say go, you must shut your eyes so that you can not see, and try to make a cross with your pencil in each one of the five circles. There will be five trials, and after each trial we will see who gets the most crosses in the little circles. Some people get nearly all of them in. Watch me. E demonstrates, with butt of pencil, taking care not to miss any of the circles. You are to do it the same way, but with your eyes shut. Shut them when I say go. Pupils are requested to sit up straight, hold paper squarely on the desk before them, and place pencil down across. Now look carefully and see where the circles are. After ten seconds, go. Five trials with same sheet. After each trial, children record scores as per instructions at centre of the sheet. After each trial, E says, How many got the cross in all five circles? How many got it in two or three circles? How many did not get it in any? Squares. Here is another test a little like the other. Examiner demonstrates with blank, see figure 29, pinned up in view. You hold the paper with your fingers here. You put the pencil here. E puts pencil across in larger square. You look carefully at the bigger square. Then you shut your eyes and make a line with your pencil clear around the square without touching the sides. E does it. Next you start here. E puts pencil down across the next larger square. Shut your eyes and make a line clear around the next square. Only this time you go the other direction. Then you start here and make a line clear around the next square. E does it. Each time you must change and go the other direction. Figure 28 is displayed on the page. Circles used in trustworthiness test reduced. Pupils are told to sit up straight, to hold paper squarely on the desk before them, and to place pencil down across. Then look carefully to see where you make the line. After 10 seconds, go. After each trial, say, how many got clear around without touching the sides more than just a little? Figure 29 is displayed on the page. Squares used in trustworthiness test reduced. Scoring of trustworthiness test. Katie scored each complete performance with the circles as positive or negative, according as there was or was not evidence that the subject had cheated. Similarly with the squares. We have used instead a graded score to write as follows. Circles. Number of crosses in circle 2 multiplied by 3. Number of crosses in circle 3 multiplied by 4. Number of crosses in circle 4 multiplied by 5. Circles 1 and 5 are ignored, as crosses may frequently be placed in these without cheating. Squares. Ignore the smaller square. For each of the other squares, the score is obtained as follows. Score 1 for each corner, except the first, where the line drawn is within the boundary lines. In addition, give 1 if the entire line is within the boundaries, does not actually cross the line. This makes a possible unweighted score of 4 for each square. These scores are then weighted in the following manner. Score on square 2 is to be multiplied by 2. Score on square 3 is to be multiplied by 3. Score on square 4 is to be multiplied by 4. Score on square 5 is to be multiplied by 6. Total score of the test equals sum of score on squares and circles. Description of test 7. Woodworth Katie Questionnaire. 
This test was devised by Woodworth in 1918 for use in identifying soldiers having psychotic tendencies. In arranging it, the author sifted the leading manuals of psychiatry, made a list of the symptoms most generally agreed upon by competent authorities as being frequently associated with psychopathy, and embodied as many of these symptoms as possible in questions to be answered by yes or no. The war came to an end before the validity of the test could be thoroughly established, but it was given to one regiment and to several groups of normal and psychopathic subjects. With a group of subjects in a private hospital for nervous patients, it yielded scores which overlapped only slightly those earned by normal subjects. In its original form, the questionnaire, because of items it contained relating to sex, was not suitable for use with school children. It was later expurgated and revised by Ellen Matthews, who then gave it in the revised form to 1,133 unselected school children and to 376 other children, and made a detailed analysis of the responses to individual items and revised the test. Katie made a number of additional changes based upon the extent to which individual items differentiated children rated by other criteria as superior or inferior in emotional instability. He also arranged it in two forms in order to determine its reliability. In one form, the questions were of a positive type throughout. In the second form, they were of a negative type. For example, form A contains the question, Do you always get on well with your teachers or principal? In form B, this item runs, Do you often have trouble with your teachers or principal? We have given only form A, and this with slight alterations. Two or three items were omitted because they were considered objectionable. For example, the question, do you feel that your parents are not really your own? Certain changes were also made in the padding, that is, in the items inserted merely to lull the suspicious of the subject as to the purpose of the test. Finally, small changes were made in the wording of a few of the significant items. We reproduced the entire list as it was given to the gifted and control groups. The start items only are scored. Directions Look at the directions here, pointing. It says, answer every question as truthfully and honestly as you can by drawing a line under the right answer, as shown in the samples. First sample. Are there seven days in a week? The right answer is yes, so the word yes has a line under it. Second sample. Do you sleep 15 hours a day? All of you draw a line under yes or no to tell whether you sleep 15 hours a day. Pause. Below are other questions. Answer everyone truthfully and honestly by drawing a line under yes or no. Do not skip any. Go. Allow all or practically all to finish, except only so pupils may be urged to go faster. Scoring. The score is the number of start items answered correctly. The correct answers are underlined in the following reproduction of the test. On the following pages, a survey is displayed with 85 questions with yes and no responses. Scoring of Overstatement B A new method had to be devised for scoring the overstatement test, as a method used by Ropenheimer yielded a score which was considerably influenced by the factor of intelligence. The method substituted was as follows. A. Part 1. Child's statement of knowledge score equals sum of the twos omitting the ones found to increase the reliability, only 40 of the 80 items of the test were used. B. Part 2. Score equals 2, parenthesis, R minus 1 third multiplied by W, close parenthesis, where R equals number of items answered correctly and W the number marked wrongly. C. Final score. For overstatement, first minus second divided by 80 minus second. For understatement, Second minus first divided by second, where first equals score on part one, second equals score on part two, and 80 equals total possible score for the 40 items. The method takes account of the fact that a child can overstate only with reference to the items which he does not know, and that he can understate only with reference to the items which he does know. Score below minus 25, one sigma, account as minus 25. Subjects tested. The above tests were given to the following gifted and controlled subjects. The table is split on the page comparing the 
age to the gifted and control groups. The control group, control group D, was the same as that used in connection with the test of intellectual, social and activity interests. It was composed of unselected pupils in grades 4 to 8 in two schools of San Jose, California. All the pupils in grades 4 to 8 of these schools were tested, but those of age 15 and over were omitted from the calculations. The tests were given in the following order. 1. Overstatement A. 2. Overstatement B, Part 1. 3. Reading preferences. 4. Character preferences. 5. Social attitudes. Brief recess. 6. Trustworthiness. Squares and circles. 7. Overstatement B, Part 2. 8. Woodworth Cady Questionnaire. With the following exceptions in two forms of tests 1 to 7, were given to both the gifted and control groups. A. The control group was given only one form of test 5. In order to make the results on this test comparable with those of the gifted group which took both forms, the theoretical score on the two forms was computed for the children of the control group. The formula used was as follows. Mean for total of both forms, gifted group, divided by mean for one form, gifted group, multiplied by a score for one form, control. This assumes for children of both groups the same ratio of gain from the first form to the second form. B. Test 2 also was given to the control group only in one form, 40 items instead of 80. Both forms were given to the gifted group, but the second form was omitted in scoring. A single form of this test has a fairly high reliability. Derivation of total score The total score includes a score on the Woodworth Cady questionnaire. Although this test is intended primarily to bring to light abnormal emotional tendencies, while all the other tests are more specifically directed toward the measurement of moral traits, Cady's results indicate that emotional instability is probably an important factor in the total complex of traits making for moral deviation. In weighting the test to secure a total score, the following factors were taken into account. Reliability. Validity is shown by correlation with criterion. Variability. And average intercorrelation with other tests. Other things equal, the weight given should vary directly with reliability and validity, and inversely with variability and average intercorrelation. Possible variation and the results of the factor of intelligence was also taken into account. One would expect the brightest children to be more likely to divine the purpose of the tests, with the result that their responses would be less spontaneous and less genuine than those of average or intellectually inferior children. Robenheimer questioned each of his groups, after the examination was over, to find whether they had understood the purpose of the tests. The replies indicated that probably fewer than 5% of the children, even in the 13-year groups, had guessed correctly. It appears that for the large majority of unselected children, the tests are not invalidated by this factor. In the case of our highly selected gifted group, the vitiation of results from this source may be, and probably is, greater, especially with tests 3, 4 and 5. The factor of dissimulation is pretty effectually ruled out in tests 2 and 6, and is believed not to affect seriously tests 1 and 7. Two judges, Terman and Goodenow, with the above factors in mind, weighted the tests independently of each other. Their combined judgments yielded the following weights, which were therefore used in obtaining the total score. 1. Overstatement A. 2. 2. Overstatement B. 1. 3. Reading preferences. 0.1 4. Character preferences 0.1 5. Social attitudes 5. 6. Trustworthiness in following directions 1. 7. Woodworth Cady Questionnaire 2. Comparison of gifted and control groups Tables 179 to 186 give for each test and for the total score by age and sex the means and standard deviations of gifted and control groups, the difference between the means, the standard deviation of the difference, and the difference expressed as a multiple of its standard deviation. Attention is called to the fact that the scores of the 7, 8, and 9-year-old gifted children are compared with the 10-year norm of the control. 
it was not possible to extend the norms lower than 10 years, as unselected children below that age are frequently unable to understand and carry out the instructions. Since most of the tests show more or less increase in mean score with age, the method of comparison used is somewhat unfair to the gifted children below 10 years. Attention is again called to the fact that low scores are better than high scores. Table 179 is displayed on the page. Comparison of means test 1 over statement A. Table 180 is displayed on the page. Comparison of means test 2 in terms of percent of over statement. Table 181 is displayed on the page. Comparison of means test 3 book preferences. Table 182 is displayed on the page. Comparison of means test 4 character preferences. Table 183 is displayed on the page. Comparison of means test 5 social attitudes. Table 184 displayed on the page. Comparison of means test 6 trustworthiness. Table 105 displayed on the page. Comparison of means test 7 Woolworth Caddy questionnaire. Table 106 displayed on the page. Comparison of means total score to character tests. It is possible to summarize the above tables very briefly. The differences between the two groups are large enough at nearly all ages to be highly significant. In the case of test 1, the differences are significant at only part of the ages. In the total score of the seven tests, the difference is very large at all ages. In the gifted group, girls are significantly superior to boys in most of the tests, while in the control group the sex difference is much smaller. However, in both groups, boys do better than girls in the test of trustworthiness circles and squares. The detailed results on sex differences are as follows. 1. Overstatement A, no sex difference. 2. Overstatement B, gifted girls are much superior to gifted boys and tend to understate rather than overstate. Controlled girls are only slightly superior to controlled boys. 3. Book preferences. Girls are superior to boys in both groups. 4. Character preferences. Gifted girls are superior to gifted boys. No marked sex difference in the control group. 5. Social attitudes. Gifted girls are superior to gifted boys at all ages except 13, and control girls are superior to control boys at all ages except 11. 6. Trustworthiness. In both gifted and control groups, the boys make a better showing than the girls in 5 out of 7 age comparisons. 7. Woodworth Cady Questionnaire. Gifted girls do slightly better than gifted boys, while in the control group, there is no significant sex difference. Tables 187 and 188 give other forms of comparison between the two groups. In general, from 60 to 85% of the gifted equal or exceed the mean score of the control group. The high percent for test 5, social attitudes, may be partially spurious as this test may be vitiated by the fact that children of superior intelligence tend to be more on their guard. However, tests 2 and 6, overstatement B and trustworthiness, in which this factor could hardly have entered, show respectively about 70% and 60% of the gifted at or above the mean of the control group. The order of the tests with respect to degree of superiority of the gifted over the control group Table 188 is as follows. Boys, test 5, social attitudes. Test 4, character preferences. Test 3, book preferences. Test 6, trustworthiness. Test 7, Woodworth Cady questionnaire. Test 2, overstatement B. Test 1, overstatement A. Girls, test 5, social attitudes. Test 4, character preferences. Test 3, book preferences. Test 7, Woodworth Quady Questionnaire Test 2 of Statement B Test 6 Trustworthiness Test 1 over Statement A Figure 30 gives the curves based on the age means of the total character scores, 7 tests combined, for the gifted and control groups separately by sex. These curves possess considerable interest. So far as a writer knows, they are the first curves of character growth ever constructed on the basis of objective tests of proved reliability and validity. They reveal, in a very impressive way, the great superiority of the gifted over the control, and the noticeable superiority 
of girls over boys in each group. On the preceding page, table 187 is displayed. Further comparison is given to control groups in test 1 and test 2 over statement A and over statement B. Table 188 is displayed on the page. Percent of gifted who equal or surpass the mean of the control group in test 1 to 7 and in total score. They indicate that the gifted child of 9 years is fully as developed in their character traits measured by these tests as the unselected child of 14 years. An interesting feature of the curves is the fact that the means for boys both gifted and control are lower at 13 than at 12, but rise at a steep angle after 13. The curve for gifted girls shows a plateau a year earlier, but that for control girls two years earlier. But the adolescent improvement in character traits comes earlier with girls than with boys. Figure 30 is displayed on the page. Mean total scores of gifted and controlled children by age on seven character tests. Summary 1. The total score of 10 tests of trustworthiness devised by Volker yielded a reliability coefficient of 0.75 and correlated to the extent of 0.60, with a criterion based upon the judgments of teachers and scout leaders. The total score of Katie's five group tests of incorrigibility yielded a reliability coefficient of 0.75 and correlated 0.58 with the judgments of teachers. These studies demonstrate that it is possible, by means of objective tests, to make reliable comparisons of groups with respect to certain important character traits. 2. Building upon the results of Volker, Katie and others, Rubenheimer devised seven tests of moral instability, each with a reliability of 0.74 to 0.80. The total score of this battery yielded by serial R's as high as 0.72 and 0.74 between the parental school groups and groups selected by teachers as superior with respect to moral stability. These tests were shown not to duplicate one another objectionally and not to be primarily measures of intelligence. 3. A battery of seven character tests was made up, composed of two of the best tests from Katie's series and five of the best of Lubenheimer's series. This battery was given to 532 children of the main gifted group and to 530 unselected children of the control group. Reliability and validity coefficients for this exact battery have not been computed, but these can be inferred from the data of Katie and Wilkenheimer to be above 0.75 for reliability and above 0.60 for validity. 4. Comparison of mean scores of the gifted and controlled groups by age shows a significant superiority of the gifted group for both sexes and at all ages. On the separate tests, from 60 to 80% of the gifted equal or exceed the means of the control group. On the total score of tests 1 to 7, 85% of the gifted equal or exceed the means of the control group. 5. The gifted child of 9 years has reached a level of character development corresponding roughly to that of unselected children of 14 years. 6. In most of the tests, the gifted girl makes a better average score than the gifted boy. While the control group, the sex differences, when any are found, are considerably smaller. In the test of honesty, however, the boys of both groups make a better showing than the girls. 7. Girls begin their adolescence spurt in character development about a year earlier than boys. 8. Sex differences in the variability of scores earned in these tests are for the most part small and inconsistent. 9. Although these tests do not make possible a very reliable comparison of individual children, they warrant the conclusion that in the traits which they measure, the gifted group is decisively superior to the control group, and that this superiority is greater for girls than for boys. End of section 18. Section 19 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1 Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis Terman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 18. Trait Ratings The experiment to be reported in this chapter 
grew out of the writer's earlier experience with trait ratings in connection with studies of various gifted and subnormal groups of children. The selection of traits to be rated and the method of securing the ratings have both been a matter of gradual development. For several years, the following traits were used. General intelligence, capacity for sustained attention, willpower, persistence, dependability, studiousness, cheerfulness, obedience, conscientiousness, courage, unselfishness, sense of humour, evenness of temper, intellectual modesty, emotional self-control, physical self-control, initiative, general health, social adaptability, and leadership. The 20 traits are here named in order of teachers' mean ratings of 50 gifted children. The rank order of the traits based upon the means of the ratings given the same children by their parents correlated 0.76 with this order. In general, the rank order of types of traits, from highest to lowest, for gifted children was intellectual, volitional, moral, emotional, physical, and social. The ratings were made by placing a 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 before the name of each trait, according as the child was judged to be very superior, superior, average, inferior, or very inferior. Between 1918 and 1920, ratings were secured by the same method for 121 and gifted children on 46 traits. Mean ratings were found for groups of traits as given in Table 189. Means were not computed for the traits separately because of the large part played by halo effects when an individual was rated on so many different traits. The mean ratings by teachers is higher than that by parents for four of the five groups of traits. On the other, will and activity. Teachers and parents rate about equally high. Table 189 is split on the page, mean ratings of classes of traits in preliminary experiment. The order of the trait groups from highest to lowest mean rating for 121 gifted children is as follows. Teachers, mental, will and activity, emotional, social, psychophysical. Parents, mental, will and activity, social, emotional, psychophysical. The fact that all of the means exceed three, the hypothetical normal, may not be especially significant since unselected children were not rated on this preliminary study. In the rating of almost any group of children, there is a constant tendency to rate too high. The order of the groups of traits is, however, significant. When the larger investigation was undertaken in 1921, considerable thought was given to a revision of the rating method which had previously been used. The number of traits to be rated was reduced to 25, as experience had shown that the use of the larger number made discrimination difficult and increased the halo effects. In making the final selection of traits to be rated, the leading experimental and descriptive studies of character and personality were consulted. A tentative list of traits was made out and submitted on to several judges, who were asked to rate each trait on two points. A. With respect to its importance for total character or personality, and B. With respect to the probable accuracy of the ratings which would be secured by its use. From the tentative list, the 25 traits later to be described were finally retained. The method of securing ratings by the assignment of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 was abandoned in favour of the cross on a line method, which had been found to introduce less halo effect. Effort was made to define the two extremes of each trait in as definite and concrete terms as possible. The instructions and rating forms are reproduced in the following pages. The order in which the traits are given is one which it was thought would reduce halo effects and encourage objectivity of rating. The traits at the beginning of the list are those which the average judge would be most likely to rate with discrimination and frankness. The intellectual traits are near the end. A form is displayed on the following pages, ratings on physical, mental, social and moral traits. Effort was made to have each child of all the gifted groups rated on the entire list of traits by at least one teacher and by the parents by either parent alone, or by the two working together. This was accomplished in the large majority of cases. Of the 643 children in the main experimental group, almost 600 were rated by teachers and more than 600 by parents. In about 25 cases, the ratings were received too late for tabulation. Ratings were also secured from teachers for 523 unselected children of control group A, described on page 177 to 178. 
The age distributions are given in Table 190. Table 190 is displayed on the page, age distribution of subjects given trait ratings. It was feared that many parents and teachers would hesitate to make the ratings, either because of the difficulty of the task or because of reluctance to record judgments of such confidential nature. The response, however, was far better than had been expected. Very few complained of the difficulty of making the ratings, and only in rare cases was a trait omitted. Relatively few judgments were recorded as rather uncertain or very uncertain. We cannot, of course, assume that the raters were always entirely frank, nor that their judgments were uninfluenced by the knowledge that the children of the gifted group had made high scores on an intelligence test. However, the ratings made by parents and teachers agree in so many respects as to indicate either considerable validity for both, or the operation of similar constant errors for both. Main ratings by age, sex, and intelligence. Ratings were scored 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on to 13, 1 being the highest possible rating, 7, average for age, and 13, the lowest possible. Figure 31, page 532, FF, gives, for each trait, the line of mean rating by age. The means of gifted children below the age of 6 years are omitted, because of the small numbers on which they were based. In these figures, a line of X's equals the parent's rating of gifted, dotted line equals teacher's rating of gifted, and straight line teacher's ratings of control. Figure 31 brings out a number of interesting facts. It will be seen that the gifted subjects are rated higher than the control on all the traits except mechanical ingenuity, in which trait the advantage is slightly with the control group. The superiority of the gifted is very great in general intelligence, originality, desire to know, common sense, sense of humour, and desire to excel. Rather marked in consciousness, truthfulness, self-confidence, willpower, and leadership, and in the other traits, rather small or irregular. In fondness for large groups, freedom from vanity or egotism, and mechanical ingenuity, the differences are much too small to be significant. The probable errors of the differences shown vary from age to age, but range chiefly between 0 0.20 and 0 0.40 of a score unit. Parents and teachers' ratings show considerable agreement. The parents rate probably higher than the teachers on appreciation of beauty, sense of humour and sympathy, somewhat higher on health, physical energy, fondness for large groups, leadership, popularity, generosity, desire to know and originality, and lower on prudence and permanence of moods. Parents and teachers rate about equally high on self-confidence, willpower, musical appreciation, cheerfulness, sensitiveness to approval or disapproval, desire to excel, vanity, conscientiousness, truthfulness, mechanical ingenuity, common sense, and general intelligence. Both by parents and teachers, the girls are rated a little higher than boys on many of the traits, on musical appreciation and appreciation of beauty, especially to a large extent on health, fondness for large groups, popularity, and desire to excel. As would be expected, they are rated lower than boys on mechanical ingenuity. Not many of the traits show consistent age trends, although the curves for boys, more often than those for girls, show a downward slope with increasing age. The standard deviations were computed separately for each age group and were found to run remarkably uniform. Mean ratings for ages combined. Inasmuch as the ratings are so little influenced by age, it is permissible to compare mean ratings for the ages combined. Table 191 gives both the means and the standard deviations for the combined ages. Table 191 is displayed on the page. Means and standard deviations of trait ratings for ages combined. The number of cases in each group in Table 191 is large, 250 to 350 and the probable errors of the differences correspondingly small, usually between 0 0.08 and 0 0.12 of a score unit. Accordingly, a difference of 0 0.30 between two means in Table 191 would ordinarily be two or three times the probable error of the difference. The classification of traits. The rather high reliability of the means makes possible instructive comparisons of the traits when they are classified by groups as physical, intellectual, social, moral, volitional, emotional, and special ability traits. 
Such comparisons may be readily made in figure 32. In this figure, the mean ratings for boys are shown on the left, those for girls on the right. For each sex, the middle vertical scale shows the teacher's ratings of the control group, the left-hand scale shows teacher's ratings of gifted, and the right-hand scale parents' ratings of gifted. Figure 32 is displayed on the page, mean trait ratings ages combined. Figure 32 shows that the traits classed together behave, on the whole, rather similarly. Teachers and parents are seen to agree strikingly with respect to the traits in which the gifted excel, and also with respect to the relative degrees of superiority shown by the different classes of traits. The order of superiority in the judgment of both is 1. Intellectual traits 2. Volitional 3. Emotional 4. Moral 5. Physical 6. Social in some cases, the data have suggested the appropriate classification of a trait, thus common sense, which one might be inclined to group with the social traits, behaves more like the intellectual traits, as therefore being classed with these. For similar reasons, self-confidence has been classified with the volitional rather than with the social traits, and sense of humour with the emotional rather than the intellectual. Perhaps sympathy, tenderness, and generosity, unselfishness, might with equal justification have been classed with either the moral or the social traits. We have placed them with the moral. The similar behaviour of the traits of a given class seems to justify deriving a composite rating for all of the traits of each class, omitting musical appreciation, appreciation of beauty, and mechanical ingenuity. Table 192 gives the means and standard deviations of the combined ratings on the traits of each of these classes. Table 192 is displayed on the page, mean ratings and standard deviations for each class of traits. The following percents of the gifted teacher's ratings exceed the mean of the control group of corresponding sex. Intellectual traits, boys 92%, girls 89%. Volitional traits, boys 81%, girls 82%. Emotional traits, boys 68%, girls 68%. Moral traits, boys 65%, girls 59%. Physical traits, boys 58%, girls 64%. Social traits, boys 58%, girls 59%. Figure 33 gives the means for each class of traits by age. Figure 33 is displayed on the page, age means for each class of traits. Figure 33 shows that parents rate consistently higher than teachers on the physical, moral and social traits and slightly higher on the intellectual traits. On the volitional and emotional traits, parents and teachers agree very closely. The mean ratings of girls increase with age in the case of volitional and moral traits, and do not decrease with age in the case of any of the traits. Ratings of boys on volitional and physical traits tend to decrease slightly with age. Influence of the generosity factor in trait ratings there is little doubt that the unselected subjects of the control group, if they had in all cases been correctly rated, would have yielded a mean of approximately 7, or average for age, on the rating plan. It is seen in Table 191, however, that the control boys are rated above 7 on every trait except prudence, and control girls above 7 on every trait except mechanical ingenuity. The highest mean for both sexes of the control group is on cheerfulness and optimism. 5.57 for boys and 5.31 for girls. Each of these means is about one standard deviation higher than it ought to be, and for several other traits, the mean is displaced upward by one half standard deviation or more. We may term this constant influence the generosity factor. It may be a special instance of halo effect due in this case to the natural affection of the teachers for their pupils and of the parents of their offspring. There is little doubt that we always tend to overrate those we like, the tendency being stronger in the case of some traits than others. When we are rating those we dislike, the generosity factor probably operates negatively. The relative influence of the generosity factor on the mean ratings for various traits is strikingly shown on the middle vertical line throughout figure 32. In the case of the intellectual traits, the influence is lacking for originality and is only moderately large for the other traits. Turning to the volitional traits, we see that the factor does not enter into the ratings of boys on prudence, 
but is very large on the readings of girls who desire to excel. In the case of the other volitional traits, its influence is also marked, and about equal for girls and boys. The readings of moral traits are somewhat more influenced by the generosity factor, especially in the case of girls. The outstanding fact in figure 32 is a large influence with both sexes on ratings for cheerfulness. In the case of the social traits, the generosity factor is somewhat more evident in the ratings of girls than in those of boys, but with both sexes is entirely lacking for the trait leadership. The influence is moderate for the physical traits, but is greater for general health than for physical energy. It does not enter at all into the ratings of boys on the special ability traits, but it affects the ratings of girls considerably, although negatively in the case of mechanical ability. It is probably safe to assume that the relative influence of the generosity factor upon the various trait ratings is much the same for the gifted as for the control, although the absolute amount of influence may be greater or less. Probably for most of the traits it is greater, especially the ratings by parents. Whatever the intelligence of a group, it enters more into the ratings of girls than of boys, a fact which must be taken into account in any comparison of the sexes with respect to trait ratings or school marks. Overlapping of gifted and control on personality traits. Although a comparison of gifted and control in terms of overlapping can only be justified on the assumption that the generosity factor has operated equally with both groups, an assumption which is not always in accord with the facts, nevertheless such comparisons are present at Table 193, for whatever they may be worth. Table 193 is displayed on the page, percent of gifted teachers' ratings who equal or exceed the mean of the control group of corresponding sex and trait ratings. Rank orders of the traits for the various groups. Although comparisons of absolute rating scores are to a considerable extent invalidated by the halo and generosity factors, it is still possible to ascertain from the rank order of the main ratings in what traits the gifted are high or low as compared with their standing in the other traits. The means given in Table 191 yield the following rating orders of the traits for the various groups. Table 194 Compared with the control boys, the gifted boys are rated relatively highest in originality, desire to know, general intelligence, prudence, and willpower. They are relatively lower in fondness for large groups, freedom from vanity, and cheerfulness. The facts are much the same for the gifted girls, although with them self-confidence and sense of humour take a higher rank than with the control, and sympathy and sensitiveness to approval a lower rank. Table 194 is displayed on the page, rank orders of the traits according to mean trait ratings for the various groups. Correlations 1 and 2 show a considerable agreement between parents and teachers with respect to the traits in which the gifted group most excel the control group. Comparisons of correlations 3 and 4 shows that gifted boys resemble control boys more than gifted girls resemble control girls. From correlations 5, 6 and 7, it is seen that sex differences are more marked to the control group than in the gifted group. This is due chiefly to the fact that gifted girls diverge from the control girls in the direction of the masculine. Unevenness of ratings for the individual children. Ratings of the kind with which we are here dealing are always vitiated to a greater or less extent by the halo effect. The reader's general good or bad opinion of the subject being rated tends to colour all his judgments of that person. The effect, of course, is to reduce the variability of the ratings. Conversely, the greater the variability of the 25 ratings for a given subject, the more successful the rater has probably been in making real discriminations. In the case of our 10-year-old subjects, both gifted and control, we have computed for each child the standard deviation of the 25 ratings given by the teacher. The means of the standard deviations may be taken as an index of the amount of discrimination the teachers have exercised in their ratings, or the extent to which they have resisted the halo factor. The means and standard deviations of these standard deviations are as follows. Gifted boys, teachers, mean 2.04, standard deviation, 0.52. Gifted girls, teachers, mean 2.09, standard deviation, 0.62. Control boys, teachers, mean 1.48, standard deviation, 0.54. Control girls, teachers, 
mean 1.62, standard deviation 0.54. Control girls teachers, mean 1.62, standard deviation 0.44. Gifted boys parents, mean 2.22, standard deviation 0.47. Gifted girls parents, mean 2.15, standard deviation 0.38. On the whole, it appears that the ratings have been made with considerable discrimination. That the mean variability of individual ratings is greater for the gifted group than for the control group does not necessarily mean that the ratings of the gifted group are less influenced by the halo effect. The gifted child may tend, on the average, to greater unevenness with respect to the 25 traits in question. This would necessarily be the case if many of the traits were positively correlated with intelligence, but to different degrees. Since the gifted children are highly selected for intelligence, they would tend to rate considerably above the control group on those traits highly correlated with intelligence, somewhat above the control group on the traits moderately correlated with intelligence, and not at all above on the traits not correlated with intelligence. In other words, the unequal correlation of the various traits with intelligence warrants the expectation that the gifted child will be somewhat more uneven in these traits than the unselected child. The figures given above are in harmony with this expectation. Certainty of Judgments It will be recalled that each reader was asked to indicate the certainty of each judgment by undertaking one of the phrases very certain, fairly certain, rather uncertain, very uncertain. The responses were scored 1, 2, 3 or 4 respectively and were averaged for each trait by age, sex and intelligence group. It was expected that the younger children would be rated with much less feeling of confidence than the older. However, the average mean certainty by age for the 25 gifted traits showed only insignificant age differences. Table 195, giving mean certainties for the individual traits, ages combined, makes possible interesting comparisons of the relative difficulty experienced by parents and teachers in rating the various traits in question. The figures in parenthesis give the rank orders of the traits with respect to the feeling of certainty with which they are rated. Table 195 shows that boys and girls are rated with about equal certainty. As would be expected, parents rate the gifted with more certainty than teachers rate them. This holds for every trait. The teachers rate the gifted with more certainty than they rate the control. The latter finding would indicate that the gifted child, on the average, has more positive and striking personality than the average child or at least that the teacher feels she knows the gifted child better. Table 195 is displayed on the page, mean certainty of ratings. Traits which stand out as especially easy or difficult to rate are the following with rank orders. Easy to rate, general intelligence, desire to know, desire to excel. Difficult to rate, musical appreciation, appreciation of beauty, permanence of moods, sympathy, generosity, mechanical ingenuity. In Table 195, the rank order of certainty in the ratings of gifted is higher for parents than for teachers in the case of health, sympathy, appreciation of beauty, and sense of humour. It is lower in the case of prudence, popularity, conscientiousness, and freedom from vanity. Comparing the rank orders of certainty for teachers' ratings of gifted and control, we find that gifted children are relatively, though not absolutely, harder to rate on popularity, sensitiveness, or approval or disapproval, conscientiousness, desire to know, originality, and common sense. Comparison of Table 195 with Table 191 discloses a marked correlation between mean rating score and mean certainty for the individual traits. That is, the higher a child is rated, the greater is the indicated certainty. This holds to a much greater extent for the gifted than for the control. In rating the gifted, the tendency is, in the case of uncertainty, to rate the child down close to average. The rank order correlations between mean rating and mean certainty, rank orders of traits and tables 191 and 195 are as follows. Gifted boys, teachers, 0.755, standard deviation, 0.06. Gifted girls, teachers, 0.717, standard deviation, 0.07. Control boys, teachers, 0.314, standard deviation, 0.13. Control girls, teachers, 0.239, standard deviation, 0.13. Gifted boys, parents, 0.831, standard deviation, 0.04. Gifted girls, parents, 0.796, standard deviation, 0.05. These correlations would indicate 
that judges with more knowledge of the gifted subjects would have rated them even higher than they were rated. It may be, however, that the correlation is due to another cause. It is possible that, when the rater could not considerably rate the subject high, there was a subconscious tendency to rate the certainty of the judgment low, by way of apology, so to speak. Relative Variability of the Sexes in Trait Ratings The relative variability of the sexes in the trait ratings is best indicated by comparison of boys and girls of the control group in those traits which are rated with the greatest certainty of judgment. The ten traits which in the case of the control group are rated with greatest confidence are, in order, desire to excel, freedom from vanity, popularity, sensitiveness to approval or disapproval, general intelligence, physical energy, conscientiousness, willpower and perseverance, truthfulness and cheerfulness or optimism. For these, the Pearson coefficients of variability for ages 8 and 12 of the control group are as shown in Table 196. Table 196 is displayed on the page, Sex Variability in Trait Ratings. In the 20 comparisons, the boys are more variable in 8, the girls in 7, and in 5 there is no difference. There is here no consistent evidence of sex difference in variability. Reliability of the Ratings We have seen that parents and teachers agree fairly well in regard to the order of the traits based upon the degree of superiority of the gifted over the control. Rho equals 0 0.70. It is also important to know how well two equally competent judges would agree in rating the same children on a given trait by the method in question. A comparison of the judgments of two teachers on the same children would give the best answer to the question of reliability, but unfortunately such data are not available. The only comparison of this kind we are able to make, that between the ratings of parents and teachers, is rather unsatisfactory for two reasons. 1. Parents and teachers observe the children under very different environment. 2. Ordinarily a given parent or teacher rated only one child, and the standards of judgment of various readers doubtless varied greatly. Both of the factors operate to lower the true correlation. Time has not allowed us to correlate parents and teachers' ratings of the gifted for each of the 25 traits for all the age groups. Instead, we have taken a single age group, 10-year-old boys, and correlated the mean rating by parents on each of the following groups of traits with mean rating by teachers on the corresponding group of traits. Intellectual, volitional, moral, physical, emotional, and social. This procedure is justified by the data already presented, page 539 FF, showing the similar behavior of the various traits classed in any one of these groups. The computation was not made for the miscellaneous group of special ability traits, musical appreciation, appreciation of beauty, and mechanical ingenuity, as an average rating on such traits would have little meaning. The Pearson correlations are as follows. Intellectual traits, 0.285, standard deviation, 0 0.08. Volitional traits, 0.278, standard deviation, 0 0.08. Moral traits, 0 0.303, standard deviation, 0 0.08. Physical traits, 0 0.324, standard deviation, 0 0.08. Emotional traits, 0 0.271, standard deviation, 0 0.08. Social traits, 0 0.178, standard deviation, 0 0.085. Summary 1. Data have been reported on the ratings made by teachers and parents of nearly 600 children of the main gifted group, and on the ratings made by teachers of more than 500 unselected children composing a control group. Each child was rated by the graphical rating scale method on 25 traits, falling roughly into seven groups intellectual, volitional, emotional, moral, social, physical, and special ability traits. The degree of certainty felt in regard to each judgment was recorded. Means and standard deviations were computed by age, sex and intelligence. 2. Parents and teachers were found to agree strikingly with respect to the traits in which the gifted excel. The order, according to degree of superiority of the gifted, is 1. Intellectual 2. Volitional 3. Emotional 4. Moral 5. Physical 6. Social traits 
Mechanical ingenuity is the only trait on which the control group is rated higher than the gifted group. 3. The rank order of the individual traits according to the degree of superiority of gifted over control as shown by teachers' judgments correlates 0 0.70 with that based upon parents' judgments. Parents, however, rate the gifted children on the average slightly higher than do teachers, and both parents and teachers rate girls slightly higher than boys on a majority of traits. 4. The Pearson correlation of teachers' mean ratings with parents' mean rating for the traits of a single group, intellectual, volitional, moral, social, etc., is about 0 0.30. 5. A constant error due to the generosity factor is evident from the fact that the mean rating of the control group on a majority of the traits is higher than the hypothetical norm designated as average for age. The displacement of the mean for this cause amounts to half a standard deviation for several of the traits, but varies greatly from trait to trait. It is considerably greater for girls than for boys. 6. That considerable discrimination was exercised by the raters is shown by the standard deviations of the 25 ratings for individual children. On the whole, more discrimination was exercised in the ratings of gifted than in those of the control group. The amount of discrimination is an inverse measure of the magnitude of halo effects. 7. The indicator certainty of rating judgments on most of the traits runs fairly high and varies little with age or sex. Parents express greater confidence in their judgments than do teachers, and teachers rate the gifted with more confidence than they rate the control. There is a positive correlation between ratings and certainty of ratings. This is much higher for the gifted than for the control. 8. Consistent sex differences with respect to variability in trait ratings are not found. End of section 19. Section 20 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1, Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children, by Lewis Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 19. Summary of Data on 309 Gifted High School Students. The Data. The purpose of this chapter is to summarize some of the more important data which have been secured for a group of 309 gifted subjects located in the high school survey described in Chapter 2. These subjects belong to the group designated as Group 2. Group 2 is at the present writing, composed of 378 subjects, all of whom were selected on the basis of group test scores, 370 on the term of group test, 6 on the Army Alpha, and 2 on the National. This group may not be quite as highly selected for intelligence, nor as homogeneous as the main experimental group. It is probable that the terminal group test is more subject to the influence of schooling, environment, and previous acquaintance with the tests than is the Stanford Binet. Although the procedures to be used in locating and testing the subjects were laid down in considerable detail, the fact that so many high school faculties participated in the survey with but little immediate supervision necessary affects the value of the results. However, 87 of the 309 subjects were located by the regular field assistants by a uniform procedure. Although the summary here presented is confined to a few of the most important items of information secured, it will be noted that the findings are throughout in general harmony with those for the main experimental group. Effort was made to secure the following items of information for each subject of the high school group. 1. Term and group test score. 2. Score on the general information test. 3. The questionnaire test on plays, games and amusements. 4. Record of books read during a period of two months. 5. Child's report on the interest blank. 6. Parents report on the home information blank. 7. Teacher's report on the school information blank. Item 1 was secured for all. Items 3 and 5 for about 90% of the group, and the remaining items for only 76%. In addition, anthropometric measurements and medical examinations were secured for about 100 cases, or a third of all. All of the above items involved the use of the same blanks as were used in connection with the main experimental group. 
Perhaps the blanks were as suitable for one group as for the other, but for several reasons the data which they gave are probably less accurate for the high school group than for the main group. 1. The supervision of the child's work on items 2 to 5 was not entirely uniform. 2. The teachers were probably not well acquainted with their pupils, as is the average teacher in the elementary grades. 3. Since the high school subjects were older, the memory errors of parents in reporting facts regarding early development are likely to be greater. 4. Controlled data were not available. These serious disadvantages are only in part counterbalanced by the fact that the more fully developed personality of the child of high school age makes possible greater accuracy of report on many items concerning which information was sought from parents and teachers. The medical examinations, the anthropometric measurements, and the data on plays, games, and amusements have not been summarized for this group. The data on the home blank, school blank, and interest blank have been summarized only in part. The reading interests of the group have been dealt with in Chapter 15. The data which have been analysed agree so closely with the results set forth for the main group that it has not seemed necessary to carry the analysis further than has been done. Intellectual Composition of the Group It will be recorded that the method of selection required 1. That each high school teacher nominate the brightest, second brightest, and youngest pupil in each of her classes and two, that all the pupils thus nominated be given a terminal group test. The minimum TGT scores necessary for inclusion in the group are found on page 37. The standards of admission were based upon an examination of age distributions of TGT scores reported for more than 100 high schools throughout the country, and were intended to yield subjects who would rank within the top 1% of the general child population, or within the top 2% of the high school population. The scores earned are shown in Table 197. Table 197 is displayed on the page Terminal Group Test Scores of 309 High School Pupils. Since the high school survey was completed, 48 of the subjects, chiefly of this group, have taken the Thorndike Intelligence Examination for entrance to Stanford University. Their Thorndike scores ranged from 68 to 113, with an average of 89. The average score of entering students at Stanford over a period of two years was 71, and only about 8% score as high as the average of those who have entered from the gifted group. The average score of 14 Stanford professors on the same test was 95. Sex Proportions The 309 subjects were distributed by age and sex as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing boys, girls, and total to the number at each age. The proportion is 64.7% boys to 35.3% girls, or in the ratio of 183 boys to 100 girls. This is to be compared with the ratio of 116 boys to 100 girls in the main experimental group. See Chapter 3. In both groups, the preponderance of boys is marked, but is far greater in the high school group and is found at every age. The excess of boys in the high school group, as compared with the main experimental, pre-high school group, might be explained as due to one or more of the following factors. 1. Nominations in the grades below the high school were practically all made by women teachers, while roughly a third of the nominations in the high school were made by men teachers. It might be supposed that the latter would be more inclined to favour boys in their nominations. Unfortunately, the nomination blanks used in the high schools were not always returned to us with the other data, and it was impossible to determine whether a sex preference had entered into the nominations. 2. The term in a group test may do injustice to the intelligence of girls. This hypothesis is contradicted by the fact that mean TGT scores of unselected girls of ages 12, 13 and 14 have been found to be about as high as those for unselected boys. 3. It may be that the excess of boys in all gifted groups is due to greater male variability. Considerable evidence could be assembled from test results in support of this hypothesis, but the findings are far from consistent. 4. It may be that the mental development of boys continues after that of girls has ceased, which, if true, 
could give a marked excess of gifted boys in the upper ages. This may account for the difference between high school group and main experimental group in sex ratio, although the increase by age in the ratio of boys to girls is not as regular and consistent as this hypothesis would lead one to expect. Whatever the cause, it seems that in the years of middle and latter adolescence there is a large excess of high-scoring boys. In the case of Stanford students given the Thorndike Intelligence Examination, the 99th percentile for 754 consecutive male entrants was 105.7, and for 150 consecutive female entrants, 99.7. Notwithstanding the fact that women students at Stanford, owing to the limitation of 500 in their number, are far more highly selected than the men. Only one woman tested as high as 110, while six men made scores ranging from 110 to 124. Book's survey of 5,748 seniors in the high schools of Indiana, based upon a test somewhat similar to the Army Alpha, also gave a significant excess of high-scoring boys, especially in the upper ages. Dr. Yates, using the Army Alpha and the Terman Group test, located the 25 brightest seniors in five Oakland high schools. Her group yielded 15 boys and 10 girls, a ratio of 150 to 100. Geographical Location of Pupils Requests for cooperation were sent to all the high schools in the state, numbering at that time, autumn 1921, approximately 364. The principals of 103 agreed to cooperate and were supplied with the requisite blanks and instructions. A report was made to us by 95 schools, having a total enrollment of approximately 70,000 pupils. The schools may be grouped by counties as follows. A table is played on the page comparing the division to the counties included. The following countries, having a total enrollment of 6,465 high school pupils, were not surveyed. A table is played on the page comparing counties with the number not surveyed. Table 198 shows comparative percentages of pupils qualifying in the various geographical divisions, and Table 199, the percent qualifying in high schools of various sizes. The figures of both these tables are affected by so many unknown factors that they are rather misleading. Table 198 is displayed on the page, Percentages of Gifted High School Subjects by Geographical Location. In the first place, it cannot be assumed that the research was equally thorough in all the schools. The procedure may not always have been exactly uniform, and even apart from this, it is probable that pupils in the smaller schools stood a better chance of being discovered from the mere fact that their teachers knew them better. In some of the schools, all the pupils were tested. In others, only those nominated according to instructions. Possibly in the case of a few high schools, not all the four grades were covered. Finally, there are probably some inconsistencies in the reports of enrollment, according to whether part-time students were or were not included. Possibly in a few cases, 7th and 8th grade pupils of junior high schools were erroneously included in the enrollment reports. Nevertheless, the figures are given for whatever they may be worth. The totals of Table 199 do not agree with those of Table 198. This is due to the omission from Table 199 of certain schools for which the percentages were known not to be representative, owing to incompleteness of the survey or to other distributing factors. Table 199 is displayed on the page, Percentages of Qualifying Subjects in High Schools of Various Sizes. It will be noted that someone less than one-half of 1% 1 of the pupils enrolled in these high schools qualified. According to this figure, the total enrollment of 220,000 in California high schools in 1921-22 might have yielded about 1,000 cases of the desired degree of superiority. However, we cannot safely assume that the proportion of gifted would have been the same in the schools not covered and there is no way to estimate the number who were missed in the schools that were covered. Perhaps a liberal estimate would be that not more than one pupil in a hundred in the high schools of California could have qualified. However, since high school students are in a group rather highly selected, it is probable that most of these 309 subjects belong to the top one-half of 1% 1 of the total child population 
of their representative ages in California. This would make the group only a little less highly selected than the main experimental group. Ancestry Information was given in the home blank regarding the ancestry of 241 of the 309 subjects. The data were treated as were the corresponding data for the main group, one unit of weight being assigned to each of the great-grandparents. The results are shown in Table 200. American, in this table, means descended from the old American stock, usually colonial, not clearly specified. Probably in a large majority of cases, it means English. The percents are sums of the blood percent of each nationality. Table 200 is displayed on the page, Nationality Origin of Gifted Children in the High School Group. Table 201 shows the percent of subjects in the group who are represented in the various nationalities by at least one parent, one grandparent, or one great-grandparent. Table 201 is displayed on the page, Number and Percent of Children Representing Various Nationalities. Figure 34 is displayed on the page, both places of parents and grandparents of high school gifted group. The above figures, like those for the main group, cannot be accurately interpreted in the absence of comparative figures for the general population. However, certain facts stand out as clearly significant. For example, in Table 200, the high percentage of English, Scotch, German, Irish, Dutch and Jewish blood, and the low percentage of Spanish and Italian. The Spanish percentage, 0.13%, is especially low in comparison with the amount of Spanish blood in the general population. No Negro blood is represented. The birthplaces of 242 subjects were stated. Of this number, exactly half were born outside of California, of whom seven were born outside the United States. Table 202 gives the birthplaces of 482 parents and 609 grandparents. This table and accompanying map, figure 34, are extremely interesting. These children are drawn to the main from seven national stocks, coming originally from Northwest Europe and from the Jewish racial stock who have immigrated from Russia and Germany. Table 202 is displayed on the page, both places of parents and grandparents of high school gifted group. The movement of the representatives of these stocks to California has been very rapid and they have come, one, direct from Europe, two, direct from the Northeast United States or three from the northeast United States, with one or more stops in the Central Valley. The Latin stocks and races, other than the Caucasian, are for all practical purposes unrepresented. While this, in no sense, proves their inferiority, it renders such, our hypothesis, reasonable. Of parents, 409, or 86.7%, were born in the United States, and of these, 388 80.2% of all were born outside of California. There were 22 cases in which both parents were foreign-born, and 28 in which one was foreign-born. Of grandparents, 63% were born in the United States, and 94% of the entire number outside of California. Of the grandparent couples, both members were foreign-born in 27.3% of cases, and one member in 11.4% of cases. Occupational Background for 235 children, information was obtained regarding the various occupations which the father, mother, uncles, aunts and grandparents had followed. This information is summarised in Table 203. As would be expected, the data are less complete for uncles, aunts and grandparents than for parents. The most common occupation of maternal relative, that of housewife, is not included in Table 203. Attention is called to the fact that the figures included for a given relative all the main occupations which that relative has followed. If a count has been taken only of the last occupation followed, the showing would ordinarily have been even better than it was. The percents of Table 203 are, therefore, not percents of individuals, but percents of all occupations which have been followed. A quantitative index of the occupational background has been obtained by rating on the bar scale of occupational intelligence each occupation named. Mr. Willoughby attempted a refinement of this index by a system of weights which gave greater value to the occupation of a parent than of a grandparent or parent's sib, and greater value to the present than to an early occupation of the father. Table 203 is displayed on the page, Occupations followed by relatives of high school group. 
However, when such a system of weights was applied to a sampling of families, the resulting occupational index differed by only about 7% from that based upon all unweighted average. Accordingly, the index of occupational background used was simply the average bar ratings of all the occupations which parents, grandparents, uncles and aunts had followed. This mean index found was 11.8 as compared with an average of 8.8 for the general population of San Francisco, Oakland and Los Angeles. For the derivation of occupational index for general population, see Chapter 4. The average of 11.8 is slightly lower than that found for the fathers of the children of the main group, 12.77. This would be expected in view of the fact that for the high school group, the index is based upon all the occupations which have been followed by near relatives, not upon the present occupation of the father. Occupations which rate approximately the same as the average of all occupations for relatives of the high school group are stenographer, 11.7, librarian in a small library, 12.0, the graduate nurse, 12.0. Figure 35 gives a distribution of the occupational background indices for the 235 children, the index for each child being the average rating of all near relatives. It will be noted that only a single child has an occupational background index below the average bar rating of 8.8 .8 found in Chapter 4 for the general male adult population. One may conclude that if the father of a gifted child follows a lowly occupation, the probability is that the average occupational rating of his other near relatives will be higher. That is, in such a case, the family stock is probably somewhat better than the humble occupation of the father would suggest. Figure 35 is displayed on the page, occupational background indices and bar ratings of preferred occupations. Health and physical data. Although medical examinations and anthropometric measurements were given to approximately 100 of the high school subjects, the only data here summarized are those furnished by the home blank and school blank. Health and energy ratings. Parents and teachers rated the subjects on the 25 traits named in chapter 18 and by the same method. The ratings on general health and on physical energy are summarized in table 204. In this case, the ratings were scored from 1 to 7, 1 being the highest rating, 7 lowest, and 4 average. The certainty of ratings was scored from 1 to 4, 1 meaning very certain, 2 fairly certain, 3 rather uncertain, and 4 very uncertain. Table 204 is displayed on the page, Health and Energy Ratings of High School Group. That is, both parents and teachers, with a rather high degree of certainty regarding the correctness of their judgments, rate these subjects considerably above average in health and physical energy. The mean rating for the girls is appreciably higher than that for the boys on both traits. In health, only 4% were rated by the parents more than half a step below average, and only 5.5% by the teachers. In energy, the parents rate 2% this low. The teacher is 7%. Age of parents at birth of child. The mean age of father at birth of child was 324, of mother 29.1. The distribution of ages is as follows. A small table is played on the page comparing the father to the mother to ages and mean. Duration of pregnancy. This was normal in 90% of cases. 14 or 6% of the births were reported as premature by one half month or more. 8 or 3.4% were reported as overtime. Mother's health during pregnancy. Statements made on this point were converted into ratings on a 5-point scale, 1 signifying excellent, 3 average and 5 very poor. The distribution of the ratings was as follows. Rating 1. Frequency 59. Rating 2, frequency 107. Rating 3, frequency 42. Rating 4, frequency 23. Rating 5, frequency 6. Mean 2.2. Conditions of birth. Birth was described as difficult, severe, prolonged, instrumental delivery, etc. for 55% of boys and 33% of girls. As easy for 9% of boys and 12% of girls. 
The more important cases of difficult birth were as follows. A list is displayed on the page with difficult birth symptoms. Birth weight. Birth weights reported ranged from 3 to 15 pounds, with an average of 8 pounds 6.4 ounces for boys and 8 pounds 3.2 ounces for girls. These figures, like those for the main group, are considerably above the average, especially the mean for girls. Infant feeding. Approximately 91% of the children were at least partially breastfed, and about 65% were exclusively breastfed for a period of 10 months or longer. These figures are even higher than those for the main group. Health during first year. Statements on this point have been converted into ratings on a five-point scale with the following results. A table is played on the page comparing the rating for boys and girls to the score. Dentition, walking and talking. The mean age of appearance for first tooth was 7.3 months for boys and 7.2 months for girls. The range was from 5 to 14 months. Table 205 gives the distribution of ages for walking alone, several steps, and table 204 for talking, short sentences. Owing to the descriptive terms used in the blank, the data of table 205 are, unfortunately, not comparable with data which have been reported from selected children. They are, however, comparable with the data of a main group of gifted subjects. Chapter 8. The agreement with the latter is very close. Table 205 is displayed on the page, age of walking alone, several steps, high school group. And table 206 is displayed on the page, age of talking, short sentences, high school group. The figures for dentition agree very closely with those for the main group, but those for walking and talking are much lower for the high school group. The fact that a baby book was kept by the mother for 35% of the boys and for 32% of the girls is of interesting connection with the question of accuracy of data furnished by the home blank on this and other items of information relating to the early development of these subjects. Organic diseases reported by teachers. Information reported by the teachers on this point is probably very incomplete and inaccurate, as health records based upon examination by school physician or school nurse were available for only 40% of the boys and 71% of the girls. Few indications of imperfect health were reported, and many of these were of minor importance. In all, 20 or 8% were reported for organic defects, several of which had been outgrown. These were as follows. Heart trouble, not described, 8 cases. Heart trouble, slight or outgrown, 4 cases. Indications of lung trouble, 2 cases. Apparent recovery from tuberculosis, one case. Kidneys weak, one case. Former kidney trouble, one case. Stomach trouble, two cases. Asthma, one case. Symptoms of general weakness. One or more such symptoms were reported by the home for 13% of the boys, 14% of the girls, and 13.6% of total. By the school for 21% of boys, 19% of girls, and 20% of total. The main symptoms reported under this heading have been grouped as follows. 1. Thin, slight, underweight, etc. 4. Reported by the home. 15. Reported by the school. 2. Rapid growth, lack of energy. Easily fatigued, low vitality, etc. 5. Reported by the home. 8. Reported by the school. 3. Anemia, poor appetite, indigestion, biliousness, stomach trouble, etc. 2. Reported by the home. 5. Reported by the school. 4. Colds, catara, asthma, etc. 6. Reported by the home. 1. Reported by the school. In addition to the symptoms listed above, the home reported one case of each of the following. Subnormal temperature, tonsil trouble, headaches, bad teeth. Other symptoms reported by the school included from 1 to 2 cases of each of the following. Poor colour, eye trouble, legs not developed, nervous, boils, acne, overweight, and perfect recovery from injury to skull. Vision and hearing. According to school reports, 49% of the boys and 50% of the girls have had the eyes tested. School reports rate the vision as follows. A table is played on the page comparing the boys and girls to the rating for vision. Of boys and girls combined, the school rates the vision of 27.9% as either somewhat defective 
or very poor. The home, 22.3%. Of the boys with a defective vision, home reports, 90% wear glasses either part or all of the time. Of the girls with defective vision, 75%. Reports from the school agree closely with those of the home on this point. Hearing was rated by their teachers as follows. A table is split on the page comparing the ratings for boys and girls. Ratings on nutrition. Nutrition was rated by the parents as follows. A table is split on the page comparing the ratings for boys and girls. History of serious digestive trouble was reported by the parents for 15% of the boys and 16.8% of the girls. Headaches. The following data on frequency of headaches were reported by the parents. Table of the page displaying the comparisons of boys to girls. Respiratory troubles. Information on persistent mouth breathing was reported both by parents and teachers. Table displayed on the page comparing the parents' ratings for boys and girls to the teachers' rating for boys and girls. Both parents and teachers reported on adenoid and tonsil trouble, but the information of the teachers was evidently very incomplete, as they reported only about two-thirds as many cases as the parents. The following figures are based upon the information furnished by parents. A table is played on the page comparing the boys' and girls' percentile ratings for tonsils. Parents report as follows on the frequency of colds. A table is played on the page comparing the boys' and girls' ratings. The teachers report 13.5% of the boys, 15% of the girls, or 14% of the total group is having colds frequently or very frequently. The corresponding figures for the parents' reports are almost identical, 13.6%. 15.9% and 14.5%. Nervous symptoms. The question, is child especially nervous, was answered affirmatively by parents and teachers as follows. A table is played on the page comparing the ratings by its percentage by parents and teachers. The symptoms of nervousness mentioned were frequently described as slight or outgrown and belong to such types as those reported for the main group. Chapter 8. Parents report five boys, 3.3%, and no girls as having had a history of stuttering. All but one of these, five cases are described as mild. The school reports five boys and three girls, and describes seven of the eight cases as mild, outgrown, or occasional. Parents report two cases of chorea, both boys. One occurred at age six and was very mild, the other at seven and was severe. Parents report a history of habitual muscular twitching for seven boys, 4.6%, and four girls, 4.5%. Mild tendency to worry is reported as follows. By parents, for 6% of boys, and 9% of girls. By the school, for 4.5% of boys, and 12.5% of girls. More than half the cases of worry were ascribed to causes relating to the school. There were three children described as overly consciousness or as having too great desire to excel all of whom were girls. The parents report 6 boys, 4%, and 10 girls, 11.4%, as having a history of marked fears. Most of these have been outgrown. Parents report 9 boys, 6%, and 7 girls, 8%, as having had a night terrors, for the most part occasional or mild. Sleep. Only three boys and two girls were reported as not sleeping well. The boys sleep on average nine hours and ten minutes daily. The girls, nine hours and fifteen minutes, or about a quarter of an hour above the term and hockey norms for unselected children. The average time spent in bed is about nine minutes more than this. Contagious diseases. Table 207 gives the percent reported by the parents as having had various contagious diseases and the proportion of cases described as severe. Table 207 is displayed on the page, Incidence of Contagious Diseases in High School Group. The fact that of these 242 children living in one of the most unhealthful states in the Union, 31 should have had scarlet fever, 9 diphtheria, 7 typhoid, 6 smallpox, and 3 infantile paralysis, indicates that these early preventable diseases are responsible for the loss of a considerable number of gifted individuals in the country as a whole. Accidents Accidents of greater or less severity were reported for 47.8% of boys and 24.1% of girls. Bone fractures have been suffered by 13.6% of boys and 10% of girls. 
sexual maturity. The information on this point for the girls relates to age of first menstruation as reported by the parents. The number having reached any given age who have matured before that age is as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing the age to the numbers who have reached puberty. The above figures like those given in Chapter 8 for the main group indicate that intellectually gifted girls tend to mature considerably earlier on the average than unselected girls. The question asked parents regarding age which change of voice occurred with boys was too often misunderstood to justify a statistical summary of the replies. Educational History School Progress The age grade status of the 309 children at the time they were located is shown in Table 208. Table 208 is displayed on the page Age Grade Status of High School Gift Group. Regarding children who are 14 years old, but not yet 16, as normally advanced for the ninth grade, children of 15, but not yet 17, as normally advanced for the 10th, etc., we have the following percentages of retarded, normal, and accelerated progress. Boys, 8.5% retarded, 48.5% normal, 43% accelerated, 15.5% accelerated two years or more. Girls, 0 retarded, 45% normal, 55% accelerated, 15% accelerated two years or more. Kindergarten was attended by 35% of boys and 33% of girls. The average period of kindergarten attendance for these has been almost exactly a school year. 15 entered school in the second grade, 7 in the third, 6 in the fourth, and 3 in the fifth. The mean age of school entrance above kindergarten was 6.2 years for boys and 6.4 years for girls. One child entered the first grade at 4 and 25 at 5. One entered the second grade and one the third grade at 5. One entered the third and one the fourth at 6. The detailed facts are shown in Table 209 regarding the 231 subjects for whom report was made. Table 209 is displayed on the page. Age and grade of high school gifted group on entering school. Strictly speaking, one may consider the child retarded who does not enter the first grade before seven, a second before eight, etc. On this basis, 44 children in table 209 were retarded on entrance. On the usual basis of figuring, which is more lenient by one year, only three were retarded. Of the 44 who, in the strict standard, were retarded, there were 17 who at the time of this investigation had not made up any of this initial handicap. This shows the marked tendency to lockstep in the average public school. If we include initial skipping at school entrance, 68% of the boys and 73% of the girls have skipped one or more half grades. The boys have skipped an average of 2.8 half grades, the girls 2.4 half grades. There were 17 children who had repeated a half grade, but none who had repeated two half grades. According to the statements of parents, 19% of the boys and 24% of the girls have been encouraged to forge ahead. 74% of boys and 69% of girls have been allowed to take their own pace, and 7% of both boys and girls have been held back. These statements refer entirely to the attitude of the parents. 33 of the children have attended two schools, 63, 3, 53, 4, 55, 5, 28, 6, and 1 each, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 15. The average number of schools attended was 4.1. School attendance has been fairly regular for the large majority. The average number of days lost during the past year, based on parents' estimates, was 5.8 for boys and 8.6 for girls. For girls of ages 13, 14 and 15 combined, the average loss of time was 7.6 days. For girls of ages 16, 17 and 18 combined, 9.3. The reports indicate that this increase is probably due to mental troubles. Liking for school was rated by the parents as follows. Boys, number 152. 60% very strong, 36% fairly strong, 3% slight liking, 1% positive dislike. Girls, number 87. 70% very strong, 28% fairly strong, 2% slight liking, 0 positive dislike. The boys were devoting on an average 5.9 hours per week to the home study of school lessons at the time of the investigation, the girls 6.8 hours. The older children of both sexes were devoting about an hour a week more to home study than were the younger children. 
Of the boys, 53% learned to read before starting to school. Of the girls, 47.5%. Four learned to read before the age of four years and 14 before five. The number of books in the homes from which these children come ranges from 0 to 3,500 volumes, with an average of 380. There were 24 home libraries of the 1,000 volumes or more, and 15 or fewer than 50. 57% of the boys and 46% of the girls had shown unusual interest in encyclopedias. 53% of the boys and 23% of the girls in atlases. 41.5% of the boys and 34% of the girls in dictionaries. Table 210 shows the number of children of the 242 for whom reports were available, who were taking private instruction in various subjects. Also, the parents' rating of ability shown in such instruction. It will be noted that a very superior ability is shown in these special subjects by only 7 boys and 7 girls, or 6% and 7%, respectively, of the number taking special instruction. Table 210 is displayed on the page, Special Subjects Studied and Ability Shown by High School Group. The parents were asked to state what principles or rules guided them in regard to 1. Answering the child's questions 2. Stimulating desire to learn 3. Other matters they had considered important in the training of their children. On the first point, 212 answers were recorded, of which 187 were unreservedly affirmative, fully, carefully, to the best of my ability, thoughtfully, seriously, immediately, etc. The remaining were affirmative, but with some qualification. In regard to 2. Stimulating desire to learn, 176 answers were received, which may be classified as follows. Yes, 49, no, 10, not necessary. Showed natural ability, was eager to learn, etc., 39. By showing pleasure at success, by commendation, encouragement, etc., 17. By exhortation on the value of knowledge, power of education, emulation of great men, etc., 12. By making work interesting, 10. By cooperating, treating as intellectual equals, etc., 8. By providing books and material, 8. By encouraging initiative and research, 7. Miscellaneous, 9. The other matters considered important, 3. Were classified by units of response rather than by individuals. For example, health and morals counted as one under each head. There were 186 units, which have been classified as follows. Religion, manners, morals, character, etc. 29. Health, food, clothing, sleep, etc. 25. Truthfulness, honesty, 17. Supplying and supervising books, recreation, etc. 12. Inculcating thoroughness, perseverance, etc. 11. Treating sympathetically as responsible, equal, etc. 11. Chivalry, ideals, honour, etc. 6. Social companions, activities, fair play, 4. Miscellaneous, 71. Tests of general information. Achievement tests were not given to the high school group. The omission was partly due to limitations of time and funds, but chiefly to the fact that few satisfactory standard tests were available in the high school subjects. The general information test, described in Chapter 11, was used instead. This test had a reliability of 0.95 for unselected children of the age group 14 or the age group 15, and correlates between 0.80 and 0.90 with the termed group test. The means for the separate parts of the test are shown in Table 211. As the number of girls of the various ages in the high school group is small, the sexes have been combined. Controlled data are available for the ages 12 and 13, see Chapter 11, and the means of those ages for the control group are placed in the parenthesis for comparison. These means are extremely high, as will be seen by comparison with the norms in parenthesis for unselected children. For example, the mean total score for the 12-year-old gifted group is above the mean for the control group at the same age by 2.31 times the standard deviation of the latter. The mean total for 13-year-old gifted is above that of the 13-year-old control group by 2.1 times the standard deviation of the latter. The mean for both the 12-year-old and the 13-year-old high school gifted groups is slightly higher than the mean for the main gifted groups of corresponding age. From Table 212, which gives the total score distributions for 12 and 13 year olds of A, the high school gifted group, B, the main gifted group, and C, the control group. 
it will be seen that only one of 53 controlled children of 12 years reaches the 12-year mean for the high school gifted, and only two of 91 control 13-year-olds reach the 13-year mean for the high school gifted. Table 211 is displayed on the page. Mean scores on the information test by high school group. Information quotients have not been computed for the high school gifted group, but it's evident from the data which have been presented that this group ranks as far above unselected children in general information as to the children of the main experimental group. Two of the high school gifted group obtained a perfect score in the science section of the test. The numbers were too small to afford reliable sex comparisons, but the mean showed the following tendencies. Science and nature study, boys appreciably superior. History and civics, boys slightly superior. Language and literature, girls slightly superior. Music and art, girls slightly superior. Total score, boys slightly superior. Table 212 displayed on the page, distribution of information scores of 12 and 13 year olds, gifted and control. Scholastic preferences. Determining the intellectual demands of the school subjects. The high school pupils, like those in the main group, were asked in the interest blank to rate each school subject on a scale from 1 to 5 to indicate degree of preference, also to indicate the easiest subject. Mr. Willoughby undertook to derive a scale of intelligence values of the different school subjects and log us to the bar scale of intelligence values for occupations. That some school subjects make heavier demands upon intelligence than others will be generally agreed, but judges differ considerably in estimating the relative extent of these demands. Obviously, a scale of values based upon the estimates of many qualified judges will have greater validity than one based on the estimates of a single judge. Accordingly, estimates were secured from 25 individuals, 13 men and 12 women, including one private school teacher, graduate student education, three years experience, one high school teacher, a sophomore, one sophomore, no teaching experience, two heads of psychology departments, one in a western university, the other in an eastern women's college, one private school teacher of classics, 35 years experience, one dean of a colored girls seminary, 30 years experience, undergraduate in education, two undergraduates in education, selected by the latter, one high school teacher, experience unknown, Undergraduate education, one college school and army teacher, five years experience. Undergraduate in education, one undergraduate in education, selected by the latter. One college ex-president, director of a bureau of economic research. One university professor of psychology, four graduates in psychology, research assistants. One undergraduate, research assistant. One high school teacher of science, about five years experience. One superintendent of schools graduate in education, one colored school teacher, two years experience, one high school and one grade school teacher, exact experience unknown but extensive, one university graduate, librarian. Each of the 25 judges arranged the 48 subjects in a rank order according to the demands they were believed to make upon intelligence. The usual treatment of such data has been assigned PE values directly from the rank order of comparisons, according to the percent of judges who place a given subject higher or lower than another given subject. For example, according to Thorndike's table, if 80% of judges placed algebra above bookkeeping, then algebra is 1.25 PE above bookkeeping. There are objections, however, to this method. In the case of algebra and bookkeeping, for example, when the two are compared directly, algebra is 1.25 higher but when they are compared by comparing each with a third subject, or a third and a fourth, the previously ascertained position is moved. Another difficulty of the direct comparison method is encountered in the fact that sometimes a given subject is placed above or below another given subject by 100% of the judges, in which case it is impossible to determine on the basis the PE distance between them. In view of these difficulties, the direct comparison method was abandoned in favour of the method of group comparison. First, the school subject was found which had the most nearly central position with respect to all the others. This proved to be dramatics. Next step was to ascertain the distance of each of the other subjects above or below dramatics 
taking account not only of the direct comparison between dramatics and the given subject, called subject X, but also of the position of subject X with reference to other subjects which are being compared with dramatics. The steps were as follows. 1. Each subject was placed in a group composed of all the subjects with which it could be directly compared. Two subjects were comparable, in the sense in which the term is here used, when the judges were not unanimous as to their relative positions. If 100% of the judges place a given subject above another given subject, there is no way to determine the PE distance between them, and they are not really comparable. This gave as many groups as there were subjects, no two groups being exactly identical. The number of subjects in a group was usually between 15 and 30. Subject X, let us say, was comparable with 20 subjects. 2. The next step was to ascertain the mean PE distance of the subjects of a given group from dramatics, the point of reference. In the case of the X group, in our illustration, the PE distance of each of the 20 subjects from dramatics was found and the mean of these distances computed. 3. Next, the distance of subject X from the mean of the X group was found. Suppose this to be minus 0.6 PE. This added algebraically to 1.8 PE gives plus 1.2, which is the best approximation of the true distance of subject X from dramatics. Carrying out this computation for all the subjects gave the PE values of table 213. Table 213 is displayed on the page, Intellectual Demands of the School Subjects. Pupils' ratings of school subjects for preference and ease. By the use of the above scale of values, it is possible to compute the correlation between the absolute difficulty of subject and the extent to which the children like them or call them easy. Each pupil of the high school group rated from 1 to 5 according to liking the subjects which he had taken. The rating 1 meant that the subject was liked very much, 3 that it was neither liked nor disliked, 5 that it was disliked very much. Table 214 shows the percentage of 1, 3 and 5 preference ratings for each subject, also the percent of rated subjects which were checked as very easy or easiest of all, according to the instructions on the pupils' interest blanks. Table 214 is displayed on the page, ratings of subject for preference and ease. The mathematics group is by far the best liked and easiest group. Exceptionally well liked subjects in other groups are chemistry, physics, dramatics and sports. The art group is the least liked and the hardest for these children. The subjects most often disliked are penmanship, sewing, physiology and folk dancing. However, 53% of the pupils did not rate any subject as disliked very much. At the opposite extreme, there was only one pupil who rated no subject as liked very much. The correlation between the intellectual difficulty of the subjects, will be scale values, and the percent of ones in the preference ratings was plus 0.138, standard deviation, 0 0.099. The mean Willoughby's scale values of the subjects checked as very easy was plus 0.67 for boys and plus 0.03 for girls. The correlation between the Willoughby's scale values of the subjects and the percent checking the various subjects as very easy was minus 0.384, standard deviation, 0.081. That is, the less intelligence a subject demands according to competent judges, the harder it is for these pupils, and the less they like it. The more intelligence it demands, the easier it is, and the better they like it. After all, perhaps this is a logical expectation for pupils of such superior intellectual endowment. The relationship between the percent who read a subject 1 for preference, and the percent who read it very easy, can also be found from Table 214. The correlation between the second column and the fifth column is plus 0.753, standard deviation 0 0.044. However, this rather high correlation does not tell us whether a subject is liked by a given pupil because it is easy for him, or whether it is easy for him because he likes it. Vocational Preferences The vocational preferences were expressed on the interest blank by 196 boys and 87 girls of the high school group. The method was the same as they used with the main group. The subject was asked to mark with two crosses the vocation he would most like to follow, of 96 listed, 
and to mark with a single cross the other occupations he might like to follow. The first choices were distributed as follows. A list is displayed on the page, comparing a list of professions with boys and girls. The above preferences do not tell us what occupations these subjects will follow, but they are probably fairly good indications of the general directions in which future choices will be made. It is significant that 33.6% of the boys are looking forward to some field of engineering and 132 to science. Engineering and the physical sciences together account for 90 choices, or almost half. Law follows with 14 choices, writing with 12, and medicine with 10. Approximately 35% of the girls' choices go to teaching, 10% to writing, and 8% to music. The average bias scale rating of the occupational choices of the entire group is 14.63. This about corresponds to the level of a secretary or high school teacher, as the whole lower than the majority of the group ought to aspire. The occupations marked as possible choices cover a wide range. The boys marked on an average 3.8 occupations as possible choices, the girls 2.2. In both cases, the average bar rating of these choices is considerably below that of the first choices. Figure 35, page 570, shows the distribution of bar ratings of occupational preferences of the pupils and also the distribution of the occupations followed by near relatives. The average bar rating of A is 14.63, of B 14.1, of C 11.8. Average for the general male population of the larger California cities is 8.8. .8. See page 70. The average for girls is lower by about one point than that for boys. 81 girls answered the question, do you prefer the duties of housewife to those of any other occupation? The answers, well decorated with exclamation points and underscorings, were not in the least indecisive. The no's have it, 71% to 19%. Does the boy or girl whose occupational choice rates high on the vast scale tend to prefer the school subjects which make most intellectual demands? In order to answer this question, the correlation was computed between bar scale ratings of preferred occupation and the Willoughby scale ratings of scholastic preferences. The correlation found was 0.192, which is low but perhaps significant. Summary the chapter deals with a group of 309 gifted high school pupils located chiefly through cooperative surveys made by high school faculty throughout California. Final selection was based upon term and group test scores earned by pupils who had been nominated by teachers. Probably most of the subjects so selected are as intelligent as the brightest in 200 taken at random. Their ages range from 12 to 21, with an average of 15 years, 3.4 months. Only a small part of the information collected for the group has been summarised. Some of the more important facts are as follows. 1. The sex ratio is 183 boys to 100 girls, as compared with 116 boys to 100 girls in the main group. It is suggested that the proportion of high score in girls may decrease as adulthood is approached. 2. The main group is compared with the general population of California as a deficiency of subjects in Latin, Negro and Indian extraction, and an excess of Jewish blood. Immigration has been chiefly from northwestern and western Europe, through New England and New York, and thence through the northern tier of Middle West states to California. Bar scale ratings of the occupations Followed by the parents and other near relatives of this group gave results in line with those found for the main experimental group. 3. The mean age of fathers at the time of child's birth was 32.4, of mothers 29.1. 4. 6% of the births are said to have been premature, 3.4% over time. Average birth rate reported was 8 pounds 6.4 ounces for boys and 8 pounds 3.2 ounces for girls. 5. About two-thirds were exclusively breastfed for ten months or longer. 6. Average age of walking and talking, as reported by parents, is somewhat lower for this group than for the main gifted group. 7. Health and energy ratings of the subjects by parents and teachers were in the majority of cases above average. 8. Teachers report 8% as having, or as having had, more or less serious organic disease. Symptoms of general weakness were reported by the home for 13.6% of the group. 
by the school for 20%. 9. The school reports 23% of the boys and 33% of the girls with somewhat defective vision and 2% of the boys and 0.5% of the girls with very poor vision. There was no case of poor or very poor hearing. 10. The nutrition of 95.8% is rated by the teachers as good or excellent by the parents, 91%. 11. Almost one half of the group have undergone tonsillectomy and about the same number adenoidectomy. Parents and teachers report 14% as having colds frequently or very frequently. 12. Parents rate 18% as nervous. The teachers 17%. The percentages with a history of stuttering, habit spasms, chorea, excessive fears or tendency to worry run about the same as those for the main group. That is, are not excessive. The sleep records are above the Terman and Hocking norms. 13. Among 242, there had been 31 cases of scarlet fever, 9 cases of diphtheria, 7 of typhoid, 6 of smallpox, and 3 of infantile paralysis. 14. Roughly half the boys and a quarter of the girls have suffered accidents. 15. The proportion of girls who menstruate before 11, 12, and 13 is considerably higher than for unselected girls. 16. More than 60% of the group are accelerated in school and none seriously retarded. About 70% have skipped one or more half grades. One seventh of the group entered school, first, second or third grade, before the age of six. After school entrance, there was little skipping. 17. These children like school and show a good record of attendance. The boys average nearly seven hours a week in home study, the girls nearly eight. 18. Half the group learned to read before starting to school, and 14 before 5 years. As in the case of the main group, there have been an excessive amount of interest in dictionaries, atlases and encyclopedias. 19. The average number of books reported in the home library was 380. 20. The parents of these children have been gifted, in general, by the same educational principles as the parents of the main group. There have been few if any attempts at prodigy making but if it has been made to satisfy the child's natural intellectual curiosity and to hold up suitable standards of school performance. 21. In the absence of a satisfactory battery of achievement tests, a general information test was given, including items in nature study and science, language and literature, history and civics and the arts. The superiority of the group in this test is about as great as the superiority in the terminal group test. 22. By modification of Cattell's order of merit method, a scale was derived for the rating of school subjects according to the demands they made upon general intelligence. A negative correlation of minus 0.38 was found between the intelligence demands of a school subject and the frequency with which it was found easy by the pupils. On the other hand, the correlation between preferred subjects and, and subjects found easy was plus 0.75. Such subjects as mathematics, physics, chemistry and modern languages were especially liked and rated easy. The manual and art subjects were least liked and least often rated as easy. 23. Nearly half the boys are looking forward either to engineering or to science. More than a third of the girls expect to teach. The large majority of the occupational choices of both sexes fall in the professional group. 24. The results for this group are of value chiefly as confirming in almost every detail the results for the main experimental group. What has been found for both of these groups will doubtless be found to hold for any gifted group similarly selected. End of section 20。section 21。of genetic studies of genius volume 1 。Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis Terman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 20 Two Years After The majority of the gifted children whom this report concerns were located during the school year 1921-22. Two years later, about the middle of the school year, 1923-24, to 
blanks were set out for the first follow-up report. A blank was first sent to the parents, and after this had been returned with the information called for, another blank was sent to the child's teacher. The latter blank could not be sent until the parent's blank had been returned, given the name of the teacher and of the school where the child was attending. Both blanks are reproduced in full in the following pages. A form is displayed on the page. Annual report from parents. Another form is displayed on the following page. Annual report from school. Home reports were received for 1,069 children of the various gifted groups and school reports for 757. Of these, 570 home reports and 464 school reports were for the main experimental group. Home reports were received before September 1, 1924, for approximately 90% of the main group of 643 cases, and school reports for approximately 75% of the main group who were attending school. The latter number is smaller than the former, partially because some of the children were not in school, and largely for the reason why so many home blanks were not returned until the end, or near the end, of the school year. The distribution of ages at the time the reports were made is shown in Table 215. Not all of the information contained in the follow-up reports for these children has been summarised. This chapter presents only the material relating to school progress and to the testimony of parents and teachers regarding the attitude towards school, quality of school work, and changes in interests, social traits, and character traits, and most of the information summarised relates only to the main experimental group. The findings, based as they are upon questionnaire material, should on many points be taken as suggestive rather than conclusive. Our files contain a large amount of miscellaneous information of semi-clinical nature on the latter development of individual children. Some of this possesses extreme interest, but the time has not yet come to attempt a summary of it. The present report is accordingly limited to the analysis of certain data for a relatively unselected group. Table 215 is displayed on the page, Gifted Children Reported in First Follow-up. Age Grade Status in 1924 the age grade location of those reported at the time the reports were made is shown in tables 216 to 221. Of the main experimental group, nine boys and eight girls were not in school and one boy was in college. Of the miscellaneous group, 31 boys and 14 girls were not in school and 72 boys and 28 girls were in college. Data on grade location have not been obtained for those attending college. Concerning the 542 cases of Table 220, main experimental group, with the 337 cases of Table 221, miscellaneous group, and counting a child normal in progress who is in the first grade and is 6 or 7 years old, but not yet 8, etc., we had the percentage of retarded, normal, and accelerated given below. A small table is displayed on the page, listing the main group, miscellaneous group, and groups combined compared with retarded, normal, accelerated, and total. Comparing the grade status of the entire main group in 1924 with that in 1921 to 22, see pages 254, we find that the proportion of children accelerated has not materially changed. Of the 879 children reported in the main and miscellaneous groups combined, 1924, only 683 were accelerated and only 3 retarded one of that have been a special ability case. On the following pages, Table 216, Table 217, Table 218, Table 219, Table 220, Table 221 are displayed on the following pages. Only the school progress of the children in the main gifted group has been analysed in detail. Even for this group, the data are not complete, owing to the fact that the reports for about 100 children were mislaid shortly after the tabulation results began and were not located until it was too late to include them in all the summary tables. The effect of this is merely to reduce the size of the sampling. There is no likelihood that any important conclusions would have been different had the loss of the data not occurred. 
School Progress in Reference to Recommended Promotions It will be recalled that in the school information blank, filled out by teachers at the time the children were located, the teacher was in each case asked to state whether, in her judgment, the child could do the work of a higher grade if given immediate promotion. See page 265. In the analysis of the follow-up reports, the letter school progress of those for whom promotion was deemed feasible has been compared with that for whom promotion was not thought feasible. The results are shown in Table 222, from which it will be seen that there is very little correlation between the amount of extra promotion deemed feasible in 1921-22 and the progress which has since been made. Table 222 is displayed on the page. Letter progress compared with the amount of extra promotion deemed feasible in 1921-22. Table 223 is displayed on the following page. The facts embodied in tables 222 and 223 may perhaps be more readily grasped from the statements which follow. Category 1. 139 cases not recommended for extra promotion in 1921-22. Of these, 5, 3.6%, have since made less than normal progress. 93, 66.9% have made normal progress. 41, 29.5% have skipped one or more half grades. Of the 41 in this category who have skipped since 1921 to 22, 23, 56.1% of the group are now recommended for additional promotion of one and three half grades. Of the 98 in this category who have not skipped, X promotion is now recommended for 45, 45.9% of the group. Category 2 198 cases recommended for one extra promotion in 1921-22. Of these, 7, 3.5% have since made less than normal progress. 114, 57.6% have made normal progress. 76, 38.4% have skipped one or more half grades. Of the 76 cases in this category who have skipped since 1921 to 22, additional promotion of from 1 to 5 half grades is now recommended for 39, 51.3%. Of the 122 cases in this category who have not skipped, X promotion of 1 to 2 half grades is now recommended for 57, 46.7%. Category 3. 83 cases for whom two extra promotions were recommended in 1921-22. Of these, none has made less than normal progress. 47, 56.6% have made normal progress, and 36, 43.4% have skipped one or more half grades. Of the 36 who have skipped, additional promotion is now recommended for 21, 58.3%. Of the 47 who have not skipped, additional promotion is now recommended for 25 53.2%. Category 4. 25 cases for whom three or more extra promotions were recommended in 1921-22. Of these, none has made less than normal progress. 15, 60% have made normal progress, and 10, 40% have skipped one or more half grades. Of the 10 who have skipped, additional promotion of one to two half grades is now recommended for six, 60%. Of the 15 who have not skipped, additional promotion of 1 to 2 half grades is now recommended for 9, 60%. Of the 445 children who enter into tables 222 and 293, 163, 36.6%, skipped at least one half grade between 1921, 22 and 1924, and 37, 8.3%, skipped two or more half grades. One boy of IQ 168 skipped half grades and is now, at the age of nine years, in the seventh grade. In eight cases, regular progress has been made in spite of absence from school for a half year or more. Notwithstanding this record of extra progress, the teachers now recommend 221, 49.6%, for still further advancement. It is especially significant that such additional advancement is more frequently recommended for children who have skipped during the two-year period than for those who have not. Of the 445 children, four have missed promotions twice, and eight once. This does not necessarily mean that grades have been repeated by these children. In six of the twelve cases, the child who was out of school for at least half the term because of illness or travelling. In one case, 
The child had been placed in a special school for the correction of speech defect. In five of the twelve cases, the teacher now recommends the child for extra promotion. It is evident from the data presented in the preceding paragraphs that such extra promotions as have been granted to these children have been bestowed in a very haphazard fashion and have borne little relation to the probable merits of the particular case. School Progress and Scholarship Rating In the attempt to ascertain the effect of extra progress on scholarship, difficulty was encountered from the fact that in 1921-22, Teachers were asked to rate scholarship in each school subject on a scale of 1 to 7, with 4 as average, and in 1924, on a scale of 1 to 5, with 3 as average, making the judgments better, same, and worse. On the second rating, 5-point scale, as compared with the earlier ratings, 7-point scale, scholarship was recorded as same when a. child having 1 on second report had 1 or 2 on first, b. child having 2 on second report had two or three on first, C, child having three on second report had four on first, D, child having four on second report had five or six on first, E, child having five on second report had six or seven on first. It would have been better had the two scholarship readings been made on the same scale. However, the fact that they were not is not very serious since our present purpose is to compare the scholarship ratings of those who have made extra progress since 1921 to 22 with those who have not. The most important facts brought out by the comparison are presented in Table 224. It is seen, Table 224, that the pupils who have skipped since 1921 to 22 have gained in scholarship rating more often than those who have not skipped. Also that of the pupils who have skipped Scholarship improvement has occurred about as frequently among those who were not recommended for extra promotion in 1921-22 to as for those who were. The inference is that even more extra promotions could have been granted without injury to the scholarship record of these children. The fact that somewhat more pupils have lower ratings in 1924 compared with 1921-22 to than higher is probably due to two facts. One. Many are now in the upper grades or the high school, where competition is more severe. 2. The 1921-22 to ratings were made by a teacher who had, in a majority of cases, nominated the child as one of the three brightest in her class. That is, the 1921-22 to teacher was a little more likely than the 1924 teacher to be biased in the child's favour. Table 224 is displayed on the page. Effect of extra promotion upon scholarship. In the home report of 1924, parents were asked to state whether the child was gaining, holding his own, or losing a general ability. See item 2, 6, page 598. The answers distribute as follows. A small table is displayed on the page, comparing boys, girls in total, to the number, the gain in percent, no change, and loss in percent. The opinion of a parent on such a matter, of course, has little value in any individual case, but it is probably significant that, for the group as a whole, loss in general ability has evidenced itself so rarely and gains so frequently. School progress in relation to liking for school. Liking for school was rated by parents in the home information blank, 1921 and 22, and again in the home report of 1924 on the same scale as very strong, fairly strong, slight liking, positive dislike. The home reports of 1924 are summarised in the following figures. A table is split on the page comparing those who have skipped in the last two years for boys and girls and the percentages for their liking of school. The liking for school in 1924 has been compared, pupil by pupil, with that two years earlier. The following figures give the results separately for the extra progress group and for the group that had made no extra progress. A table is displayed on the page comparing boys, girls and total to the percentages of their liking for school. That is, the children who did not make extra progress between 1921 and 22 and 1924 have, as a group, not changed with respect to their liking for school, 
or those who received extra promotions, has somewhat more often changed in the direction of less liking. The reasons for this tendency are not brought out in the data at hand, but the findings may be interpreted as an arrangement in favour of dealing with such children by the formation of special classes rather than by extra promotions. School Progress and Social Adaptability Item 2, 7 in the School Report of 1924 calls for a rating on social adaptability on a five-point scale as very superior, superior, average, inferior, or very inferior. The results tabulated separately for those who have, and for those who have not, skipped since 1921 to 22, are given in Table 225. Table 225 is displayed on the page, Social Adaptability as Related to School Progress. The mean rating on social adaptability is almost exactly the same for the two progress groups. However, this can hardly be taken as proof that ex-promotion has no unfavorable effect upon social adaptability. It is possible that the children who were somewhat better endowed in this trait were more likely to secure an extra promotion. Most of the acceleration present in this group occurred before 1921 to 22. We have compared those who are accelerated with those making normal progress in regard to the percent rated superior average or inferior in social adaptability. The number of retarded is too small to yield percents of value. The difference shown in the following figures for the accelerated and normal progress group are highly significant. A small table displayed on the page comparing the accelerated and normal progress to the percentages for rating on social adaptability. Further evidence on this point was obtained by examining the ratings on social adaptability, Home Report 1924, of 55 boys and 68 girls who were highly accelerated. The mean amount of acceleration for these was 2.6 years for boys and 2.4 years for girls. The mean age, 11.8 years and 11.5 years. The mean IQ, 157 and 155. The results were as follows. Small tables played on the page comparing the teachers' ratings of social adaptability in 1924 between boys and girls. In the school report of 1924, teachers also rated the amount of play of each child as very much, average amount, little. The results follow. A small table is played on the page. Teachers' ratings of amount of play, 1924. The highly accelerated children, both boys and girls, are more likely than the less accelerated group to be rated as below average on amount of play. It is quite probable that this tendency of the figures is in accord with the facts, as a child who is three or four years accelerated in school finds it very difficult to enter into the plays and games of his classmates. Case records on social adaptability and play are summarised below for the 16 boys and 12 girls who were accelerated three years or more. Boy, age 11, 5, grade, 9H, IQ 164, social adaptability average, Plays with other children average amount. Play interest normal. Schoolwork very superior. Health excellent. Not nervous. Social ratings by teacher two years ago. Average or slightly below. Liking for school fairly strong. Boy aged 12 to 11. Grade 10 H. IQ 169. Social adaptability average. Plays with other children very much. Play interest normal. Schoolwork very superior. Health excellent. Not nervous. Social ratings by teacher two years ago, average or slightly below. Liking for school, very strong. Boy, age 11, 5, grade 9, L, IQ 159. Social adaptability, average. Plays with other children, average amount. Schoolwork superior, health good, not nervous. Social ratings by teacher two years ago, average or slightly below. Teacher now comments, he is much smaller and seems so much younger than other members of his class that he has very little in common with them. Liking for school, fairly strong. Boy, aged 9, 9, grade 7, H, IQ 170. Social adaptability, average. Plays with other children, average amount. Play interests, normal. Schoolwork, very superior. Health, good. Not nervous. Social ratings by teacher, two years ago, average or better. Boy, aged 12 to 8, grade 10, H, IQ 150. Social adaptability average, no data on play, schoolwork excellent, health good, not nervous, social ratings by teacher two years ago, slightly below average, 
liking for school very strong. Boy, age 12, 6, grade 10H, IQ 141. Social adaptability inferior. Plays with other children little. Schoolwork superior. Health fair, not nervous. Social ratings by teacher, two years ago, average or slightly above. Teacher now comments. Small and frail. Not able to mix with more active boys in hearty sports. Liking for school fairly strong. Boy, age 12, 4. Grade 10L, IQ 165. Social adaptability average. Plays average amount with other children. Play interest normal. Schoolwork superior. Health good. Not nervous. Social ratings by teacher, two years ago, low average. Liking for school fairly strong. Boy, age 12, 4. Grade 9H. IQ 154. No information on social adaptability or play interests. Schoolwork very superior. Health excellent. Not nervous. Social ratings by teacher, two years ago, decidedly above average, except fondness for large groups decidedly below average. Liking for school very strong. Boy, age 12, 6, grade 10 L, IQ 140. Social adaptability superior. Plays with other children, average amount. Play interest normal. Schoolwork superior. Health good. Not nervous. Social ratings by teacher, two years ago, above average. Liking for school very strong. Boy, age 10, 6, grade 8 L, IQ 161. Social adaptability average. Plays with other children, average amount. Play interest normal, schoolwork superior, health excellent, not nervous. Social ratings by teacher two years ago above average, liking for school very strong. Boy aged 13 0, grade 10 H, IQ 164, social adaptability average, plays with other children little, play interest below normal, schoolwork superior, health fair, nervous, stammers at times. Social ratings by teacher two years ago, decidedly above average. Liking for school, slight. Boy aged 84, grade 5H, IQ 148. Social adaptability average. Plays with other children, average amount. Play interest normal, schoolwork very superior. Health excellent, non nervous. Social ratings by teacher two years ago were fondness for large groups, below average. Leadership decidedly below average. Popularity average. Liking for school, fairly strong. Boy, age 10, 8, grade 8L, IQ 148. Social adaptability, average. No debt on play. Schoolwork, average. Health, excellent, not nervous. Social ratings by teacher, two years ago, were fondness for large groups, decidedly above average. Leadership, below average. Popularity, average. Liking for school, fairly strong. Boy, age 13, 5. Grade 10H. IQ 150. Social adaptability average. Plays with other children average amount. Play interest normal. Schoolwork average. Health good, not nervous. Social ratings by teacher two years ago, slightly above to slightly below average. Liking for school, very strong. Boy age 13 4. Grade 10H. IQ 182. Social adaptability average. No data on play. Schoolwork very superior. Health fair. No information on nervousness. Social ratings by teacher, two years ago, decidedly above average. Liking for school, very strong. Boy age 12, 6, grade 10 L, IQ 150. Social adaptability average. Plays without the children, average amount. No information on play interests. Schoolwork average. Health good, not nervous. Social ratings by teacher, two years ago, average. Liking for school, not reported. Girl, age 11, 5, grade 9L, IQ 142, social adaptability average, no play information, schoolwork very superior, health good, not nervous, social ratings by teacher, two years ago, above average, liking for school, very strong. Girl, age 12, 5, grade 10L, IQ 151, social adaptability average, plays with the children, average amount. Play interests normal. School work superior. Health good. Not nervous. Social ratings by teacher two years ago, average or above. Liking for school, fairly strong. Girl, age 11, 11. Grade 9H. IQ 173. Social adaptability superior. 
Plays with other children, not stated. Play interest normal. Schoolwork superior. Health good, not nervous. Social ratings by teacher, two years ago, average or above. Liking for school, fairly strong. Girl, age 9-11. Grade 7L. IQ 172. Social adaptability average. Plays with other children, average amount. Play interest normal. Schoolwork superior. Health good, not nervous. Social ratings by teacher, two years ago, average or above. Liking for school very strong. Girl, age 10, 8. Grade 8L. IQ 148. Social adaptability average. Plays with other children very much. Play interest normal. Schoolwork average. Health excellent, not nervous. Social ratings by teacher, two years ago, average. Liking for school, slight. Girl aged 10-11. Grade 8L. IQ 186. Social adaptability very superior. Plays with other children very much. Play interest normal. Schoolwork superior. Health good. Nervous at times. Blinking of eyes. Restlessness. Social ratings by teacher two years ago. Average or above. Liking for school fairly strong. Girl age 11 8, Grade 9L. IQ 159. Social adaptability average. Plays with other children little. She evidently has trouble with her heart. This turns her interest away from energetic children and puts it in reading. Schoolwork superior. Health good. Not nervous. Social ratings by teacher two years ago. Slightly below average. Liking for school very strong. Girl age 10 5. Grade 7 H. IQ 137. Social adaptability average. Plays with the children very much. Play interest normal. Schoolwork superior. Health excellent. Not nervous. Social ratings by teacher two years ago above average. Liking for school very strong. Girl age 10 7. Grade 8 L. IQ 164. Social adaptability average. Plays with other children average amount. Play interest normal. Schoolwork not rated. Health good. Not nervous. Social ratings by teacher two years ago above average. Liking for school very strong. Girl aged 8 5. Grade 5H. IQ 192. Social adaptability average. Plays with the children average amount. Play interest normal. Schoolwork average. Health excellent. Not nervous. Social ratings by teacher two years ago. Average or better. Liking for school strong. Girl aged 8 4. Grade 5H. IQ 167. Social adaptability average. Plays with the children average amount. Play interest normal. Schoolwork not rated. Health fair. Nervous. Runs comb through hair when reciting. Social ratings by teacher two years ago. Average. Liking for school very strong. Girl age 11, 7. Grade 9L. IQ 143. Social adaptability average. Plays with the children average amount. Play interest normal. Schoolwork not rated. Health excellent. Not nervous. Social ratings by teacher two years ago. High average to very superior. Liking for school very strong. Deportment, application and nervousness in relation to school progress. Both in 1921-22 and in 1924, teachers rated deportment and application each separately as excellent, good, fair, poor or very poor. At both dates they also answered the question, is a child especially nervous? The response of each child in 1924 have been compared with the responses for the same child in 1921-22, and the comparison has been recorded as better, same, or worse. The results are given in Table 226 separately for the children who have received extra promotions since 1921-22, and for those who have not. Table 226 is displayed on the page, Deportment, Application, and Nervousness in Relation to School Progress. The following statements are justified. 1. The deportment of both the skipping and the non-skipping group, boys and girls, showed a decided tendency toward improvement. There is more marked with the group which skipped. 2. Application in the case of both boys and girls showed a marked tendency toward improvement in the group which skipped. There was no improvement in the group which did not skip. 3. In regard to nervousness, there was a slight change in the direction of worse, except in the case of girls who did not skip. However, the numbers showing change in nervousness are too small to be reliable. 
The 1921-22 ratings in deportment and application were correlated in those in 1924. In practically all cases, the second ratings were given by teachers other than those who made the first ones, and without knowledge of what the first ratings had been. For deportment and correlation was 0.387, standard deviation 0.038 for boys, and 0.378, standard deviation 0.042 for girls. For application, 0.347, standard deviation 0.040 for boys, and 0.251, Standard deviation, 0.047 for girls. Health was also rated in both blanks as excellent, good, fair, poor, or very poor. The correlation between the 1921-22 and the 1924 ratings in this case was 0.238, standard deviation, 0.040 for boys, and 0.272, standard deviation, 0.045 for girls. Changes in responsiveness to discipline. The school information blank of 1921-22 and the school report blank of 1924 both contain the following question. Does child respond well to discipline? If not, explain. In tabulating the results, such answers as yes, very well, always, excellently, etc. were recorded as satisfactory. Qualified affirmative answers such as fairly well, yes except for occasional periods of sulkiness, etc. were recorded as not entirely satisfactory. No cases of incorrigibility or serious troublesomeness were reported in the main experimental group. The responses of all 1921-22 and 1924 have been classified as follows. A small table displayed on the page comparing boys and girls, two cases included in each report, satisfactory response and not entirely satisfactory. There are 288 boys and 187 girls who appear in both the 1921-22 and the 1924 reports. Table 227 shows a number of classifications in 1924 which were different from those of 1922 and the direction of change. Table 227 is displayed on the page Responsiveness to Discipline, 1921-22 and 1924. In other words, of 211 boys classified as satisfactory in 1921-22, 24 are now classified as not entirely satisfactory. Of 180 satisfactory girls, 15 are now not entirely satisfactory. On the other hand, 10 out of 17 boys and 6 out of 7 girls classified as not entirely satisfactory in 1921-22 are now classified as satisfactory. The 7 boys and 1 girl who in both reports were classified as not entirely satisfactory are described below. Boy, age 11 to grade 7L. IQ 142. In 1921-22 report. Response to discipline fairly well. Deportment average. Application average. Fondness for large groups rather above average. Leadership rather below average. Popularity average. In 1924 report, he seems to bother some of his teachers very much on account of inattentiveness. Deportment fair. Application poor. Social adaptability average. On personal tests, overstates, but not more than average. Social attitude, similar to average. Reliability in face of temptation, equal to average. Emotional stability, average. Boy, age 12, 8, grade 8H, IQ 150. In 1921-22 report, he likes his own way. Deportment, average. Application, high average. Social traits, below average. In 1924 report, Response to discipline fairly well. He seems to resent somewhat criticism of his deportment and sometimes sulks little. Deportment good, application fair, social adaptability average. On personality tests, estimates his knowledge accurately. Social attitude similar to average. Reliability in face of temptation equal to average. Emotional stability average. Boy, age 11, 7, grade 7, H, IQ 144. In 1921-22 report, question regarding response to discipline answered, no. Deportment inferior. Application inferior. Social traits decidedly above average. Except popularity, which is rather above average. In 1924 report, he has not been disagreeable because of discipline, but he does not improve as much as one would wish. Deportment fair. Application not rated. Social adaptability average. 
on personality tests estimate his knowledge accurately. Social attitude very desirable. Reliability in face of temptation more than average. Emotionally well balanced. Boy aged 12-10. Grade 8L. IQ 141. In 1921-22 report, must be appealed to personally. Will not act with the group. Likes to feel responsibility but cannot carry it. Deportment average. Application average. Social traits below average. In 1924 report, resents discipline. Passive indifference. Deportment fair. Application poor. Social adaptability inferior. On personality tests, estimates his knowledge accurately. Social attitude similar to average. Reliability in face of temptation equal to average. Emotional stability average. Boy, age 13-5, grade 9L, IQ 141. 1921-22 report, response to discipline fairly well. Deportment average. Application high average. Social traits above average. In 1924 report, at times is stubborn and independent. Usually tries to make amends as soon as he thinks it over. Deportment fair. Application fair. Social adaptability inferior. On personality tests, overstates but not more than average. Social attitude similar to average. Reliability in face of temptation equal to average. Emotional stability average. Boy age 13 to grade 8H. IQ 151. In 1921 to 22 report, has a very decided habit of interrupting anyone speaking and is slow in responding to commands. Deportment not rated. Application very inferior. Social traits average, except fondness for large groups below average. In 1924 report, he is never at fault. He has an alibi for all his deeds and his conduct. Deportment poor. Application poor. Social adaptability inferior. On personality tests, shows a marked tendency to overstate. Social attitude similar to average. Reliability in face of temptation equal to average. Emotional stability average. Boy age 14-3. Grade 10H. IQ 136. 1921-22 report. Question on response to discipline answered. No has his own way at home. From infancy apparently. Deportment average. Application superior. Invariably avoids large groups. Neither leads nor follows. Popularity average. In 1924 report, as peculiar social ideal, will not mind mother. Minds a teacher that insists on good behaviour. Resents correction until he is convinced that further delay will result in punishment. Deportment poor. Application poor. Social adaptability average. On personality tests, shows a marked tendency to overstate. Social attitude similar to average. Reliability in face of temptation more than average. Emotionally well balanced. Girl, age 11, 7, grade 8, age, IQ 151, 1921-22 report, she likes to have her own way and will try a person out, but when she minds, she soon becomes cheerful and her grouch is soon gone. Deportment, low average, application average, social traits average, and above. In 1924 report, is inclined to be selfish and pouty, deportment fair, application good, social adaptability average. On personality tests, overstates but not more than average. Social attitude, very desirable. Reliability in face of temptation, less than average. Emotionally well balanced. The above cases are, according to the statements of their teachers, the worst incorrigibles to be found among these 415 gifted children. Change of interests and in social and character traits. Item 2, 8. Of the 1924 Home Report, blank reads, Have you observed any noteworthy changes in the child during the last two years with respect to the following matters? A. Interests. B. Social traits. C. Character traits. In each case, the parent is asked to describe the change. Supplementary information on these points was frequently given by parents under the following items. 2. 3. How has child spent leisure time during the last year? 2. 5. Has child displayed any new indications of superior intelligence since your last report? 3. 3. In the remaining space, add any other facts concerning the child which you think would be of interest. All information from these three sources, which threw away any additional light on item 2, 8, 
changes in interest and in social and character traits, was taken into account. The answers to these questions in several dozen reports were first recorded and inspected, then a rather broad classification of interests and of social and character traits was adopted to permit a statistical summary of results. A word of explanation is necessary as to the distinction which was made between the classification group activities under the treatment of changes in interest and the classification sociability under the treatment of changes in social traits. When parents reported the children as having gained or lost interest in such specific group occupations as scouting, sports, games, dancing, etc., this was recorded under the heading Changes in Interests. But when a gain or loss in such traits as fondness for companionship or popularity was reported, i.e. sociability without such objective ends as the group activities above, this was recorded under the heading Changes in Social Traits. However, when tabulations were made to show the extent to which changes in interests accompanied changes in social traits, interest in group activities was included with social traits and not included with interests. Interests Changes in interests were classified under the following heads. Group activities includes games, sports, scouting, dancing, religious interests, church, Sunday school, and the problem of existence. Literary interests, reading, writing, journalism, and languages. Scientific interests, mechanics, chemistry, science, genealogy, collections, mathematics. Artistic interests, art, music, drama, motion pictures. Broadly social interests, includes current events, history, civics. Domestic and maternal interests, household tasks, sewing, cooking, love of young children. Miscellaneous interests. All others, such as travel, schoolwork, ROTC, business enterprises, greater breadth of interests, greater maturity, etc. Gains and losses were recorded separately for boys and girls under the above categories, as shown in Table 228. Table 228 is displayed on the page, Gains and Losses of Various Kinds of Interests. In all but eight cases, the changes in interests are in the direction of gain. The largest gain for both sexes is in interest in group activities, but gain in this interest is more frequent with boys than with girls. Boys show a large gain in scientific interests, girls very little. On the other hand, girls more often gain in literary and domestic interests. The normal child may expect it to show a broadening and intensification of interests as adolescence approaches. The above findings merely show that gifted children are not an exception to the rule. They do not ordinarily become blase and lackadaisical. The data were recorded in such a way as to show what combinations of gain or loss in various interests occurred. The frequencies with which a change in one type of interest occurs alone or in combination are found in Table 229. Table 229 is displayed on the page, combinations which gain of interest occurred. In the case of boys, gain in scientific interests is least often accompanied by gain in other interests, and changes in literary and artistic ability most often. With boys, scientific interests seem to possess the greatest monopolizing power, with girls' domestic and maternal interests. The numbers are too small to show whether a gain in a given type of interest tends to be accompanied by gain in a certain peculiar type of interest rather than in some other. It is surprising that only one case was reported in which a child had gained in any interest at the expense of interest in group activities. Changes in social traits. The classification of changes was as follows. Sociability includes fondness for companions, popularity, group consciousness, etc. Social poise includes manners, politeness, social ease, grace. Care for appearance, attention to dress in person, fondness for older company, leadership, interest in opposite sex, unsocial tendencies includes fighting and teasing, miscellaneous. The results of Table 230 show that all but 12 of the changes which had occurred are in the direction of gain. Also, that the majority of changes and gains fall under the category of sociability. Table 230 is displayed on the page, gains and losses with respect to social traits. Changes in interests are related to changes in social traits. The changes in interests, not including interests in group activities, were tabulated to show whether they were accompanied by gain or loss in social traits, including interest in group activities. 
Table 231 is displayed on the page. Changes in interest related to change in social traits. Only three cases were reported, all girls, in which there was a gain in interests at the expense of social traits. Of 135 children who showed a gain in interests, 72 showed also a gain in social traits, only three a loss of social traits. There is no evidence of any deterioration in social tendencies as a result of increased interest in scientific, literary, artistic, domestic and other fields. Changes in character traits. Changes reported were classified under the following categories. Responsibility includes dependability, self-reliance, judgment, moral outlook, honesty, uprightness, truthfulness, clean mind, etc. Helpfulness. Helpfulness, consideration, thoughtfulness, etc. Sense of justice, love of fair play, recognition of obligations, etc. Tractability. Tractability, responsiveness to reason, and negatively, willfulness, argumentiveness, selfishness. Self-control, control of temper, control of desires, patience, persistence and application, self-confidence, miscellaneous. The tabulated results, table 232, show 149 gains and 39 losses. Losses were reported for about 10% of the boys and for about 7% of the girls, considerably more than the proportion showing either loss in interest or in the social traits. More than half the loss in Table 232 come under the category Tractability. Table 232 is displayed on the page. Gains and loss of respect to character traits. Summary 1. Two years after the original survey, a follow-up was conducted by the use of report blanks which were sent to home and school. Home reports were received for 1,069 subjects of the various groups, and school reports for 757. 2. Data on age grade status have been summarised for 542 children of the main gifted group and for 337 belonging to the other groups. No child of the main gifted group is retarded on the ares Strayo standard, and about 82% are accelerated. More than a third of the children have skipped at least one half grade in the two-year period. 3. The gifted children who, in 1921-22, were deemed by their teachers the most deserving of extra promotions, have in reality skipped no more frequently since that date than the other children. 4. In 1924, additional advancement is more often recommended by the teachers for children who have skipped since 1921-22 than for those who have not. 5. Teachers' ratings on the quality of schoolwork in 1921-22 were compared with similar ratings secured in 1924. The children who have skipped during the period more often show improvement in scholarship than those who have not. 6. Of those who have skipped, some were reported by their teachers in 1921-22 as capable of doing the work of a higher grade. Others were not. The latter, nevertheless, have improved as frequently in their scholarship when granted extra promotion as have the former. 7. In the opinion of the parents, 45% of the group have gained in general ability during the two years and 1% have lost. 8. The group that has skipped shows, somewhat more frequently than the normal progress group, decreased fondness of school. 9. There is no correlation between the school progress which has been made and teachers' ratings on social adaptability. However, the very highly accelerated are somewhat often rated below average in social adaptability than is true of the entire group of gifted children. They're also somewhat oftener as played less than the average amount. 10. Teachers' ratings of development were higher in 1924 than in 1921-22. Improvement in deportment was more marked with the group which skipped than with the normal progress group. 11. Application improved markedly in the group which skipped, but somewhat no improvement in the normal progress group. 12. The data on relationship between nervousness ratings and skipped are not consistent. 13. Responsiveness to discipline is more often described as not entirely satisfactory in 1924 than in 1921-22. However, the worst disciplinary cases in the group studied are probably very mild in comparison with the average pupil in a parental or reform school. 14. 
In the two-year period, the interests of these children have grown and become intensified. The largest gain is in interest in group activities. Boys show considerable gain in scientific interests, while girls have more often gained in literary and domestic interests. 15. The changes reported in respect to social traits are nearly all in the direction of increase in sociability, social poise, fondness for large groups, etc. There are very few cases in which there seems to have been a gain in general interest at the expense of the social traits. 16. In connection with character traits, gains are reported nearly four times as frequently as losses. More than half the losses have to do with tractability. 17. The data reported in this chapter are incomplete and of uneven value. Except in the case of the age grade status, the statistical summaries can be taken only as indicating the general direction in which the truth probably lies. However, even if we make considerable allowance for the unsatisfactories of the data, it appears that chance factors, chiefly, have operated in the matter of extra promotions, that the gifted children have not lost in educational or general ability, and that gains have far outbalanced losses with respect to such traits as social adaptability and breadth of interests. End of section 21.